This is Audible. Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents The Zombie Wars, Call to Arms, by Joseph Toludo. Narrated by Graham Halstead. Wilmington, Illinois. What do you think? Offhand, probably a thousand, maybe more. Christ. How do you want to do this one? We have to draw them out, no question about it. We go in there, we'll get slaughtered. Right. Whose turn is it to act as rabbit? Um, Duncan. Inwardly, I groaned. Not that I'd thought Duncan couldn't do it, but he just couldn't bring himself to take it seriously. He had a habit of making a game out of the whole situation, and if he wasn't such a damn good fighter, I'd have left him home a long time ago. As it was, he did provide some points of amusement. All right, send him in, I said. I checked the load on my rifle for what had to be the millionth time, and was becoming such a habit that Charlie was starting to make fun of me for it. He swore he was going to unload my rifle behind my back one of these days just to mess with my head. That would be grounds for some serious ass-kicking. We had just started the war on the zombies, having spent the last few weeks chasing a lunatic across the country. We lost a good man along the way. But we gained something as a country trying to pick up the pieces after the zombies tore us to shreds. We did a decent job of it, establishing a new capital and safe place for us to live— but our little trip made me realize there was a lot of country to take back and a lot of people out there that needed our help. Besides, Charlie and I just got elected chief executive and deputy chief of the new United States. We had to do something with ourselves. Right now, we were outside the town of Wilmington. After a lot of discussion, Charlie and I decided it would be a good thing to head south and clear the lands as best we could from the capital to the bottom of the state. After that, we were going to head east as far as we could and then spread out and head south again. The idea was to move through the lands, pick up who we could to fight, clear out the zombies, and make the world a better place. That was the lofty goal. The reality was likely to be someplace between glory and disaster. Speaking of disasters, I watched Duncan make his way towards the town of Wilmington. It was a river town near the interstate, and by all accounts it was pretty dead. But we needed the highway, and it wouldn't do to have zombies wandering all the way north where we didn't want them. Plus, they made a mess of your car when you plowed into them. Duncan walked down the street, and immediately he was chased by a pair of Zs. They were an older couple, coincidentally dressed alike in matching colors with matching neck wounds that had changed the purple suits to black. The man was a gentleman of about fifty years old, and the woman was around the same age. They walked with purpose, but Duncan knew what he was about. He skipped away, staying out of reach, yet keeping himself the center of their attention. As they walked, they moaned in unison and reached futilely at the food just beyond their grasp. The noise attracted a couple other zombies, and Duncan had to move a little quicker to keep himself ahead of the game. He passed a small eatery that had a huge spaceman standing in front of it, a relic from a time when such things were commonplace. A small zombie came running out of the restaurant, and Duncan had to stop and deal with the threat. He swung his melee weapon, a four-foot pole that had three metal collars on the end. Each collar had four steel spikes on them shaped like little pyramids. Duncan had arranged them so they alternated around the end of the pole in a spiral pattern, the effect was anywhere he hit a Z on the head with that thing was taking it down. Just like now. The spikes connected in three places, crushing the little boy's head and dropping him to the ground. Duncan paused a moment and then kept moving. Down the street, Duncan acquired five more zombies, and he moved ahead of them, swatting away their grasping hands like they were trying to pinch him. He's really a nut, Charlie said, looking through the scope of his rifle. Whatever gets the job done, I said. We started out by going house to house, but then we realized it was easier on us just to open the doors, back away, and let the zombies come out to us. If we suspected a town was dead, we usually had someone walk down the center to draw out the zombies, and then we set up to kill them. Afterwards, we went through the homes looking for any strays and supplies. It wasn't the greatest solution, 
but it seemed to do the trick. After he reached the center of town, Duncan turned north to where we were waiting with our zombie trap. I had to give Tommy credit with this one. We had to find a way to kill a lot of zombies quickly and efficiently with little risk to ourselves. Having a bunch of guys just shoot all over the place was putting a lot of faith in excellent marksmanship. That was a religion I really didn't believe in. While most of the survivors we had encountered were skilled to some degree with guns, not all of them were all that good out past 50 yards. Tommy thought it would be a good idea to bring a mobile version of what we did way back when the zombies first rose, and we had to kill a bunch of them at that school we holed up in. We would funnel the zombies into a narrow area, kill them, drag them out of the way, and let the next group in. Towards this end, we used six semi-trucks with modified trailers. The trucks would park end-to-end -end in a kind of funnel pattern, and the last two trucks would park about two and a half feet apart. When a line of zombies walked towards the bait, we would drop a gate behind and in front of them, trapping about twenty of them in between the trailers. We had welded panels of sheet steel to the bottom of the trailers, blocking the zombies from escaping that way. Once they were trapped, six men on top of the trailers dropped a large wooden plank filled with spikes onto the zombies, killing them immediately. The short ones got killed when the taller ones fell and let the spikes down. After the zombies were dead, the men hauled the plank back up, the front gate was lifted, and the zombies pulled out by people acting as draggers with hooks on poles. Once cleared, the process started over again. We had been working this for a little while, and it was a really efficient way to kill a lot of zombies all at once without firing a shot. Every once in a while, a Z needed another whack to the head, but the guys with the hooks did that without trouble. Coming in, Duncan yelled leading the zombies towards where we had parked the semis. He walked towards the trailers and ran ahead to the front gate, waiting to make sure the zombies saw him. They kept moving, and suddenly there was a clang. I looked for Duncan and didn't see him. Charlie looked through his rifle and swore. Damn it, they dropped the gate too early. He's inside. Charlie grabbed his rifle and ran towards the semis. I grabbed my rifle and followed, hoping we could get there before the zombies reached Duncan. He'd have a hell of a time with no real room to swing his weapon. I ran, and as I did, I kept expecting to hear shots. When I was about ten yards away, I heard the next order. Drop the bar! The heavy wood plank crashed down. If Duncan was under that, he was dead or dying. I ran faster, swearing I was going to kill the man who screwed up, when I nearly ran into Charlie's back. He was standing with his arms crossed, watching Duncan slap a teenager silly. The boy's head was snapping back and forth, and Duncan was punctuating his speech with slaps. Didn't I tell you, slap, to never drop the bar, slap, until the runner, slap, has cleared, slap, the grills, slap, slap, slap. Duncan asked through gritted teeth. The boy dropped to the ground, bleeding from the mouth, holding a very red face. Beside him, a teenage girl was wringing her hands, wanting to go help her boyfriend, but kept back by Charlie's glare. So sorry, the boy spit out. I thought you said clear. Did you see me? Duncan asked. N no. Then why in the name of God would I say clear? Duncan yelled. You're off gate duty until you can focus your mind on the task at hand. Duncan turned his attention to the girl. You're to stay away from him when he's on any duty, or I'm sending you both home. Got it? The girl nodded and started to tear up. Clearly she didn't want to go home. Her eyes got huge when I nodded and looked grim, and then she picked up her boyfriend and pulled him away. Duncan, Charlie, and I watched them leave, and then we all chuckled together. Boy, my live if he gets his head out of her ass, Charlie said. Duncan grinned. Next time, I'll make him the runner and she can close the gate. Any bets on how well that will go? I shook my head. I'd say that run will go perfectly. How'd you get out of there so fast? I asked. Duncan pointed to the mirrors of the truck. Z's can't reach those, but if you run and push off the side when you jump, you can grab it and swing yourself over. I looked and saw that it was a good trick to remember. Have you had to do that before? I asked. I don't recall you ever getting caught in there. 
First time for everything, Duncan said, heading back to the caravan. Charlie and I just looked at each other. What could we say? It was Duncan. The killing went on for a good hour, and we hauled out over 800 zombies. There were several that wandered away from the killing funnel, but other fighters were there to put them down. In a little while, we would start our walkthrough, making sure there weren't any zombies left over to surprise anyone else coming through. Charlie and I walked back to the RV we were sharing with our wives and kids. Sarah and Rebecca had made it clear in no uncertain terms that they were not going to be left behind again to care for the kids. I wasn't going to argue the point. Besides, I figured if they were with me, I wouldn't have to worry about what might be happening when I wasn't there. The last time I wasn't around, a group of very nasty people tried to kill my family. If it wasn't for Charlie and my brother, I might have lost everyone. Sarah greeted me at the door. Hey, you, she said, wrapping her arms around me. How was your day? I kissed her and grinned. Just getting started. Charlie and I need to do our walkthrough. How's the kids? Doing just fine and driving Rebecca and me crazy. Your son snuck out three times to try and go see the zombies, Sarah said. My son? I asked. How come every time he's bad, he only belongs to me? Charlie laughed. Julia is just as bad, and she's always mine when she's naughty. I'm not naughty, came a little voice from the back of the RV. We all laughed. Charlie shrugged his shoulders. How come she can't hear a thing when I call her, if she chimes in on every conversation she's not a part of? He asked no one in particular. Come on, Dad. Let's get something to eat and then we'll get moving, I said. Can we come with you? Sarah asked, batting her eyelashes. Rebecca joined in the manipulation, and Charlie had no ability to say no. Sure, I said. Get your stuff. I'll go see if Jana wants to babysit. Sarah bounced off to the back room, followed by Rebecca. Jake was busy at the kitchen table learning to draw his letters, and Julia was somewhere in the back arguing with Rebecca. I figured it was a good time to leave, so I kissed Jake on the top of his head and headed back out. Charlie decided to come with me, and together we walked up the road towards the second RV that housed Duncan and Jana. Those two met on our trip to D.C. and haven't been apart since. No one could figure out what brought those two together, but Jana saw in Duncan as a partner what we saw in him as a friend. He was loyal, protective, and perfectly willing to throw himself in front of a horde of zombies to save his friends. Add to the mix that he was a deadly fighter and skilled with just about anything, and he turned out as a pretty good match. I knocked on the door, and a blonde tornado spilled out. Jana was pure energy wrapped in a centerfold body. John, Charlie, hi. What's going on? Are we heading out, doing a sweep? What's going on? Duncan said he almost died again. Is that true? What happened? Did a kid almost kill him? She said, not pausing for a breath. I held up a hand. Can you watch Jake and Julia for me? Sarah and Rebecca want to go out with us to sweep the town. Jana switched gears. Of course. Let me get my little girl gear and I'll be right over. Jana swept back into the RV, and Charlie let out the breath he was unaware he was holding. Wow, I forgot how she does that, Charlie said. Yeah, it's fun on a limited basis, but she can fight pretty well, I said. I heard she taught Duncan how to work a knife better, Charlie said. That's something, I said. What's something? Jana asked as she came back out. She had put on some jeans and longer t-shirt, she was holding a small bag and had pulled her hair back into a ponytail. The number of zombies we killed today, Charlie said, avoiding the subject. Ah. We walked back to the RV, and Sarah and Rebecca were waiting for us. Jake was playing with his toys now, building blocks up and knocking them down. Julia was in a pout, but when she saw Jana, she jumped up. Jana, can we do hair? She squeaked. You know it, sweetheart. You want braids or something sexy? Jana asked, winking at Rebecca. What's sassy? Julia asked, looking at Charlie. Charlie looked uncomfortable. Ask your mother, he said. Sarah and I just smiled and faded away. Happy Jake wasn't asking the same question. 
We walked to the rally point, which was a spot about a half mile from the outskirts of town. Several groups were waiting for us, all skilled zombie killers. The unskilled ones were dead, and that right quickly. The men and women were lounging about, sharing jokes and stories, sharpening knives, checking melee weapons. They all stood to attention when we approached, something I wish they would stop doing. But since they were technically the army, and I was technically the commander-in-chief, I guess it was a tradition they wanted to keep up. Hey, all, I said, raising a hand in greeting. We've taken out the horde. Now we have to sweep. Let's get it done. Watch your back and that of your teammates. Let's get this done before dark. Watch your shots if you have to take them. The standing rule was not to use your guns if you didn't have to. Since we started cleaning up the zombies, we had a couple of accidents where people got shot by mistake. Using the non-firing weapons got that under control. Charlie? Teams one, three, and five take the north side of town. Teams two, four, and six I want a full sweep over the main road in and out. Teams eight and nine, the business district is yours. Walk you through. We need to be done and on the road before dark. What's our assignment? Sarah asked Charlie as we watched the teams split up and move toward their targets. We get the forest preserve on the south end, Charlie said, pointing to a large group of trees off in the distance. I imitated a zombie with my groan. Man, you do like to punish us, don't you? I asked. Charlie smiled. Gotta keep you sharp. Can't have no slacker leading us in this war. Thanks. Remind me to properly thank you for your diligence when we get back to the lodge, I said, fingering my knife. Move it, sweetness, Sarah said, pushing me with her staff. I was glad she used the blunt end, because the other had a two-foot double-sided blade on it. We walked south along 216th Street, passing what looked like a maintenance shed. There were several tractors and mowers in various states of rust, and it looked like the building had been abandoned long ago. I doubted we would even find anything of use in there. Charlie checked his map at the next turning of the road, and we walked towards the east. We passed two houses that looked pretty empty, and the broken windows and open doors told us that they were. The next house was down a very long driveway, and we figured it had to be all of a quarter mile. The house looked huge, and Charlie said we should check it on the way back. After passing the big house, we found ourselves standing in front of the woods. The actual wooded area started a ways back, and we were going to have to cross a field covered in long grass with a sprinkling of trees here and there. Perfect. I pulled my worn but trusted pickaxe out of its holder and gave it a little spin in my hand. I caught Sarah chuckling at me. What? I asked. You spin that axe every time you pull it out. Do you even know you do it, or is it just a reflex? She asked. I didn't even know I did it, I admitted. Consider it a trademark. We spread out and started a slow walk through the field. We weren't kidding ourselves. We had lived through some really bad zombie problems and didn't want to take any chances. Besides, when the ghoul goop started flying, I didn't want to be too close to someone who threw zombie bits around like candy at a parade. We were ten feet into the field when I stepped on a twig that was hiding under the tall grass. The sound cracked loud in the still air, and ahead of us we heard a loud rustling, like something large was moving through the trees. We didn't hear any groans, so I hoped it was just something like a large dog. I didn't really believe that, but it was fun to occupy the mind a little. Charlie looked over at me like a teacher fed up with an unruly student, but I shook my head in protest. It was under the grass, I hissed in self-defense. Step lightly, step with care, walk as if you're made of air, Charlie whispered back, using the same rhyme he used to teach his daughter on how to be a woodsman. Sarah held a hand to her mouth, and Rebecca did the same, struggling to keep her laughter in. I desperately wanted one of them to explode in sound, anything to cover my mistake. If I was really lucky, maybe one of them would fart. We moved forward slowly, spread out in a lone line with roughly forty feet in between each of us. Long practice told us in an emergency we could cover that distance in as little as three seconds. If a zombie was trying to kill Sarah, I'd literally fly over that distance if I had to. 
although bullets covered it quicker, I had to admit. The trees swayed in the breeze, rustling with mature leaves. The grass was long and green, coming up to about our knees. Scattered about were smaller trees, evidence that nature was trying to take back what was once hers. In a few short years, this area was going to be impassable without bringing some sort of brush cutter. Sarah was walking with her spear out in front, skimming the grass from side to side and keeping a wide path cleared in front of her. Any legless zombie was not going to get past her. Rebecca on the other side was doing the same thing, using her long pole as a sweep. Charlie was walking with his head down, both of his tomahawks in his hands, keeping them low and wide. In the blink of an eye, he could swing those blades in either direction, up or down. The guy who had to be different was me. I kept my axe on my shoulder, thinking that I could snap it forward quickly enough to deal with anything that came up. That was the thinking. When the zombie rose up out of the grass, it was on the right side, right where he didn't have enough momentum to take it down quickly. It was a big guy, too. He had been on the ground, feasting on whatever that pile of blood and guts used to be, and with a lunge of bloody hands and bloodier mouth, he was right on top of me. I grabbed the top of the axe and used the handle as a bar, shoving it in the zombie's mouth and forcing him back. His legs churned the grass while he grabbed and pulled at me with his bloody hands. I twisted the handle he was chewing on and managed to drop him onto his back. I left the handle in his mouth while I knelt on his chest, fending off his grabbing hands. Pulling my knife, I slammed the long blade into the Z's eye, ending his existence. His red hands flopped to the side as he lay there in the grass, his remaining eye staring up at the few stars bright enough to come out in the late afternoon. I stood up and brought my knife with me, flicking off the zombie eyeball that came out attached to it. I used the cleanest portion of the zombie shirt to wipe off my blade and pickaxe handle. I tried to wipe off the bloody marks the Z had left on me, but that was a hopeless task. I was probably going to lose this shirt. You okay, babe? Sarah called. She had moved closer to me, but not so close that she would get in the way of a swing or a bullet. Now I'm messier than when I started, but other than that, I'm good, I said, walking forward. I gave a nod to Charlie, who returned it. His arm was up, and I knew that if I needed it, a tomahawk was flying my way in a hurry. We stepped forward again, moving as quietly as we could. I had my pick held in the low ready position, slightly back and to the right. I could swing up or over from there. It was definitely a better place than on my shoulder. Rebecca got the next one. It was a small woman, probably about twenty years old, with short blonde hair and a huge tear across her throat. I wasn't sure what was holding her head up, but that neck of hers was putting up a pretty good effort. Rebecca spun her staff and cracked the zombie down on top of its head with the mace end that Duncan had put on there for her. The metal edge blasted through the zombie's skull like it wasn't there, killing it instantly. Charlie was ready for that one, too, and it nearly killed him. A small zombie, a boy of about seven, flew out from behind a bush. Charlie barely had time to step out of the way when the Z spun and came at him again. Unfortunately for him, he was facing Charlie James, and Charlie knew what his intentions were. A backhanded hawk catapulted the boy over the grass, leaving him dead and oozing from a new hole in his skull above his ear. Feeling left out, honey? I called, stepping forward again. Sarah smiled at me. I don't mind, really. We all walked forward carefully, but we didn't have any more problems. At the edge of the forest, Charlie called us to a halt. He was staring at the wall of trees and brush, and even from where I was standing, I could tell he didn't like what he was sensing. I knew better than to call out to him, letting him sort out whatever his instincts were screaming at him. Back! Back! Charlie suddenly yelled, waiting for us to move and then running backwards the way we came. I didn't need to be told twice. I had learned a long time ago that Charlie's instincts were to be trusted at all times, and this was one of those times. I waved Sarah over, and together we joined Charlie and Rebecca. We still kept about ten feet in between us, but we were definitely facing this new threat as a group. Suddenly, the brush burst outward from three points. 
Zombie kids ran for us at full speed, hissing and snapping with their teeth. They ran with their hands spread wide, ready to grab at whatever they could reach. I had seen these sorts of kid groups before, and they always scared the hell out of me. Why the virus let them be fast was just one of those jokes God decided to play on us. Guns! I yelled, whipping out my pistol. I fired twice, killing one of them. Charlie did better, killing three with four shots. Sarah and Rebecca opened up with the small carbines they kept with them, and the number dropped significantly. Unfortunately, there were too many, and they just kept coming. One taller girl nearly reached me when I shot her point-blank in the face. She toppled back and let me fire again, killing a boy who was right behind her. Three little zombies charged me, and I knew I couldn't get them all. I dropped my gun and swung my pick in a wide arc, timing it so the one on the right got the spike end. He crashed into the next one, who then tangled up the legs of the third. I didn't waste time with finesse. I just slammed the pick down three times like I was chopping wood. Grabbing a dead zombie, I threw her at the legs of two more that were charging, tripping them up and bringing them within reach of my pick. Charlie was just as busy as I was, swinging his axes at anything that came near. The tomahawks rang like deadly bells as he ripped them out of dead Z-skulls. One boy got close enough to get a hand on Charlie's arm, and right before he could get a bite in, his eyes rolled up and he slumped down, killed by a well-placed shot by Rebecca. Sarah kept firing, lining up her shots and waiting to make the kill. She was methodical and precise, and the line of zombies killed by her stretched from our position to the tree line. Rebecca had her own line of kills, and it would be a close call as to who was the winner. As soon as it had started, it was over. Charlie and I caught our breath as zombie blood dripped off our weapons, and I used the respite to reholster my gun. I hadn't yet warmed up to the forty-five my father had left me, and since my SIG was gone, I had followed Charlie's lead and picked up a Glock 17. At least this way we could share magazines— or, as Duncan put it, get extra mags when the other guy dies. That it? I asked, not really wanting to hear the answer. Probably, Charlie said. The little ones never attack alone unless they are alone, which makes no sense to me. He looked over the field of corpses. Always freaks me out how smart and fast those things are. I nodded. Which makes this next decision that much worse, I said. We gotta go in there, don't we? Rebecca asked, refilling the magazine she used. If we don't, and there's another horde in there, they will chase us to the gulf, Charlie said. All right, so how do we get in there? He asked. I shrugged. Right through the front door. We walked back up to the forest's edge, stepping over the dead zombies that Sarah and Rebecca had so kindly placed there. The bodies allowed us to look inside the brush wall and determine that there wasn't any immediate danger. I went in first, leading with my gun in one hand and with my pick in the other. I waved the rest of the crew in, and we all stepped into a gloomy place. The forest was dark, mostly because of the canopy of leaves and the fact that the day was winding down outside. But this forest was a really deep green that appeared almost black— in direct sunlight, I was pretty sure that things wouldn't look so damn gloomy, but today it was a very forbidding place. Fangorn was probably like this, I said. What? Charlie asked. Rebecca nodded. Probably. A little light on the streams, though. Sarah chimed in. A few ants would be useful right about now. Charlie looked at us like we were nuts. What the hell are you three talking about? What the hell is an ant? You've never read Tolkien? I asked. I was stunned. I looked at him the same way I looked at someone who had never seen the movie Star Wars. Charlie shrugged. Obviously. Should I have? Rebecca smiled. Oh, yes, sweetheart. We'll read it together, including Julia. She'll love it. Really? Charlie was skeptical. What else is in it? Trees, forests, swords, elves, goblins, and all sorts of fighting, Rebecca said. Deal. Find me a copy and I'll do it, Charlie said. Right after we finish this forest, I said. 
We walked deeper into the gloom and were wary of anything that seemed out of place. Charlie listened as he walked, and several times he would stop us to see what he could hear. After a time, he waved us over. There's nothing left here, he said. You sure? I asked, looking around. If there was a place for ghouls, this was it. Pretty sure. There's a few squirrels that are pissed at us and letting us know it. Two birds just came away from those trees, and unless I'm very mistaken, a small fox family is poking their heads out of that bank right now, Charlie said as he pointed into the woods. I looked and saw a small nose cautiously test the air as it emerged from its hiding place. A little bit longer, and a red fuzzy head followed the nose, stepping lightly onto the grass outside its home. Charlie was right. If there were a zombie within a hundred yards of this place, the animals wouldn't dare to move. They seemed to know we didn't mean them any harm, and were more willing to make our acquaintance. Ready to head back? I asked, taking hold of Sarah's spear and shouldering it alongside my pick. Let's move. I think we earned our supper today, Rebecca said. Without becoming it, Charlie, Sarah, and I said in unison, laughing. It was the code of the army. Any day you fought a zombie and didn't die, you had earned your dinner for the day. Some of the veterans kept a daily tally as to how many zombies they killed, comparing notes with others who did the same thing. Charlie and I never bothered with that, figuring any dead zombie was one less we'd have to fight later. We stepped out of the woods, and even though it was near evening, the change in brightness was marked. I had to squint at first and then shield my eyes. Sarah blinked her pretty greens at me, letting me know she was feeling the same way. I worried about her a great deal, not only because she was my wife and pretty much my world, but she'd become Jake's world as well. Jake had no idea he had another mother, and Sarah and I decided that he would know later in his own time. It wouldn't do to cause him grief at this point. We reached a section of land that ran parallel to the land owned by the huge house, and Charlie looked a question at me. I shrugged, and we wandered over to the huge home. It was a very large house, with an attached three-car garage and a separate coach house. It looked like there might be an apartment above the garage, and given the size of the coach house, it would be pretty comfortable. The house itself was brick, with tall windows and a double front door. The doors were closed, and the windows were still intact, so either the owners had taken off when the world fell apart, or they were still in there, waiting to entertain guests. I looked in a couple of windows and didn't see anything out of the ordinary. It looked like a hundred other abandoned homes we had seen. It also looked like a hundred other not-so-abandoned houses we had seen. I waited on the front porch with Sarah while Charlie and Rebecca went around to the other side of the house. I had already tapped on the windows to see if I could provoke any sort of reaction, but so far nothing had stirred. A minute later, Charlie interrupted Sarah and me enjoying a stolen moment, telling us that the house seemed abandoned. I took that as a positive sign and gave the front door a small push. The heavy door creaked loudly in the evening air, and a rush of stale air changed places with the fresh air from the outside. I nodded to Charlie and he stepped through first, leaning off to the right while I followed and headed off to the left. Sarah and Rebecca went straight up the middle, and we all paused while we took in our surroundings. The house at first glance was very nice, with a large foyer of marble leading up a circular staircase towards a balcony that wrapped around the upper half of the foyer leading to two hallways in opposite directions. I was facing a dining room that easily could have entertained twenty people. A glance behind me showed Charlie facing a room that looked like a library, complete with fireplace. Clear! 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 I was last, and I could see a doorway on the end of the dining room leading to what was likely the kitchen. Straight back takes me to the kitchen. Charlie? Looks like a living room on my side. Ladies? Charlie asked. Straight back to a kitchen and porch from here, Sarah said. Meet you all in the back, I said. We split up and headed our separate ways. We had cleared too many houses to be surprised by much these days. I'd seen families torn to pieces. I'd seen family pets eaten by their owners, and I'd even once seen a man walking around his house naked save for a coating of gray paint because he believed it made him invisible to the zombies. 
Since he was still alive, I can't say for sure he was wrong. I passed through the dining room, noting that the place was still decorated, and the china hutch was full of what could only be considered family china. I don't ever recall seeing anything that ugly sold in stores. Black china with gold trim and red roses decorating the center. I think I would have chosen tinted glass for the hutch. The kitchen was enormous, with a huge marbled granite island bordered on three sides by a matching granite countertop. The cabinets were of a pale cream color, offsetting the granite and reaching to the ceiling. Lights hung down from the ceiling to highlight the island, and large windows looked out onto a large backyard framed with big trees. I looked over at Sarah and Rebecca, both of whom were running appreciative eyes over the kitchen. Charlie walked in from the other room and gave an approving nod. I could dress a whole deer on that table, Charlie said. Seriously? Rebecca said. Seriously? What? I started to laugh at the look on Charlie's face when I heard it. It wasn't any more than a whisper of noise, but it was there. I held up a hand, and everyone went silent immediately. I cocked my head, closing my eyes focusing on identifying all the sounds I heard and putting the one I couldn't place at the top of the focus list. It was a small, shifting sound, like someone was trying to be silent and made a noise by mistake, and now they were frozen, hoping not to be found out. There, again, a small sound. Not too much, but just enough. Downstairs. I opened my eyes to see everyone looking at me, and I looked down. Charlie nodded and moved silently to the basement stairs, easing the door open and checking for any signs of life or otherwise. He slipped noiselessly down the carpeted stairs, and I followed, keeping a safe distance to let him swing fully if he had to. The stairs turned a complete 180 degrees before getting to the basement. I could see decently thanks to the large sliding glass doors that covered the far wall leading out to the backyard. I could see the large porch that led off the first floor, and there were two sets of patio furniture still out there, waiting for the next barbecue. One of the doors was open to the outside, and looking out didn't tell me anything. The basement was nicely furnished, with a big entertainment area complete with large-screen television, deep couches, and two full-size video games like the ones I used to play when I was a kid at the arcade. This basement had Wizard of War and Cruise in USA, Along the wall behind the stairs was a full-size bar sporting a western theme with cowprint bar stools and a real brass cuspidor. I motioned to Charlie I was going to check the rooms at the back, and flipping on my light, I walked back to the other side of the basement. All I found was two bedrooms, a bathroom, and a small room that looked like a workroom of some kind. I shook my head, and Charlie pointed to the bar. He brought up his gun and stepped quickly around. Not seeing anything, he started to put his pistol away when the small deep freeze behind the bar slowly opened. Prudently, Charlie and I stepped back, waiting to see what would come out. My bet was on a zombie, and it would be a quick contest to see who would kill it first. Charlie must have thought the same thing, since he slipped a tomahawk into his hand. No one was more shocked than I was when a mass of unruly brown hair slowly rose over the top of the bar turned and looked right at Charlie and me. I think Charlie might have been more shocked when the head of hair spoke in a tired voice. Great. Do I have to fuck both of you, or can I just do one of you? I'm really not in the mood. Ten minutes later, we were all seated around the big island in the kitchen, having cleared up what was a very large misunderstanding. The brunette, a teenager by the name of Brandy, sat with her little brother in her lap. The boy was a brown-eyed sprout who reminded me very much of my own Jake. Charlie and I just took in the conversation, offering little except to agree with our spouses when necessary. Brandy was babysitting her baby brother when the world turned upside down. Her parents had gone out to dinner and never came back. She figured out what was going on and decided the best route to survival was to become invisible. When the zombies wandered nearby, she hid with her brother until they left. If looters came into the house, they could take whatever they wanted. Brandy knew she could always replace whatever they took. She apologized to Charlie and me about her comment. 
She figured out quickly that we weren't there to hurt her, so she was hoping we would have been embarrassed enough to leave. I had to give her credit. I was nearly shocked enough to just quietly go away. Sarah and Rebecca talked to Brandy for about fifteen minutes longer, and then took us men out the front door. On the long walk up the driveway, I asked Sarah if we were going to take them with us back to the caravan. No, we're not, she said. Are we sending them back to the capital? I asked. Not this time, Rebecca said. Charlie exhaled loudly, which was a signal to anyone with any sense that his patience was running out. Then what are we doing about them? And the answer had better be longer than three words. Rebecca set her jaw for a second before relaxing. She knew her husband and knew pushing it wasn't the best thing right now. Brandy has figured out how to survive, and she has managed to do so in a town that until recently was overrun with zombies. We don't want to take everyone back to the capital to strain the resources there. We want to allow people to stay where they are in familiar surroundings. How else do we take back the country if we don't have anyone living anywhere except in one place? Even I couldn't find fault in that logic and let both Rebecca and Sarah know that they just set in place a new United States federal policy. We decided to call it the Mind Our Own Business State Repopulation Initiative, at least, that's what we would call it until someone more clever gave it a real name. We walked steadily back to the encampment, where dozens of RVs were parked. We had liberated an RV dealership from several dozen zombie snowbirds, looking to upgrade and found a better use for the traveling homes. Outside of the encampment, there was a large gathering of men and women. They were circled around something, and from where I stood, I couldn't see what was going on. Charlie took off at a slow jog, and I joined him. We reached the outer edge of the circle and slowed to a stop. The few who looked our way recognized us and looked guiltily away. Clear a lane, Charlie bellowed, causing several people to jump. Some looked sullenly at the intrusion, but quickly backed away when they saw who it was. Rank sometimes had its privileges. We walked to the center of the crowd and stopped. Standing casually with his hands clasped behind his back was Duncan. He was wearing a white T-shirt and black cargo pants, his hair wet from a recent shower. He was standing by Tommy, who was watching the scene in front of him impassively. Tommy was wearing his fighting gear and was easily a match for anyone in the circle. On the ground in front of Duncan and Tommy were three youths, all in various stages of pain and suffering— one, who I recognized as the boy who nearly got Duncan killed earlier today, was lying on his back, holding his sides. Another teen, a bruiser of a lad, was on his knees, holding the back of his head with one hand, while the other barely kept him from falling on his face. The third, a tall, skinny kid who showed some real promise with a blade, was sitting with his legs out on front of him. His right hand gripped his left shoulder tightly, trying to summon the courage to pull out the knife that was protruding from that same spot. I spoke first. Explanation. Now. Duncan was heading over to your RV to help Jana babysit when these three thought they were going to jump him. After the first thrashing wasn't enough, the tall one there turned it serious by pulling a knife. Why Duncan didn't kill him, I'm not really sure, Tommy said. The entire group watching us was silent. Attempted murder was a capital crime, and the new Senate had strict rules on that. I didn't have any real choice in the matter at all. I pointed to three men on the edge of the clearing. Rope, pole, and box. Quickly! The men ducked out of the crowd to get the supplies I wanted. I stepped over to the boy who gripped his shoulder. I knelt down and looked him in the face. He refused to look me in the eye and just stared at a spot somewhere behind me. Part of being a man is taking your licks and learning from them. The other part is taking responsibility for what you do. You chose to pull a knife and chose to try to seriously hurt or kill a fellow soldier. Anything to say in your defense? The boy continued to stare, his brow furrowed in rage, pain, and hate. I hated what was going to come next, but maybe it was for the better. Attempted murder, then. Capital crime. Judgment? I asked Tommy. Tommy walked around the circle and pointed to twelve citizens, gathering a verdict. Guilty. 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 
Eight more said the same thing. Had one said not guilty, we would have held the trial. As it was, we didn't have to. Guilty, Tommy said. Sentence is death by hanging, to be carried out immediately. The boy was hauled to his feet, and his knife pulled out of his shoulder. His hands were tied behind his back, and he was led away to where the three men were waiting. At the sight of the hanging rope, the boy let out a single sob, and then was silent. Without another word, he allowed himself to have the noose placed around his neck, and he stepped without assistance onto the milk crate that was provided. The rope was pulled taut, and the crate was jerked out from under his feet. The boy struggled for a moment, and then was still. We let him hang for a few moments longer, making sure he was truly dead. Then we let him down. I ordered a burial detail, and when the body was interred, I spoke the 23rd Psalm in a short prayer for the boy. Afterwards, I went back to the RV where my son was still awake and playing. Julia was all dolled up for her daddy's return, and Jana scolded Duncan for causing a fuss. Duncan knew better than to argue the point. We sat at the kitchen table and watched our kids play with each other. Sarah, Rebecca, and Jana joined us. We were a tight little group. What the hell happened, Duncan? I asked. The last thing I needed was something like this so soon into the war. Not sure what beef the other two might have had with me, but when they braced me in front of my home, what was I supposed to do? I put the three down not once, but twice. By the time they had gained their feet for the third time, the crowd had gathered. I put the two down again, and that's when the third tried to stab me. Jana looked at me like it was my fault for some reason, and I looked back until she looked away. I turned to Duncan. Can't fault you for defending yourself. I'm just surprised you only got him in the shoulder. You had a practice or something? The tension broke, and we had a laugh at Duncan's expense. Funny thing was, I really wasn't kidding. Duncan was much better than that when it came to defending himself, and the remaining two of those boys were lucky to be alive. In the morning, we gathered the troops and dispersed them for supplies. Anything of use for the war was to be placed in the back of the trailers. Anything we didn't need right away was to be left behind. The theory behind that thinking was there might be other survivors in the area looking to live off the supplies they could scavenge. I wasn't going to starve anyone if I could help it. Around mid-morning, the reports came in that the supplies had been secured. During the scavenging, Sarah and Rebecca had taken a goodly amount back to Brandy, where Rebecca gave her brother a checkup. From the sound of things, the little guy really liked playing with a stethoscope. By late morning, or nap time in Jake's world, we were on the road. I wanted to get south and scout Kankakee by noon. I sent most of the army to the east with instructions to spread out and head south when they reached I-57. We would take a small unit and follow the river, coming into Bourbonnais by the west. I hoped to find at least some kind of community there, but with the interstate running right through the middle of town, it was unlikely that the place would be habitable. Cole City had been making runs to Kankakee along the river, and the folks down there had reported that the zombie activity wasn't all that bad. But they hadn't reported signs of any survivors, which made things pretty bad in my book. The trip was slow, since we stopped at every house we passed to see if there was anyone there, either alive or dead. Mostly there was no one there, but occasionally we found a dead one wandering around. At one house, we actually met a man who had no idea the world had pretty much ended. "'Y'all from the government?' he asked, streaming a line of tobacco juice from his teeth. "'Well, I guess you could say we are,' I said. "'Are you all alone out here, sir?' "'Naw, I got my dogs.' They keep me company. Say, you fellers look like you're doing some serious hunting. Sir, do you have any idea what's happened to the world? I asked. Why, something happened? Sir, have you seen anything strange walking around? Well, there was a fellow a while back, stumbled around like he was drunk or something. The old man sniffed, causing his nostril hair to wave back and forth. Figured he was one of them damn hippies that get drugged up and wander around hereabouts. I looked at the man for a long time, then looked down at the three German shepherds that stared back at me impassively. Exhaling slowly, I did the only thing I could do. Have a good day, sir. You too, son. You too. 
You find any of them hippies, you knock them on the head for me, hear? The man nodded at something in his imagination and closed the door. Back at the RV, Charlie looked at me. I was tempted to let him go talk to the man, but then they probably came from the same part of Missouri and we'd never see Charlie again. Keep moving, I said, slowly shaking my head. Bourbonnet, Illinois We followed the river, and near the Kankakee River State Park, we came across an encampment that straddled the river. The people had roped several dozen metal rowboats together, along with a good number of aluminum canoes. The huge raft was then floored with planks that created a solid bottom, and small huts were spaced out all over the barge. Several ropes held the raft in place, and it looked like crops were growing on a large island the barge was tethered to. We spent about an hour trading information with the people of the barge, admiring their ingenuity and letting them know where things stood with Wilmington and the towns to the north. As we were leaving, I could see quite a few families begin the trek back to living on dry land. In all my travels, that had to be one of the more creative ways to survive the apocalypse. We reached the outskirts of Bourbonnais, and Charlie decided to follow the road that led towards the river again. We passed a couple of houses that looked okay from the front, so I wasn't too concerned about what lay in front of us. We pulled up next to a large subdivision when Sarah, who was riding in the back with Jake, called up to me. John, come here. I went to the back and gave Jake a quick tickle on the ribs. He squeaked and doubled over, bonking his head on the headboard. After we had calmed Jake down and dried his tears, Sarah pointed to the thing that she wanted me to see. Taking the binoculars, I scanned the homes we had passed. The houses had their back windows broken out, and even at this distance I could see the sparkling of the glass in the grass by the house. Faded dark stains covered the window panes, and that meant only one thing. The zombies that had been in that house had escaped, and they had come this way. Charlie, I called, but it was too late. I could hear Charlie yelling into the CB radio. Back, get back, there's too many, pull back, now! I ran to the front of the RV while Sarah and Rebecca secured children in the windows. Charlie was trying to back up and not doing a very good job of it. To the right of the RV, hundreds of zombies came stumbling out of the subdivision, spilling out of homes and crawling out of ditches. It was as if the upheaval had happened a week ago. Ahead of us, a few zombies had made the road and were approaching the coach. In the mirror, I could see the other vehicles try to back up, and one turned wrong, blocking the road. In a minute, we were going to be overwhelmed. I grabbed the CB. Follow us! Move it! Move it! We'll clear a path! I turned to Charlie. Just go forward! Follow the road! We need distance, and we need it now! Done! Charlie threw the big vehicle in gear and gunned the engine, causing the RV to lurch and sway. The zombies that were on the road were knocked out of the way by a reinforced grill. Every car had some kind of zombie mover on the front, and more than once we had lined up and cleared a highway of not-quite-dead roadkill. We roared past the houses and threw ourselves down the street. I checked the mirror to see if everyone had made it with us, and I was doomed to fail. The furthest car had not made the move forward, and zombies were swarming all around it. If there was anyone in there, they didn't have long among the living. Charlie drove straight ahead, passing a side road and entering a small forest. It was impossible to see very far ahead, but I had to trust Charlie's driving. We had four other cars we had to look out for, and we needed a place to hide or make a stand. Jesus! Charlie cried out suddenly, slamming on the brakes. The RV screeched to a halt, sliding sideways on the gravel road. The road had suddenly ended at a small maintenance shed, and then there was the river. If we hadn't stopped, we would have driven right into the water. Call the others. If anyone can hear us, tell them where we are, I said, unbuckling to go check on everyone else. Where are we? Charlie asked. On the river, just east of Bourbonnais. That's all I know right now. We have a sizable horde coming after us and could use a little backup, I said, opening up the weapons locker and handing a rifle to Sarah. 
Rebecca took one as well, while Charlie and I wrapped the kids up in special backpacks, which allowed them to ride on our backs while keeping our arms free. They weren't too happy about it, and Jake tried to give a little attitude, but I wasn't having it. Jake, I need you to be the big boy right now. Do you understand me? I asked, taking my own rifle out and checking the loads. Are the zombies coming, Dad? He asked, looking up at me with those big brown eyes of his. They are, buddy, but Daddy's going to take care of you, I said, trying to be reassuring. We had about twenty minutes before these woods were full of zombies. The river was at our back, and we had no place to go. Are the zombies going to eat us? Julia asked, turning her big blues on her daddy. Charlie knelt down and gave his little girl a kiss on the top of her head. They will never touch you as long as I'm here, baby girl. Never, he said. Standing up, he looked at me. What's the plan? Let's get with the rest of our team, and I'll tell you then, I said. Charlie left the RV, and I looked back at Sarah and Rebecca. I gave them a quick outline. We're going to draw the zombies off into the woods. Stay low, stay quiet. They shouldn't reach you here. Worst comes to worst, get on the boat. I'll put it next to the river, I said, leaving them behind. I hoped we could pull this off. Charlie was talking to the rest of the team. Fortunately, they hadn't rammed into us when we slammed on the brakes. Two men ran up the road we had just came down, likely scouting the zombies and figuring out how much time we had. Part of me wanted to try heading back, plowing through the horde, then linking up with the rest of the army, but it was iffy with large numbers of zombies. You soon started driving over them, killing your tires and tipping your vehicle over. I had seen it happen with a large truck. It went over a big zombie, didn't recover in time for another, and tipped right over. I reached the group, and Charlie gave me the rundown of his plan. We keep the area clear between us and the river. That's our retreat if we need it. We run up to them as fast as we can and just walk it back, shooting them as we go. I liked it. Simple and to the point. Besides, it was what we were out here for. Charlie and I told the others to grab their water gear and get it close to the river. That would be our retreat if we needed it. Charlie and I ran to the back of the RV and practically ripped off the small metal rowboat lashed to the back. We used it for simple crossings and sometimes for fishing, but it was sturdy enough to handle all four of us, plus enough supplies for three days. Right now, it only had to keep us alive long enough to escape the horde coming at us. We pushed the boat to the water's edge and saw the others were right behind us. Kayaks, canoes, and a folding boat all waited at the water's edge like faithful hounds before the hunt. It was tempting to just grab the families and go, but this group needed to be dealt with. We took off up the road with Charlie and myself in the lead. Some people felt I should direct the war effort from the rear, sending in troops to deal with the zombie problem. But I could never send another to do something I wouldn't do myself. Even before the upheaval, I couldn't do that. Besides, I always felt a leader should lead. We ran up the road, catching sight of the two men who Charlie had dispatched earlier. They were running back, pointing and trying to speak at the same time. They're there, coming, the first one panted. About a quarter of a mile up the road. Good, I said. Did they see you? Yeah, they did. Started right for us, the other one said in between large gulps of air. Better, I replied. Let's spread out. Ten feet between each of us. Same drill. Shoot the ones only in front of you. Don't waste any shots. Make them come to you. Let's go, and let's survive this. We'd done this sort of thing for a few weeks now, especially when we were out in the open. Between the twenty of us, we had about six hundred rounds of ammunition. That should see us through this one, I hoped. The hard part with the zombies was the waiting. They were coming, you knew that. There was no getting around it. They weren't going to stop until they were dead or you were. They would wait you out or wear you down. Eventually, they would get you unless you got them first. This was what we were doing out here. We weren't just going to find a hole to hide in hope so we could live out our lives behind walls and safe zones. We wanted to live without fear, without wondering if that thing that bumped in the night was our imagination or a very real monster. The first sign was the sound, or lack of it. 
When a large horde of Zs moved through an area, it always went dead silent. No bugs or birds made any noise. Then you felt a change in the air. It was like a high-pressure system moving through. The noise came next. Usually it was the rhythmic march of hundreds of dead feet plodding along. Mixed in were some scrapes and drags, and you had a symphony of walking dead. They usually wouldn't groan unless they saw you, and then they set up a sound which was pitiful and terrifying. It was the sound of a being without a soul, something that existed only to cause pain and suffering. Finally, it was the sight of them. Hundreds of corpses marching in your direction, staring at you with eyes that were devoid of anything but hunger. They bore wounds of encounters with others like themselves, and the successful ones were covered in blood, especially around their mouths. Some were so successful that they had torn their lips off, leaving their teeth fully exposed. Some had limbs missing, but that didn't stop them. They just kept coming. We saw them coming over the rise about two hundred feet away. I called out the first order. Sharpshooters, pick your targets. Fire at will, I yelled, taking aim at a man whose face was half torn off. Sharpshooters were required to be able to hit an eight-inch target at three hundred yards. They were the first to start thinning the herds. The thought was to start creating barricades so the zombies would start tripping over each other. Anything to slow them down. Rifles cracked and zombies began to drop. At this range and with that many zombies, if you missed the one you were aiming at, you likely hit another you weren't. If you were watching from the side, you'd see zombies in the middle dropping from shots. We taught our marksmen to aim for the eyes. One of our survivors was a former marine sniper, and he tutored us on the finer points of long-range killing. Even so, we were in less than ideal conditions to make every shot. Two hundred feet became one hundred fifty, then one hundred. The zombies kept coming, and we kept killing them. At one hundred yards, I gave the second order. Marksman, pick your targets. Fire at will. I put the sights on an older zombie, a man who must have been over seventy when he crossed over. I waited a second to see if anyone else was going to fire, and then I pulled the trigger. The old man's head exploded in a dark mist, and he crumpled from view. Down the line I could hear staccato firing as more and more people in our group started firing. Zombies were falling at a more rapid rate, and the ones that tripped over the fallen ones were killed either on the ground or when they were rising again to their feet. At fifty feet the number of zombies was significantly smaller. I gave the next order to conserve ammo. Sharpshooters, cease fire! Cease fire! Marksman, finish them off, I yelled, pulling the trigger on a man about my age. His gray face was slashed and torn, with one eye gone and half his nose bitten off. His shirt was black with dried blood, and his left hand was missing three fingers. His torn pants showed me bone where his kneecap used to be, and his left foot was missing a shoe. I put the shot in his forehead, and the man took a step before pitching forward on his face. At twenty-five feet, the last two zombies walked around their dead comrades and lurched toward us. I actually thought we were going to take them out by hand when there was two short booms. The heads of each Z racked back from the impact of several balls of double-odd buckshot, dropping them on their backs. Our resident shotgunner had gotten into the action after all. Cease fire! Reload! Charlie yelled out the command, but it was pretty much unnecessary. The first thing any veteran of the upheaval did was reload all his weapons with as much ammo as it would take or he had on him. We looked at our lane of destruction. For a hundred yards, zombies lay in a near-full blanket covering the ground. It was a grim carpet no one was going to order up any time soon as a home decoration. There were a few stragglers off in the distance, and I could already hear the sharpshooters making bets with each other and smack-talking. Suddenly, there were two shots fired so close together as to sound as one. The bullets ripped through the air above us, and in the distance it would have had to be over six hundred yards. The two zombies fell dead. Charlie and I looked back at our RV, which was another hundred yards back, and waved cheerfully at our wives, who waved to us from the top of the vehicle. I don't know who said it, but it made both Charlie and me very proud.
Damn! We started to turn back when a cry went up. Left flank! Left flank! We turned and ran back a bit to clear the others who were doing the same. The fighters who were on the far left were fighting for their lives, for zombies had come out of the woods and were literally on top of us. Charlie and I couldn't use our rifles because the Zs were too close, so we were going to have to do this the hard way. Charlie had already dropped his rifle and his tomahawks were in his hands. I dropped mine and flipped my pick off my shoulder, racing towards the zombies that had managed to sneak up on us. Two of our men were about to be surrounded, and although they fought ferociously, the numbers were going to get them. At least, that's how it would have gone. Charlie slammed a tomahawk into the head of the nearest zombie, killing it. He used his momentum to swing the corpse off the ground and laid out half the zombies that were trying to get at our men. In the struggle to get up, Charlie and I killed the ones that were on the ground. Another zombie stumbled out of the bushes, covered in brambles and leaves. It had a twig sticking out of its mouth like a cigarette, which would have been funny except it was sticking out of its cheek. I used the extra reach my pick provided me and buried the tip of the point in the zombie's head. It fell over, and I wrenched the point out with a jerk. Another zombie reached for me, and I cracked its skull with an overhand swing that knocked it to the ground. Sweeping the legs out from under a third, I smashed that one's face in with a snarl. A fourth tried to grab me around my waist, and I brought my pick's handle in to keep its face away from my gut. I pushed back, and the zombie's skeletal hands barely caressed my vest. I pulled my Glock and shot it once in the head, killing it for good. A fifth was on the ground and grabbed my ankle, but I spun and stepped down on the back of its neck with my other foot. I fired again, leaving it on the ground. Wrenching my foot away from the dead one, another zombie came out of the woods and promptly tripped on a Z that was already dead. Not one to waste opportunity, I backhanded the pick into the top of its head, slowly sending it over the Great Divide. Looking at the woods, I didn't see any more, so I turned my attention back to the fight. I was somewhat surprised when I saw the other zombies were dead, and all of the other members of the group were staring at me. Not knowing what to say, I just shrugged and walked away, being careful to not trip on any zombie or zombie parts. Carry on, I said, beckoning to Charlie. Check the right side to make sure we don't get surprised again. Charlie fell into step with me as we walked back to the RV. I could hear a few whispers behind me, but I couldn't make anything out. I really didn't want to know what they were saying about their crazy chief executive who didn't have enough sense to get out of a fight. Nice work, Charlie said. How do you figure? I asked. I just did what anyone would do. Oh, really? Charlie asked, eyeballing me with one eye. Anyone would just up and take on six zombies in less than two minutes. You're kidding, right? Obviously I wasn't if I just did it, I said. You really don't get what you just did, do you? Charlie asked. What did I just do? I asked, waving to our wives who were still on the roof of the RV. Sarah and Rebecca gave us both a once-over before climbing back down the hatch. You just added to your legend. You just took out six zombies in front of nineteen people who will tell anyone who will listen what a badass their leader actually is, Charlie said. Chances are you'll inspire more than a few village idiots to try and up the score. So much for your inspirational message of hope and understanding, I said, spraying my weapons with kerosene and setting them on fire. The yellow flames flared red, a sign the virus was dead for good. Don't take it the wrong way. I'm all for killing as many as we can. What I'm saying is you probably did more as far as recruitment goes than any speech could ever do, Charlie said. We need the manpower. Did we ever. When we first started this little venture, we figured we would have at least a thousand men and women to back us up. Turns out we managed a little over nine hundred, with a few extra here and there. A lot of the people who had managed to survive the upheaval and get their lives back on something that resembled a normal track weren't really interested in going back out and getting themselves killed. I couldn't say as I blamed them, but as we moved further and further away from the capital, I heard rumors here and there about being glad they were in this war and not taking it easy at home. If I had the memory for it, I might have quoted Shakespeare's St. Crispin's Day speech, but I couldn't remember it.
We only lost ten, so far as I know, unless you're keeping things from me, I said, handing the kerosene sprayer to Charlie. True, but if we run into a major city with big-time populations of zombies, we're gonna need a few more shooters, Charlie said as he sprayed and cleansed his hawks. We'll council up after Duncan and Tommy sweep Bourbonnais, I said. They've got the majority of the fighters anyway. Suddenly there was a blast of horns, and a semi-truck came barreling through the woods. It was on the dirt track that bisected the road we had fought the zombies on. Charlie and I jumped at the sound, then looked around to see if anyone had seen us jump. This could be bad, Charlie said. The truck plowed into the piles of zombies, and body parts flew everywhere. Arms and legs broke from torsos, and hands and fingers blasted apart. Black goo flew like a putrid spray, and at least three heads sailed far over the trees. The truck slewed to the side, unable to stay on the ground, and the driver was hard put to get things under control. The trailer swung wide, then skidded as the tires reached firmer, less slick territory. The truck leaned precariously on the side and then, in slow motion, dropped back to the ground. You're right. That could have been bad, I said. Oh, well. May as well replenish the ammo while it's here. I waved over the rest of the squad, and we made our way to the semi. As we passed the vehicles, I noticed that zombie bits and pieces were all over the cars. Whoever was driving that truck was going to have quite a few angry people to deal with. As we approached, the cab door popped open and Jana jumped out. She was grinning like a kid in a candy store and held out her arms. Rescue! she yelled. Charlie was about to shout something when I held up a hand. Thank you. Appreciate it, I called out. Under my breath, I said to Charlie, She just wants to help. Just let it be. Charlie took my advice and raised a hand. Thank you. Good job. Under his breath, he asked me why Duncan was so protective. Jana was hands down one of the best women with a knife we'd ever seen. Duncan lost his entire family, remember? Just like you. Wouldn't you want to keep Rebecca and Julia as safe as you could? I asked as we reached the back of the semi. Fortunately, the rig had hit the zombies head on, so the muck was less back here. A dead Z that had gotten caught in the wheel well looked up at us reproachfully, as if to ask for a little help. True. Every time Rebecca comes with, I have an extra worry or two, Charlie admitted. Same here, I said. If I had my way, Sarah would be back at Starved Rock, but there was no way she was sitting this one out again. We opened the back, and Charlie climbed inside. We started with the three oh eight, tossing out boxes of ammo to the sharpshooters. The rest got five point five six or two two three, whichever their rifle's preference. I shot three oh eight, but could get by with five point five six since I had two rifles. We resupplied all of our fighters and went back to the river to retrieve our boats. I was glad that didn't have to become an option. But that was part of the overall plan. If we had to retreat, the goal was to always retreat over water. We finally did the experiment with a zombie and a tank of water. As it turned out, the virus didn't need oxygen to survive. But the brain it occupied did. The virus fed the brain oxygen to keep it going, and when the water killed the oxygen, the brain and zombie died. We thanked Jana again, and watched as she muscled the truck back onto the road. She blasted the horn three times and roared away. Sarah and Rebecca were waiting for us when we finally finished securing the boat. Sarah handed me a bottle of water, and I drank it completely, not realizing how thirsty I was. I complimented her and Rebecca on their shooting, and Charlie did the same. Twart nothing. Sarah drawled, sounding absolutely ridiculous. We all laughed and then swept up our kids who were wandering too close to the zombie parts still scattered about. We secured our guns and ammo, getting back on the road with our little caravan. We carefully drove around the mass of zombies we had killed, heading back towards the left turn Charlie had avoided earlier. In this case, it was a right turn, taking us into the heart of Bourbonnais. We passed several zombies lying dead on the side of the road, and several more stacked into small piles. Some of the piles were smoldering and soon would burst into flame. We tried to burn our kills as much as we could, but sometimes it was too hard. 
Many times, if they were locals, they took care of the chore, just grateful they had the help in clearing out the mess. At the south end of Bourbonnais, we reconnected with the rest of the group. Tommy and Duncan were in some kind of meeting with several other men, and I wondered what was up. Charlie drove us up close, and we parked. As I got out, Duncan and Tommy came over. Several of the fighters we were with at the river got out and headed over to their companions, eager to share some stories. I saw several nodding in my directions, and a couple even mimicked a few of the moves I had used against the Zs. I glanced over at Charlie, and I could have slapped the grin he gave me right off his face. Heard you got into it over on the other side of town. Everyone okay? Tommy asked. We lost a car by the subdivision. Couldn't get them out in time, I said. Two guys and a woman? Duncan asked. Charlie shrugged. Could be. Why? We picked up three of our own, running like crazy down the road, looking for backup and wanting to get back to their friends, Duncan said. Looks like you didn't lose anybody, despite Charlie's lousy sense of direction. Charlie said nothing. He just shot a hand out and smacked Duncan in the forehead with a heavy palm. Duncan nearly flipped over backwards as he swapped ends and landed on the ground. We shared a laugh as Duncan shook off the hit and stood back up. He looked a little dazed, but no less confused, which meant he was all right. He'd get back at Charlie later. One time Charlie popped Duncan, and Charlie woke up the next morning tied to his bed, completely immobile. Tommy took that moment to take me to the side. Something we should probably talk about, he said. After the general meeting, we can talk then, I said. At the end of the day, or the end of a serious day of zombie killing, I tried to connect with all my commanders and get the general feel of the army. Most of the time, things were pretty routine, and that was the way I liked it. Any day no one living died was a good one, as far as I could tell. Tommy shook his head. I think we need to talk sooner than that. That was different. Right now? I asked, noticing that a lot of men were watching us, and they looked almost apprehensive. What the hell was going on? All right, let's get into the RV and talk, I said. I waved at Charlie and Duncan. We'll all have a chat. We went back inside the RV and sat around the table. There wasn't enough room for us all, so Sarah stood behind me with her hands on my shoulders. Rebecca stood at the end of the table. Tommy wasted no time. You know the men we had training the fighters? The ones that survived the army being overrun? He asked. I thought for a minute. Sure, the men we put in charge of the three divisions. What were their names again? I asked. Charlie answered. Baker, Haggerty, and Hanley. Did they approach you as a group or one by one? Charlie's voice was low, the way it got when he didn't like what he was hearing. Tommy held up a hand. Before you get murderous, keep in mind I agree with what they had to say. I folded my hands together and leaned forward. What exactly did they have to say? Tommy took a breath. They said you're wasting your time trying to lead this army. I waited a minute before answering, my voice being the only one that broke the shocked silence. And you agreed with them? Tommy nodded. We've been successful so far, but let me finish what they had to say before you kill anyone. What else should I do with traitors? asked Charlie softly. Tommy slammed his hand on the table. Damn it, listen! If you paint those men as traitors, then you'd better be slinging that paintbrush wide because you'll cover a lot of people who agree. Are you going to shut the hell up and let me finish, or are you going to do something stupid? Tommy glared at Charlie. Let me remind you that I've gone through everything you have, and if you think I'll just go quietly because Charlie James is coming for me, you'll get the shock of your life. Both of you, knock it off, I said. But these men... Charlie started to say. And I agreed, Tommy said loudly. Enough, I yelled, whipping out my Glock. I slammed it on the table. I'll shoot the next man who talks. Damned if I won't. Both of you, knock it off. I pointed at Charlie. These men have been with us for a long time. They have proven their loyalty not only to their country, both past and present, but they have tried their best to make sure our fighters have a chance at survival. I shifted and pointed at Tommy. Your presentation skills suck. Instead of stringing your story out a chunk at a time, try just telling the whole damn thing. I holstered my weapon and sat back down. I glared at my two friends and watched their eyes slowly return to normal. 
Once they had calmed down and processed that I was serious, they looked back at each other. Sorry for interrupting, Charlie said. My fault, said Tommy. Continue, please, I said, as if nothing had happened. These men know about you and what you've done. You've taken small groups through the worst of zombie territory and lived to tell about it. I can't count the number of times we survived when we shouldn't. Trouble is, you've never led a group this size before. We're getting bogged down in logistics when we need to be just killing zombies. I couldn't argue with that. My experience in leading large groups of people had been limited to administrative duties as a principal. It was different when I was ordering people to go fight zombies and possibly be sending them to their deaths. Keep going, I said. These guys know how to lead the army we have, and they know how to use the skills they have at their disposal. What they're proposing is to set you loose and go do what you do best, Tommy said. And what is that? I asked. You're a zombie killer. Plain and simple. You work best when it's just you and us, and we're out there risking only our asses. What they suggest is you head out with us, scout ahead, and let them know what they're getting into. They can deploy in a way that best kills the most zombies as possible, Tommy said. I found the argument difficult to disagree with. I did do my best work when I was with a small group. A group I completely trusted. I did have a question, as the history teacher who occupied a small portion of my brain raised his hand. Say I agree with this. Say I go out, scout ahead, and do all the necessary things. What is to stop this trio of men from taking this army back to the capital, establishing themselves as dictators with a hardened band of experienced zombie fighters to beat the rest of the population into line? I asked. Tommy blinked. I could see he hadn't thought about that one. I let the idea marinate in the heads of everyone in the room before I spoke again. I guess I'll need to talk to these men and see what they have to say, I said. If I believe them, then we can get this war moving in a different direction. If not, then... Then we'll take away their commands and send them back to the capital under arrest, Charlie said. Tommy's jaw tightened, but I knew what I had asked was still in his head. I need some convincing before I agreed to this plan, and the sooner, the better. Go back to the men and tell them I want to talk to them. We'll see how convincing they can be, I said. All right. You want them to come here? Tommy asked as he stood up. No, I'll meet them outside. There's a park over there. I'll meet them under the gazebo in twenty minutes. Before he left, Tommy stopped. Would you really have shot Charlie and me? He asked with his hand on the door. I smiled. Not really, but I sure was ready to pistol whip the living shit out of the two of you. Charlie and Tommy did not smile back. I left the table and met Sarah in the back of the RV. Jake was taking a small nap, tired out after being scared for most of the day. I took off my gear and my shirt, washing off my arms and running some water through my hair. Tell me what you're thinking, Sarah said, sitting on the edge of the bed. I shrugged, pulling out a t-shirt and pulling it over my head. If I'm honest with myself, they're right. I'm in way over my head with this whole army thing. I'm good at small unit tactics, but coordinating divisions and regiments and platoons is beyond my experience. They do have a point. I do better when I don't have to worry about hundreds of people. Sarah looked at me. What about that other thing? About them taking over? I'm not in it for the power, you know that. Hell, I've argued against a leadership role from the start. And come to think of it, when I said we were going to war, the Senate nearly flipped when they found out I was planning on going with the volunteers. But I can't run this war from the rear. I can't sit back and tell everyone else, go kill those zombies. That's never been me, I said, sitting down on the bed next to her. I put a hand on my sleeping son's head, wondering if it would be a better thing to send Sarah back to Starved Rock with Jake. I didn't want to think about the argument that would cause. So what are you going to do? she asked, hitting me with the full power of her green-eyed stare. I'll keep it simple, I said. Sarah groaned and fell back, landing next to Jake, who snuggled up against her. I envied him a little at that point. I stood up and took out the forty-five my father had given me. I put it in its holster at my belt after I tucked my shirt in. I didn't bother with my knives or pickaxe. This is simple, 
Sarah asked, eyeing my gun. Just there to make a point, I said. I went back up to the front of the RV, and after looking at me, Charlie elected to dress himself similarly. His T-shirt was one of those sport compression tees, which Charlie's bulk strained at the seams. Charlie was a big man, and the years after the upheaval hadn't softened him much. We still regularly worked out, and while he was stronger than I was, I wasn't a slouch in comparison. If I was honest, Charlie was the one man I would never want to face in anger. Given our skill levels, we'd likely kill each other. Ready? I asked. Ready as I'll ever be, Charlie said. Rebecca talked to you, too? Did she ever? I think we need to send her, Sarah, and the kids back to Starved Rock. I know we need to send Sarah back, Charlie said. What? Why? I asked, stepping out into the evening. I'll tell you later. There they are. Charlie pointed to the gazebo, and we could see three men standing there. We walked over to the park, and as we approached, the men stood at attention and saluted. I never could get used to that, but I respected it. I returned the salute and waved the men to the picnic benches. I was reminded vividly of the picnic benches that saved my life not too long ago. Charlie stood at the edge of the gazebo, his huge arms crossed in front of his chest. I opened the conversation. Tommy told me what you gentlemen have proposed. At first, I was suspecting some form of mutiny, I said. I held up my hands for silence. No one doubts your loyalty, but look at it from my side. What would you think? What would be the first thing you would think of? That stopped them. Then the leader of the group, a man called Ted Hanley, spoke up. Sure, you have to understand. We know you're trying your best, but we've seen you second-guess yourself. Wait too long to send people in and throw yourself into situations you shouldn't have to handle, Ted said. We heard about what you did by the river, and that's one of the reasons we want to take away this command from you. You're a born scout. Your instincts are for assessing a threat and keeping yourself and your unit alive. In all honesty, sir, you're wasted back here. So what is your proposal? I asked, looking at each man in turn. If one of them failed to hold my eyes, the entire thing was off and these men were finished. Every one of them held my gaze. I had to admit, I was both relieved and surprised. Ted replied, We want you to scout ahead. Let us know where we have to use all of our resources or just a few. I'd rather not drag this entire army all over creation. We are mobile and we're getting bogged down. Wilmington could have taken three trucks, and the other could have been sent here. I looked hard at him, but he continued. You couldn't have known that, sir, but we don't have anyone telling us what we need to know. The locals are useless for information, as we discovered up in Mantino. I had to admit that was true. There were fifty surviving families, and not one of them could remember when they saw a zombie last. So you want me to move along? Get me out of the way so you can do your job better, I said. Tom Haggerty spoke up. Sir, I understand what you want to do. I really do. But as Ted said, you're wasted back here. You and your friends are the best scouts we have, the most suited to survive, and you're not scouting. I nodded. You're right. We should be scouting. All right, then. We'll do it your way. The three men looked at each other in obvious relief. One question, though, I said. How do I know you won't try to get rid of me and take the army back to the capital to work a coup? How do I know you won't just use this as an opportunity to take over for yourselves? Charlie shifted, and the men I spoke to were silent for a minute. Then Ted spoke again. One simple reason, sir. If we were to try and betray you, we'd know we'd never sleep soundly again, knowing you were out there, knowing you were coming for us, he said. Personally, it'd be quicker just to shoot ourselves. Good answer, I said. I'll address the army in the morning. Let the unit commanders know what's happening and come up with a way of communicating that makes sense and will keep us all alive. Sir! The men stood again to salute, and both Charlie and I returned it. As we were walking back to the RV, Charlie spoke in a low tone. Did you believe them? he asked. I want to, my friend. I really want to, I said. We'll burn down that bridge when we cross it, I suppose. We walked back to the trailer, and once inside, we brought everyone up to the table. 
I let them know what my decision was, and Charlie supported it. We were going to address the troops in the morning. I said I felt like I was abandoning the fighters, but Rebecca shot that down quick enough. John, I've talked to a dozen men and women, and every single one wonders why you and Charlie and Tommy and Duncan are here. You four are a unit that takes years to form, and you're hell on wheels when you get going. This army stuff isn't for you. If you tell them tomorrow that you're going to be the advance of the army, chances are good they will stand up and cheer, she said in a firm voice. I nodded. It made the most sense. And in reality, it was what I wanted to do. I fought best with my best friends by my side, not from a command center. All right. Well, I'm glad that's over, I said. One other thing, Rebecca said, looking meaningfully at Sarah. I caught the look and waited for my wife to speak. Sarah looked shy. I'm going back to the capital with Rebecca and Jana. What? I was completely taken by surprise. I was also relieved as hell I wasn't going to have to try and convince her to go. Sarah looked at me. I'm pregnant. Oh, my God, I said, holding her tight. That's wonderful. Wait, what the hell were you doing fighting zombies the other day? Are you nuts? You're going back to the capital tomorrow, that's for sure. John, easy, big guy, Rebecca smiled. Sarah wasn't sure, but she is now. She and Jana are both expecting, and we'll be heading back to live in the capital until you return. Rebecca turned serious. You have seven months before your child is born. I expect you to be there. I hugged Sarah again. Not even another Major Thornton could keep me away. Afterward, we went over to Duncan's trailer to congratulate Jana and stun Duncan, who had no idea he was going to be a father. Then we went to find Tommy to tell him the news of my decision and the decision of the wives. Both were well received. It's the best choice, and I for one will be grateful, Tommy said. Why is that? Duncan asked. Tommy smiled and punched his old friend on the arm. You're getting soft. You need new challenges. Amen, yelled Jana. And his daughter will be plenty of challenge, I guarantee it. How do you know it's not a boy? Duncan asked. Jana smiled. I just know. Get ready, Daddy-O. I had a hard time wrapping my head around what kind of child those two were going to bring into the world. Apparently, Charlie did, too. Why do I get the feeling we're going to be dealing with a child who loves to blow up knives? He asked. No reason, I said. No reason at all. In the morning, we had a general assembly after breakfast, and I announced to the troops what I was going to do and who was going to be left in charge. There were a lot of nods of agreement, so I knew then it was the right thing to do. Afterwards, we met with the leaders and hammered out a communication plan. It was simple and easily followed. We would deal with what we could and avoid what we couldn't. Big cities we would try and scout, but generally stay away from them. We would also serve as recruiters, trying to find locals who could help fight the good fight. After that, we met to say goodbye to the women who were going back to civilization. I held on to Sarah for a long time, and I held on to Jake for a long time as well. This wasn't a place for him. I was mistaken for having him along. The girls were going to take the RVs back to the capital. They would just slow us down for what we needed to do. Promise me you'll be there for the birth? Sarah asked. I promise. I will be there. I will send word when I can, I said. I kissed her like it was going to be the last time, and then saw them onto the RV. Sarah was driving at my insistence after Jana's performance with the semi. Jake was happy he was going to where there were other children to play with, and Julia was happy she was riding with her friend Jana. I stood watching them until they were out of sight. Charlie and Duncan stood next to me as we watched our wives drive away. Tommy was smarter than the rest of us, leaving his wife and child back in the capital. I was wearing my gear, backpack and all. My two rifles were at my feet, resting on the bag of ammo I shared with Charlie. I turned around and faced the three men who were going to lead the army in my absence. I'll take two trucks. We'll provision ourselves on the road. We'll head south, scout the bigger cities and communities. Let you know how the land lays. If we tell you to avoid some place, you do it. 
We'll likely turn east into Indiana and then go from there. We'll leave you a trail, I said. Tom Haggerty smiled. Yes, sir. Good to have you back, sir. I grinned. Man has to know his limitations. Charlie picked up his bag and slung his rifle over his shoulder. We walked over to the two pickup trucks that were parked nearby. Tommy was already waiting in one. Ready? he called out. Charlie nodded as he secured his gear in the back. Let's get to work. Gilman, Illinois What do you see? I whispered. There's ten right below us, another fifteen up the street. I can see a side street with about five more just standing there, Tommy said. All right, I clicked into the radio. Charlie? No answer. Charlie? Hang on, Tommy's voice came through. Charlie's surrounded right now. Give him a minute to let them wander away. Need a hand? I asked. Might be a need if they don't clear pretty soon. I'll see what I can do. I eased myself out of my spot and carefully made my way towards the garage door. I was in a machine shop, one of several in a small industrial park. Across the way was a motorcycle repair shop, a small engine repair shop, and a ceramic tile store. The previous owner of the machine shop had objected to my presence and subsequently was lying dead near the back door. His overalls were full of his own guts, torn out when he had been attacked by the zombies. The organs had gathered around his knees, making it look like he was wearing giant knee pads. If nothing else, I put him out of the misery of looking so foolish. We were in the town of Gilman, having been on the road for two weeks. We had left the army behind, letting them clean up the bigger messes while we scouted ahead. Twice we had managed to lure the inhabitants of a dead town into a large building, locking them in, but that was pure luck. Shabance was oddly clear, being so close to the highway, and Ashcombe was full of dead people. Charlie actually got cornered by half a dozen zombies and only managed to escape when he scrambled through a very small window. Tommy described the scene as a very attractive building giving birth to the ugliest baby he had ever seen. Danforth was both good and bad. Bad because we had a day-long fight with dozens of zombies, but good in that we were able to find a big load of supplies, including a large cache of ammo. In fact, the toolbox behind the cab of the truck Tommy and Duncan rode in was filled with lethal lead pills. I knelt near the garage door and peeked outside. The way seemed clear, but I wasn't going to take any chances. We were spread out in this place, and for the moment, the zombies didn't know we were here. If we could keep it that way, learn where the majority of them were, then we could start a gather to a central location. That was the general plan. Get disease drifting and following one or two people to a pre-selected location, and then destroy the location. The stragglers we would deal with, and then move on after we left a sign for the army. I pulled a small mirror out of my pocket and slowly brought it out to check the corners. Not seeing anything, I rolled quickly out and flattened myself against the building. All the zombies I had seen were on the other side, just standing around. Most of the time they wouldn't move unless something motivated them. Knowing my luck, some stupid rabbit would run through town right past me. Looking back and forth, I moved quietly to the other end of the building. Using the mirror again, I checked the side of the building. I jerked my hand back as the mirror showed a skeletal hand reaching for the shiny object. Jamming the mirror in my pocket, I waited until the arm showed at the corner. I grabbed the arm at the wrist, pulling the zombie forward. When the elbow appeared, I leveraged the zombie around the corner and pulled it down to the ground. The Z, a young man of about twenty who was turning a rather uniform shade of gray, tried his best to bite my hand, but all he managed to do was bite a chunk out of his bicep. I knelt on the man's shoulder blades while his feet scraped the ground. His head moved back and forth, trying one way and then another to bite. I pulled my knife and stabbed him in the base of his skull, ceasing his movements. He wasn't dead yet, as his mouth opening and closing told me. Pressing the point of my blade against the side of his head, I jammed the palm of my other hand onto the pommel, driving the knife into his brain. His movement stopped completely, and I wiped my blade off on his shirt. I cleaned it completely later. I went back to the building and checked the corner again. The way was clear, and a quick look behind me showed that there hadn't been any alarm raised. 
then moved across the street, reaching in another building and moving along the side. I kept my movement slow and steady, trying not to attract attention to myself. Don't worry about me. I'm just a part of the scenery. No need to get upset or think you can eat me. Just keep ghouling along. Everybody stay cool. The street was empty, but that didn't mean there weren't zombies around. Chances were pretty good there were some in the buildings, but as long as they didn't hear or see me, they weren't my problem. If they did see me and couldn't get out to cause a ruckus, still not my problem. If they were banging on the doors and windows, then they became my problem. I stayed in the shadows, which was tough, because the sun was rising and the shadows were disappearing. But zombies had a hard time with quick light shifts, so the more contrast, the better. I found a dark corner that was unoccupied and slipped in. Pulling my radio out, I whispered into it. Tommy, you there? I asked. Yep, I see you. Nice work with the Z, by the way. Thanks. How's Charlie? Still stuck. I think they might suspect something is nearby, which would explain why they aren't leaving. How many? Fifteen. But there's a crowd of thirty nearby, so it's going to be close, Tommy said. Damn. All right, where's Duncan? Trapped like Charlie. He went to go help and nearly ran into a small horde. Hang on. I'll call you back in a minute, I said. I didn't want to just run over and start firing. While it would be effective, we found that sound carried really well over the prairie, and zombies' hearing was exceptionally good. By the time we had cleared these out, every zombie within ten miles would be converging on this spot. I sprinted past the Gilman flower shop and over to the Dollar General. I wasn't sure what I was looking for, but something had to be of use. The door was busted wide open, and no doubt the place had been looted years ago, but I wasn't looking for food. I began to get an idea in my head, and if my hunch was right, what I needed was still in the store. I slipped through the front, leading with my pickaxe. I didn't want to waste any time killing something that had been resting in here. The floor was littered with boxes and clothes and things that people didn't need during an apocalypse. I'd been in Dollar General stores before, and even during the best of times, their shelves were stuffed with goods. I had to pick my way over all of the goods that had been discarded in search of more valuable items. I did pick up and stash in my backpack a couple of overlooked long-stem lighters, those were always useful. I made my way over to the toy section, and to my very little surprise, it had been hardly looked at. Who needs a Barbie when the zombies want to come out and play? I found a box of what I was looking for and grabbed a handful. It was a long shot, but it was the only one I had. I went back outside and kept myself as low as possible. Moving across a wide open space in between two buildings really made me sweat. Fortunately, there was a solid fence for a good part of it, so if there were any zombies on the east side, they wouldn't notice me. I sidled up next to a place called Doc's Drugs and carefully looked around the corner. Across the parking lot was a large grain elevator, which seemed to be a requirement in order for any rural gathering of buildings to call themselves a town. This one was bigger than most, with three huge silos and a control building that had to be over thirty stories tall. Around the base of a small trio of silos were about fifteen zombies milling about and seemingly agitated. When they were like that, they knew something was wrong in their world, but they couldn't place where it was. A line of trucks waited for loading that would never come, and around them were another dozen zombies. If I was a betting man, I'd say my friends were somewhere around the trucks and silos. Knowing Tommy, he was up in the tower looking down on us all. I waved absently to the tower and got a confirmation double-click on my radio. I went around to the other side of the building and crept around to the back. I had to be careful not to trip or cause a ruckus. While that would get my friends out of their predicaments, I'd rather we didn't share everything. I took one off the toys I had taken from the Dollar General, and with a sweep of the arm and a quick flick of the wrist, I let the frisbee fly. It sailed out over the grass and collided with the nearest metal silo with a noisy thump. Instantly, the zombies went into high alert, stumbling and walking over to the spot. The Zs around the trucks left their post and came over, curious as to the source of the noise and to see if the buffet was any good. I liked my efforts and wound up another frisbee. I sent this one further out into the field where it thunked onto the ground and rolled away. 
The zombies caught the sight and sound and immediately pursued. The entire horde went chasing after a frisbee, and for good measure I threw another one, really giving this one a heave and getting it over the heads of the ghouls. It too bounced and rolled, taking the crowd with it. My radio came to life again as Tommy made contact with Charlie and Duncan. If you're going, go now. They're out of sight around the north silo. Go! Tommy's voice was urgent, and I imagined he was on his way out of the tower as well. From my vantage point, I could see Charlie get up from a catwalk and swing down, not even wasting time with the stairs. Duncan popped his head out of the back of a grain truck, slipping over the side and running away from the grain elevator. I threw one more frisbee, just going for distance, and the wind gave me an assist on that one. The zombies were just about to turn around when the black and gold flying discs skimmed their heads, hitting the ground and rolling a ways before coming to a stop against a fence. That was enough sight and sound to move them along, and I went back around the building to meet my friends at the front of Doc's Drugs. Let's get to the trucks and out of sight, I said, running past the cheap motel. I would bet the contents of my bag that the green water in the pool was green before the upheaval, not after. Nice work getting the zombies gone without a swarm. What did you use? Charlie asked as we ran. I pulled a frisbee out of my vest. Useful little things. Bet the maker never thought to put zombie distractor as one of its attributes. Duncan laughed. That's awesome. I used to play with those things all the time. You can actually throw them around corners. We'll keep the last three just in case. Push comes to shove, we can use them as plates, Tommy said. We reached our trucks and climbed aboard, wanting to put some miles behind us. Tommy had already left a sign for the army, so they would know what they were facing and where. On the tower, he had managed to spray paint the letters Z, the number 40 and a plus sign, and the letters S and E. That told the army there were zombies here, at least 40 in a horde, and we were headed south by southeast. We drove south on County Road 850 East until we hit East 1600 North Road. Why the North-South Road was labeled as East and the East-West Road was labeled as North was as confusing a mystery as it always was. My guess, as usual, was the morons making the names up had the map facing the wrong way. Tommy just said he drove by actual direction, not what the stupid roads were called. East on North Road brought us to a small farmhouse, and by the looks of things, someone was still alive in there. We parked outside the driveway on the road and called up to the house. We didn't get an answer, and we called again. The house was in good condition, with no parts needing repair. A high fence surrounded the entire estate, which by my estimate was around 5,000 square feet. One house with a large garage, barn, and small silos made this place a decent working farm before the end came. Chances were pretty good they were fairly self-sufficient. Hello, the house. Anyone home? I called again. We waited patiently for another ten minutes before I shrugged and we moved back towards the trucks. Just as we loaded up, a voice came calling from the porch. Hello yourselves. Come on up. I looked for the owner of the voice and it was an older man, about fifty years. He was dressed in a simple button-down shirt and pants. A battered hat rested upon his head, and very clear brown eyes gazed at us as we walked up the long driveway. I had the feeling more than one pair of eyes watched us as we walked up, and the moving curtain on the second floor confirmed it. The man on the porch was not alone, however. He was flanked by a huge black lab that watched us with curious eyes. As we walked up, I saw the yard had been cultivated to grow crops and a small creek had been diverted to irrigate the crops and provide water for the family. A tank had been sunk into the ground, and as we passed, I thought I saw the flash of a fish as it neared the surface. Welcome. I'm Jerry Blackburn. Don't get many visitors these days. He cradled his rifle, a used but loved Winchester thirty thirty. At his side was a simple leather holster in which rode a revolver. You folk look like you're riding to war. In a manner of speaking, I said. We're actually scouts for the Army of the New United States, which just recently formed up north. We're scouting the towns and local areas, assessing the number of zombies that are around, and taking care of what we can. No kidding. For a while now, I figured we were all alone out here. Mr... Jerry asked. My apologies. I'm John Talon. 
My friends here are Charlie James, Duncan Freeze, and Tommy Carter. He won't bother you any longer, Mr. Blackburn, just to let you know there's an army heading south. There's a large community north of here on the Illinois River. That's what we call the capital now. I looked around. Not that you would have a reason to leave, but if you hankered for a little of what civilization we have to offer, there's a place up north. Jerry leaned on a porch post. I'll be damned. He put the rifle down and patted the lab on its big head. My apologies for the weapons. We've had a few encounters that leave me wary of strangers. You four look like you could cause a heap of trouble if you were of a mind to. Duncan spoke up. That's why you didn't answer our first call. If we tried to break down the fence, you knew our intentions. But since we were willing to leave well enough alone, you figured we were all right. Jerry winked. You're dead right, son. I'm not alone here, but only a fool shows his whole hand. I like Jerry. I hoped we met more like him. Anything we can do for you? I asked, preparing to leave. Well, there is one thing, Jerry said. But it's not really my place to ask. Why is that? Charlie asked. Any of you fellers single? Jerry asked. Inside, there was a gasp and a startled, Paul, that reached our ears. We were polite enough to smile, but not laugh. I couldn't blame Jerry for trying. There was definitely a new twist on the dating scene these days, and the pickings were slim indeed. Well, sir, as a matter of fact, we were all spoken for. However, I do know that there is an army of several hundred men and women headed this way. I'm sure you could find a suitable partner somewhere in there. If you were to join up, the chances would likely increase. Duncan spoke up. Every one of them a veteran zombie fighter. No worries about being able to do the right thing, since they already have. I'll think on it, son. Thanks kindly. Anything you need for your trip? Jerry asked. I shook my head. Just information. What's the best route south of here to come in the cities on the interstate without getting on the interstate? Jerry thought about that one. Route 45 is your best bet. Take you alongside most of them, but I can't say for sure past the ones I haven't visited. Fair enough, I said. Nice meeting you, Jerry. You too, John. By the way, how do you fit in the new government up north? Jerry asked. Nothing major, I said. I was elected president a few months ago. Charlie there is the vice president. Have a good one. We walked off the porch, leaving Mr. Blackburn open-mouthed behind us. Route 49 Back on the road, we headed south and then turned east. I wanted to head west, but Tommy reminded me the sign we left the army said we were headed east. Fair enough. According to the map I read, we would have decent luck heading south following Route 49. County Road 1500 North took us there, but by no logic I could come up with. We stayed on 49 for a little while, slowing down and looking into several homes and farms. If there was anyone alive, we didn't see them. At around noon, we stopped at a house that was close to the road. It was a ranch house with a detached garage and an above-ground pool in the backyard. I circled the house to see if there was anything in the yard, and nothing told me that this house had been anything but abandoned. The pool was empty as one side had caved in. The grass was really green around one side of the pool, which told me it recently had let go. I looked into the rear windows and the large sliding doors, but nothing came looking back. Around the front of the house, Charlie was rummaging around in the back of the truck. He pulled out a small bag, tossed me a chunk of beef jerky, and sliced me a piece of bread. I pulled my water out of my pack and quietly shared lunch with Charlie on the tailgate of the truck. I figured Tommy and Duncan were in the house, since they were nowhere to be found. Inside? I asked, working a tough piece of jerky to the back of my teeth. Ugh, said Charlie, wrangling a bite of bread and meat. I heard a bit of commotion in the house, but there weren't any shots, so I figured everything was okay. If Tommy or Duncan, especially Duncan, came running out, I was definitely bugging out. You hear that? Charlie asked. Hear what? That humming sound. I listened for a minute. Now I do. Is it getting louder? Seems like it. Coming down the road, you think? Charlie asked. Well, that car is, I said, pointing to our back trail. 
Down the road, kicking up dust and debris, was a car that was traveling way too fast. As we watched, it banged its way around some potholes, bouncing its passengers around. What do you think? I asked, finishing my jerky and working on my bread. I like to pull it apart and eat it in pieces. Hard to eat sandwiches that way, but old habits are hard to break. I think I'm going to get onto the other side of this truck and let the Trouble Twins know we may have company, Charlie said, hopping off the truck bed and moving over to the house. Sticking his head in the door, he whistled three times and then came back to the truck. I kept eating my bread, keeping an eye on the rapidly approaching car. It was an old Monte Carlo, big enough to carry six people in comfort but lousy with gas mileage. Still, the old steel frame could likely wipe out a horde without taking a dent. The car roared past, and I managed to get a glimpse of the passengers. There appeared to be four of them, but I thought I saw a fifth. I watched them go by, and then I heard them slam on the brakes, shuttering the car to a halt. The driver wrenched the car in a tight circle, punishing the engine to reverse course. Whoever was driving seemed to be operating on the principle that if he had to go somewhere, he had to get there as fast as possible, even if it was only a few hundred feet. I had heard about that sort of driving happening in Italy in days gone by. The car skidded to a halt in front of the driveway, and I got a better look at the passengers. They seemed to be around twenty years in age, maybe more, maybe less, but not much. The driver was a long-haired youth with a soft-looking face. In another life, I'm sure he would have been very successful with the ladies. Next to him sat a largest boy, thick around the neck and shoulders. In the back seat was another boy and two girls who rounded out the gang. I kept eating my bread, savoring the crust and wishing I had some marinara sauce to dip it in. I returned the stares I received, not worrying too much about what they might do. I knew Duncan and Tommy were covering them from the house, and Charlie likely had his hand already on a gun. The car vomited its passengers, and the driver led the way. When he was about fifteen feet from me, I held up a hand, stopping him in his tracks. That's far enough. I can hear and see you from there. What can I do for you? I asked, popping the last bit of bread in my mouth and wiping the crumbs off my pants. I stood up and hooked my thumbs in my belt, keeping my hand close to my knife and gun. The long-haired kid bobbed his head from side to side, looking at me with what could only be described as crazy eyes. I couldn't tell if something was seriously wrong with him or if he was just messing around. Either way, I wasn't taking chances. I'll ask again. What can I do for you? I said, trying to keep an eye on crazy here while his friends slowly spread out. Charlie chose that moment to make his presence known. Man asked you a question. What do you want? He walked over, literally radiating malice, stepping up to my left and putting a halt to the advance of the big kid. That worthy nearly fell over, stopping so suddenly as he did. Charlie was at least a foot taller than the big kid. While the kid was big due to a large amount of fat, Charlie was large due to the fact he was Charlie. Well, now, ain't you all just a couple of hard men... Crazy asked slowly, still moving his head around as he spoke. It was slightly distracting, and then it hit me. It was meant to be distracting. His head stopped moving when the barrel of my gun connected with his forehead. Take your hand off the gun you have in the small of your back, or I'll put you down, I said, flicking my eyes over his companions. Charlie's gun was out in an instant, and the big kid's eyes were saucers as they tried to calculate how big of a bullet came out of the barrel they were suddenly looking down. Crazy smiled. Ain't no call for rude, just being careful. Never know who you might meet out here, he said, smirking his excuse at me. Call me overly cautious, then. Hands out to your sides where I can see them. Ladies, the kind of thing will get you killed, I said. The two girls were trying to reach under their jackets, and they quickly elevated their hands at my insistence. I spun crazy around and pulled a small revolver out from the small of his back. A quick frisk found another gun in his jacket pocket. Charlie pulled the gun off Big Boy, and the third lad never lowered his hands from the full surrender. I figured him for the smart one. "'There's only two of you, and we can go get more,' Crazy said over his shoulder. Might be you want to reconsider your current course of action. 
Maybe you're right. Maybe I should just let you and your dumbass friends here kill me and take my stuff, I asked, shoving him back towards his car. He hit the bumper with his shin, and given the age of the car, the bumper won that round. Crazy put a hand to his shin, but then he must have thought it made him look weak to acknowledge that he had been hurt, so his hand retreated quickly. He stared at me for a minute, before swinging his hands in a circle. His friends took the signal to get back in the car. We'll see you again, Crazy said, pushing his friends to the car. Maybe so, but not today, I said. Move on. You're outclassed and outgunned. If we see you within a mile of us, we'll stop what we're doing and focus all of our attention on making your life as short as possible. Think on it. Hard. Only two. You got this round. You don't get another, Crazy said as he slid into the vehicle. Have a nice day, kid, I said. We'll see you soon. The Monty roared to life, and I could see that Crazy was thinking about trying to ram me with the car. I reached back into the truck and pulled out my rifle. I aimed it at the windshield and shook my head. Crazy must have had a moment of clarity, because he put the car in gear, backed out to the road, and sped away. I looked over at Charlie, and he shrugged. Think we'll see them again, he asked. Doubt it. Looks like they were a one-trick gang, I said. Sad thing is their little trick must have worked enough for them to think they could use it on us. How'd you know he was reaching? Charlie asked. All I could see was his head moving around. That was the point. It's not natural for someone's head to move when they talk, so it really takes your attention. I just saw his hands move out of the corner of my eye, I said. That and you're a suspicious son of a bitch, Charlie said. There is that, I agreed. Duncan and Tommy came out of the house, carrying a pillowcase of cans each. Evidently, this house had been a good stop after all. Kids these days, Duncan said as he stowed his sack in the back of the truck. It's the math they learn. Drives them crazy, Tommy said. Let's get lost, I said. We've got miles to go, and I'd rather not be here when that crew dredges up reinforcements. We hit the road, and for a time we made really good progress. 49 was a decent road without too many potholes and obstacles to clear away. The state was wide open at this point. If we could figure out a way to get all the zombies to converge on this point, shoot, with enough ammo, we could take them all down. Cisna Park, Illinois The road wound around a couple of 90-degree turns, taking us west for a bit, then back south again. The southerly direction was marked by a small town suddenly sprouting up in the middle of nowhere. We literally went from nothing to something. On our right was a jumble of houses, while on our left was a park center filled with the memories of Little League games from days gone by. Further in, the town looked like it had been spared the worst of the upheaval, with homes looking tidy and neat. A couple looked like they had recently cut grass. "'Wonder where the people are?' Charlie asked as we moved slowly down the road. Not sure. Maybe... Shit! I yanked my hand back inside the window and quickly rolled it up. Out of a side street, about a half dozen zombies came tearing towards the truck on my side. I barely got the window rolled up when a snapping face slammed into it, leaving a greasy streak as it slid off. Ah, there they are, Charlie said as he pushed on the gas pedal, taking us away from the group. Tommy and Duncan were close behind, swerving away from the Z that plowed into my window. We raced down the street, trying to get some distance when Charlie cursed. Damn it, that doesn't help. He turned the truck again, heading up a street that led through the middle of the houses. Behind us, a stream of zombies came out to block the road, effectively leading us into the heart of the community. How many? I called through the radio at Tommy. Maybe fifty, probably closer to eighty, Tommy said. Tommy had a bizarre knack for estimating the strength of an enemy horde. Great, I said. I grabbed the handle above the door as Charlie swerved again, narrowly missing several zombies that were blocking the road. We were running out of room fast, and they all were converging on our position. Hang on, Charlie said. He pulled the wheel to the right, slewed across a lawn, and raced in between two houses. At the next subdivision street, he turned right again, roaring past the zombies that were chasing us, only this time they were facing away. Get to the outside of town. We'll get killed in here, I said, trying to see a way through. 
Pick the road and I'll take it, Charlie said, gripping the wheel tightly. Left, up ahead, I yelled. Charlie took the turn at about thirty miles an hour, and the G-forces pushed me to the door. I checked behind us and was grateful to see Duncan give me a wave from the second truck. Right at the park, I said, hanging on as the truck applied the same G-forces in the opposite direction. Why does this look familiar? Charlie said. It's where we first got hit by the zombies. They chased us, and now they're behind us, I said, watching a group stumble out from in between some little houses. Nice one, Charlie said. Now what are your plans for dealing with them? he asked. We need to get to some higher ground, or at least some open ground where we can see them coming, I said. Look out! Charlie slammed on the brakes, and I fully expected to get hit from behind. But Tommy managed to swerve and put the truck alongside us. He looked over at us, and then he saw what caused us to stop. On the road ahead of us, effectively blocking the way, was a quartet of old cars. Behind the cars were about fifteen people, all in various states of gear for battle. One kid was actually wearing a football helmet. They were about twenty yards away, and I could see several of them had rifles. One was holding a crossbow, and a few had handguns pointed our way. Thoughts? Charlie asked. I had an idea. Just wait a minute, I said, looking in the side mirror. Just stay here until I say go, then hard left across the field. I picked up the radio and repeated the instructions, getting a click from Duncan in reply. In front of us, the gang was waiting, too. Sitting in the second car was crazy, slowly smoking a cigarette. He clearly was enjoying himself, thinking he had the upper hand. In his position, I might have thought the same. Our trucks were blocking the view of the street, and the focus of the gang was on the passengers of the trucks, not the landscape behind them. I hoped that no one would take a shot at us before we made our move. After a minute, I watched Crazy slowly ease his way out of the car. He looked over at us, and his head moved in small circles as he planned his next move. I'd bet every round of ammo I had that he had no inkling I would do what I did next. Leaning out the window, I waved and yelled out, Come and get them! They're all yours! Charlie floored the gas, and the truck leaped to the side sliding down a deep ditch before climbing out the other side. Tommy was right behind us, and with the two trucks out of the way, the zombies who were nearly at our tailgates suddenly noticed the group of appetizers standing so teasingly close. Over the roar of the engine, I heard the collective groan of that horde of zombies. A second later, there was a series of rifle fire combined with a crack of handguns. We pulled up at the edge of town and waited. After a moment, the rifle fire stopped. There were three handgun shots, and then silence. I got out of the truck and pulled my rifle out from the back locker. Charlie, Duncan, and Tommy all followed suit, and together we waited to see the outcome of the battle. Either way it turned out, we were probably going to have to shoot somebody. A minute later, a single car came limping out. Kids were crammed in like it was a clown car, and it passed us without even slowing down to glare hatred at us. Guess they lost. How do you think they did? Duncan asked. Hang on and we'll see, Tommy said. He was right. From behind an ice cream shop came about fifteen zombies. They were bloody from their hands up to their teeth, and it didn't take a genius to figure out what they had been chewing on. I felt a little bad when a zombie wearing a football helmet came stumbling out, missing an arm and part of his hand. I took aim with my rifle and blasted a hole into the helmet, putting him down for good. More shots rang out as my friends cleaned up the mess, dropping zombies left and right. In a few minutes, it was all over. Tommy, find a spot for a message to the army. We're done here, I said. Lafayette, Indiana We'd been on the road for over four weeks, running zombies in small towns and finding our path through the world of the upheaval. We found several communities still alive and actually had people volunteer to join the army. The way to the military was pretty clear, thanks to the trail we had blazed. Some people didn't believe us. Others thought we were just trying to trick them. In one community, Duncan had a man challenge him to a duel with sabers, which was funny until the man produced a gun to try and shoot Duncan after Duncan won. We had to leave that community while they buried their dead friend, 
I made a mental note to come back as president with a brigade to remind them how the law was settled these days. We were in Indiana, having crossed the border a week ago. We were outside the town of Lafayette, buried in the forest and taking a breather by the river. We hadn't seen any zombie activity on this end of the city, and I was curious as to why it was so. Charlie and Duncan had scouted around and told me they hadn't found any zombies either. As a matter of fact, they hadn't found anyone at all, but they surely knew someone was around here somewhere. River to the south of us probably keeps any zombies on the main city side away from this one, Charlie said, relaxing in the cab of the truck. I was stretched out in the truck bed, looking over maps and figuring out our route. We were talking through the rear window opening, although anyone on the outside would think I was talking to myself. All right, but Purdue University is on this side. If the upheaval hit three, three and a half years ago, what time of year, you remember? I said. Ah, hell, I think it was spring. Around April, maybe, Charlie replied. You don't remember? I asked. Since you don't either, don't judge. Point taken. I'm trying to remember what the weather was like. I think it was spring, early spring, I said. Why is it important? Charlie asked. If the upheaval hit in full force in the spring and all these students were here on campus, we may be looking at over 50,000 zombies just on this side of the river, I said. That's a lot more than I prefer. But if that was the case, then where did they all go? You and Duncan didn't find anyone. Not a survivor, not even a Z. So what's the deal? If they all survived by some miracle, then how are they keeping themselves alive? Food stores would run out for a thousand people in six months, I said. Maybe you're looking at this from a worst-case scenario point of view, Charlie said. What if a bunch survived, killed the zombies before they became a problem, and then faded into the hills? Seriously? I said. Seriously. Listen, these are college kids. They were college kids plugged into information in ways we could have only dreamed about at their age. When the first zombies hit, you don't think they knew about it. You yourself learned how to deal with them by watching videos I bet were posted by teens and college-age kids. They probably knew the Z's were coming before anyone else and knew how to neutralize the threat, Charlie said. I had to admit it was a good argument. So this whole area is safe, then? Didn't say that. But college towns might be safer than just regular towns, Charlie theorized. Our conversation was interrupted by Tommy returning from his scouting. John! Charlie! You have to see this, Tommy said, refilling his water bottle from a jug on the truck. What is it? Charlie asked, heaving his bulk out of the cab. Just come with, Tommy said. We walked out with Tommy and moved towards what looked like old playing fields. The grass was long, of course, but it seemed to have been cut recently. The campus was quiet, and we walked steadily down Third Street, passing some very zombie-proof buildings. One was just brick on all sides with no windows and a single point of entry. We turned right onto North University Street, and then onto West State Street, and then past North River Road and onto East State Street. I was starting to wonder why we didn't take the truck when I saw the barrier. It was a solid wall of cinder block, formed together and fitting perfectly across the street from building to building. Let me guess, there's one of these along every street that leads in from the river? I asked. Yep, and if you wait you can hear the chanting, Tommy said. What? Charlie asked. Come and see, Tommy said. He walked over to the side of the barrier, and steel poles had been placed in the wall. They formed a kind of ladder that went up to the top of the wall. If you weren't careful, you were going to slip through and seriously hurt yourself. At the top of the ladder, we crossed the wall and descended the other side. The poles were much shorter on this side and required you to place a hand on the wall for balance. Zombies could never get up this ladder. I made a mental note to use this design if I ever needed something like this. On the other side, we saw signs of some devastation— some buildings looked burned, and there were the typical signs of battle. Things were starting to make a little sense, but still it was odd. That was when I heard the singing. It was coming from an area in front of us and was loud enough to carry quite a distance. Behind the music, however, I heard the darker side, and it was what made me think about reaching for a weapon. It was the groan of thousands of zombies, and they were close. 
Charlie felt it too. What the hell? Yeah. Tommy led us down towards the river and then turned on to Tapawingo Drive. The singing was much louder, although it seemed like it was aimed across the river. In the trees in a small park were hundreds of young men and women. They were singing and clapping, yet they all to a person were not smiling. It was as if there was purpose behind the songs, and they were very serious about it. Tommy? I asked, looking around as people looked at me while they were still singing. To say it was creepy would be putting it mildly. Come on, she's over here, Tommy said. He led the way until we were standing at the river's edge, looking out over a destroyed pedestrian bridge. Across the river, thousands of zombies groaned and reached for us, and some even fell into the river to be slowly swept away. Down river, I could see several men with long poles waiting to jab a zombie who somehow made it to the shallows of the wrong side. The picture was getting clearer. The singing drew the zombies to the river where they would stay as long as they heard something to chase. They couldn't cross the river, and while they were here, they might not be paying as close attention to other things in their vicinity. In a word, brilliant. Mr. Talon, came a voice behind me. I turned and looked into the clear blue eyes of a pretty young woman. She was in her late twenties and simply dressed. She didn't wear any weapons, which struck me as unusual, and she seemed completely unaffected by the concert we were somewhat enjoying. Duncan was right behind her, tapping his hand in time with the music. The song ended, and the next one came up. I did recognize the song and had to smile. That's me. Nice use of a Jimmy Buffett song. If he's still alive, he'd be proud. I held out my hand. Miss... Radcliffe. Katie Radcliffe. Welcome to my world. Mr. Freeze here has told me a few things about you, Mr. Talon. Katie smiled, and I could see she used that smile as a tool in social situations. Just believe the bad things, I said. He's a sinful liar otherwise. Well, I hope he's telling the truth, because we need assistance from men like you, Katie said. We'd be glad to help. What do you need? I asked. Katie smiled again and then pointed across the river at the Sea of Z. I need you to go over there. Somehow, I knew it. Before that happens, tell me about what happened here. Let's get somewhere a little more quiet, Miss Radcliffe said. Days like this, I can't hear myself think. We walked back up the trail and into a large building. It was a visitor center of sorts, although it looked like it had a few people living in it permanently. We sat around a table, and Katie told us a few things about the current situation. Turns out, Charlie was right in his estimations. The kids had known the zombies were coming and decided to make a stand. Being college kids, they realized they had engineers, med students, architects, and other skilled people all right here in front of their faces. So they built their walls and kept an eye out for signs of the virus. It worked, but they realized they had also lost everything else as well. With nothing to go home to, they made this place as safe as possible. They grew crops, tended to livestock, thanks to their agriculture students, and were able to survive. Engineering students figured out how to generate power through the windmills scattered about, and the med students took care of the sick. So, what is the singing for? I asked, impressed with the way things had gone in this part of the country. For my part, I had little to add to what Duncan already had told her. We distract and lure the zombies to come this way, while our scouts cross the river to look for needed supplies. Unfortunately, our scouts have been gone too long. We fear they might be dead, Katie said, her eyes tearing up. You need us to go find them, or find what they were looking for? I asked. You have to understand, Mr. Talon. We've spent the last two years just outsmarting the zombies, not fighting them. If we had to kill one, we usually lured it to a place where we could pin it down and kill it. We're not... Katie paused. Killers? Charlie asked bluntly. Miss Radcliffe gave us a half-smile and nodded. We've done pretty well here considering the alternative across the river. But there are things we need, things we don't have access to. And we're running out of time. A few more minutes of discussion and the four of us were being driven by golf cart back to our trucks. The driver of the cart was surprised we had managed to get so far into their territory before being challenged. 
Charlie suggested they find out who was responsible and replace him or her immediately. We geared up for battle and took the trucks to the Harrison Bridge, guided by our golf cart friend. This was the bridge they used to cross over for supplies and things, and at the moment, thanks to the singing, the way was clear. Katie was insistent we get across before too long, because the singers were only good for about three hours, even with taking shifts. Our target was a cancer care center, right in the heart of Lafayette. Before we crossed the river, Charlie asked a question. What do we get out of this? he wanted to know. Goodwill, and a chance to address the entire population, I said. Charlie thought a minute. That would work. Let's go. We crossed the river, climbing over another one of those smart barricades. The difference was that on the other side of the wall, there was a hole that had been punched through the bridge leading to the water below. A narrow footbridge led from the narrow wall to the other side. No zombie could traverse that ledge and then navigate the ladder without falling through the hole. The footbridge was slick with zombie goop from Z's that had done just that. On the other side, Tommy quickly checked a map Katie had provided us. Head south. We'll follow the river until we reach Ferry Street. It's a straight shot in from there, Tommy said. Charlie grunted. Assuming everything goes perfectly well and the zombies don't know we're here. Well, that happens all the time, right? Duncan asked. I limited my response to a simple eye roll and ran across the bridge. At the first off-ramp, I ran down, keeping an eye out for zombies that might not be able to get to the concert to the south on time. My pick was out, my rifle was secure, my knife was sharp, and my glock was loaded. If I wasn't running into the possibility of thousands of hungry ghouls, I might be enjoying myself. Something must seriously be wrong with me. We could hear the singing across the river, and I had to admit it was effective. Most, if not all, of the zombies were gathered south, and from where we were we could see a kind of fog drifting in and out of the buildings and undulating near the water's edge. Trouble was, it wasn't fog. It was thousands of tightly packed zombies shifting and pushing and grasping at empty air. We stayed close to the buildings and ducked behind cars, keeping ourselves as invisible as possible. All it took was one to see us and raise the alarm, and then the chase would be on. I moved along the sidewalk, keeping a steady pace, trying to stay in the shadows. It wasn't easy with the sun rising higher and taking away the cover we needed. I kept an eye on the zombies to the south, trying like crazy to make sure we could duck away if one turned its head. I could see the street we needed, and it was just a block away. Trouble was, the zombies were just a short block away from that. In between the buildings, there was an alleyway, and I decided to take a chance. Come on, we can try through here, I said. Tommy looked down the dark passage and nodded. Has to be safer than getting close to that horde. I'll take point. Without another thought, he disappeared. Charlie ducked in second, and Duncan followed, with me chasing behind. I dodged around overturned dumpsters and ducked under fire escape ladders that must have assisted a means of escape in the past. I slipped through some sort of slimy mass on the ground and jumped over a box that had legs sticking out of one end. Unless I was mistaken, the other end of the legs was nowhere to be found. At the end of the alley, Tommy checked his bearings. He actually pulled out a compass and double-checked. Duncan started to make fun of him when Tommy stopped him short. "'Sun is nearly overhead, dipshit. Which way is east?' Tommy demanded quietly. Duncan looked up looked back the way we came, and then smiled. He pointed to the end of the alley. That way? Smart ass, Tommy grumbled. Tommy was directionally challenged on the best of days. Duncan, on the other hand, could find north in the middle of a snowstorm at midnight. Looking around the corner, Tommy made his way down another alley. This one must have been where a bad stand was made. Decayed body parts were strewn about, most of them fingers and finger bones. Black streaks were everywhere, decorated with white mold. A couple of dead zombies were lying with their crushed skulls against the walls. Someone put up a fight before they went down. At the corner of the building, Tommy stopped again. He peeked around the corner, then quickly ducked back. Holy shit, he whispered. They're right there. How close is right there? Duncan asked. See for yourself, Tommy said, moving away from the corner. 
Duncan looked around and ducked back. Holy shit, they are right there, Duncan confirmed. We have to move. Secure anything with noise and we'll run one at a time to the next cover. Car, building, alley, whatever. I'll go first, I said. We double-checked our gear, jumping slightly in place to see if anything jingled, jangled, clicked, or clacked. Nothing made a sound, so we braced ourselves to run. I'll wave out from where I am, then wave twice when it's clear, I said. If they see me, I'll just keep running and meet you on the next street north, three blocks down. We'll figure it out from there. Watch yourself, Charlie said. Have to. I need to be back in the capital in five months, I said. Just five? Charlie asked. Maybe. I don't remember. Without another word, I went to the edge of the alley, and with a quick look west, I broke cover and ran in a crouch next to the line of parked cars. Behind me, the air was filled with groans and wheezes. If we could only trap them all in some way and kill them en masse, we'd have an entire city of supplies to use or distribute. We could even repopulate this place if we could manage that level of kills. I ducked in between two cars and used the headrests inside to mask my head as I peeked up from the rear. I didn't see anyone following, and in fact they seemed to be moving in the opposite direction. All the better. I stuck my hand out and waved three times. Tommy came sprinting out and went right past me, slipping in between the cars behind me. I waited to see if anyone saw him, then waved again. Charlie came out and slipped past, silent as a breeze. He made it to the car behind Tommy and ducked back there. I checked the crowd again and saw it was clear for Duncan to go. I waved again, and Duncan left cover. When Duncan was just reaching the cars, the universe decided we needed more excitement in our lives. A seagull, finding something shiny to investigate, landed in the middle of the street with a loud cry. I watched as several heads turned to look at the disturbance of the choir concert, those same heads looked at the seagull, and then at Duncan's retreating back as he ran towards cover. Oh, my God, I said to no one in particular. The groans got suddenly louder, and the ten that saw Duncan turned and walked our way, moaning and grasping. The other zombies saw the shift and followed, not really sure what they were chasing, but certain they wanted whatever they were following. That caused several more to follow, and we were less than fifty feet away from them. I broke cover on the sidewalk, keeping as low as possible. If the only ones who chased us were the ten that saw Duncan, we might survive this. They saw him. Move out. We'll try to keep it isolated, I said, moving past Tommy and Charlie. We were still unseen by the ten following, but that wouldn't last. It didn't. The zombies on the sidewalk turned and saw me leave my cover. They set up a serious groan and began the chase. We were now in a race. Screw it. Run, I said. Charlie was right behind me, and we reached Duncan's hiding spot. Duncan had his backpack off and was fishing out a black disc. It was about eight inches in diameter and about two inches thick. It was completely wrapped in black electrical tape and had a fuse sticking out of it. I wanted to know what it was, but then I didn't want to know either. May as well thin the herd while I have a chance. Duncan placed the sinister-looking disc on the top of the car and lit the fuse. We have about a minute. You might want to run. I didn't need any more incentive than that. Duncan was forever trying to figure out ways to blow stuff up, and his failures were even more spectacular than his successes. We had been around enough of Duncan's experiments to know when to run like hell and put some serious cover between us and his devices. We managed to get three blocks before Duncan called out, Get inside somewhere! Charlie dove into a storefront, crashing open the door and stumbling inside. Tommy was right behind him, and Duncan and I came in together. A second later, there was a blast behind us, and the front window cracked. Three small holes appeared in the window on the far end, and two books sitting on a head-high shelf blew apart in a fury of paper. We all looked at each other. Then the three of us looked at Duncan. Duncan shrugged and smiled. He went over to the door and looked outside. Wow, was all he said. The rest of us took a quick look outside. Down the street, dozens of zombies were scattered about, most with their heads blown apart. Others, taller ones, had huge gaping holes in their necks. Tommy did a quick check and gave his estimate. 
You probably killed two or three hundred with that blast. Nice work, I said. Got any more? Duncan ruefully shook his head. Only have the one with me. Wasn't even sure that would work as well as it did. Charlie clapped him on the shoulder. Well done, little brother. I forgive you for the warehouse incident. Duncan beamed. A while ago, we'd explored a warehouse close to the capital that was supposed to be full of zombies. Duncan set his explosive around the outside, not bothering to check if anyone was looking inside. When he blew it, the concussive air blast threw Charlie across the street and into a very old pile of mulch. He smelled like moldy cedar chips for a month. Let's move. We slowed them down, but there's more where that came from. And in case you hadn't noticed, that blast killed the singing, too, I said. We moved back onto the street, and the surviving horde behind us walked over their fallen comrades, slipping and tripping on parts and pieces of zombies. Another block down, and Tommy, who was leading, called us to a stop. He pointed to a building ahead, and I gave it a look. About fifteen zombies were gathered around a small storefront, beating on the doors and windows. They were packed tightly enough that they couldn't get their hands to give a full swing and break the glass. I think we might have found the other team, I said. We don't have much time, and since quiet is no longer an option, let's get this over with. We all swung our rifles up and, without any other conversation, proceeded to shoot the zombies down. The crack of our rifles echoed through the streets, likely urging the Zs coming up behind us to greater speed. In a minute it was over as Duncan shot down the last Z. Charlie went over to the window and looked in. Well, this might be difficult, he said. I went over and looked in. Three young men were sitting in the back of the store. Two of them were slumped over while the third was alive and staring wildly back at us. I went inside and checked the two boys who were down. I could see bite marks on their hands and wrists, and their eyelids were fluttering. In a minute, they were going to wake up as very hungry zombies. I looked back at Charlie, and he caught my look. Without a word, he pulled out his knife, and with a quick stab in the back of each kid's head, he laid them fully to rest on the ground. The other boy cried out when Charlie performed his surgery. Why did you do that? They weren't going to turn. They were just resting. Son, they were turning. In a minute, they were going to awaken and try to eat you. Since you don't seem to have any weapons, how are you planning on fighting them off? I asked. I knew he was going to go into shock unless he pulled it together quickly. They weren't dead. You killed them for no reason. The boy kept up his blame game, and I didn't have time for it. Get focused here, son. There's a whole mess of zombies coming this way. You need to either come with us or get the hell out of here. We're leaving now. I stood up and followed Charlie out the door. There was a scramble behind us, and the boy crashed out of the building, turned up the street, and ran north. Let's keep moving. We need to buy ourselves as much time as we can. If we get far enough ahead, we might be able to lose that crowd, I said. I got point, Duncan said, taking off down the street. The rest of us groaned slightly. Duncan had the stamina of a marathon runner. He wouldn't stop until we reached our destination, which could be a mile or could be ten miles. Duncan led us down the street, weaving in and out of cars and avoiding some piles of debris. The town center was a mess, with burned-out buildings and smashed glass everywhere. Bones were all over, and there were several dead people still sitting in cars. A bus had three corpses in it, and by the looks of things, they died by dehydration. That wasn't uncommon. People got trapped and had no way out or hope of rescue. They either killed themselves or just wasted away and died. I still think we were very lucky to survive the upheaval the way we did. Suddenly, Duncan slowed down. He went into a small store and rooted around among some boxes. The rest of us didn't argue. We were grateful for the chance to catch our breath. I thought I was in shape, Charlie said. I run a couple of miles a day back home. Do you run it with a full pack and weapons? Tommy asked, stretching his leg. Good point. No, I don't, Charlie said. He looked over Tommy's shoulder. Incoming. Tommy turned around and saw a small zombie had come out of a store. It moved quickly across the street, keeping cars between us and it as it moved closer. 
Suddenly, it ran from in between two vans and raced over the street. A second later, it flipped backwards, shot dead by Tommy's gun. Nice shot, I said. I looked in the store. What the hell is he doing? I have no idea, Charlie said. At that moment, Duncan came out of the store cradling something in his arms. At first, I was worried he had rescued a baby, which would have complicated things immensely. But when I looked at the bundle, I saw it was a small kitten. The poor thing was starved and dehydrated, and Duncan was dipping his finger in his canteen and letting the animal weakly lick the water off. The kitten was black with a white belly and had a white collar of fur halfway around its neck. Its little paws were white and it had a white mustache under its nose. On its forehead was a very faint point of white fur. A cat? Seriously? Charlie said. Jana wanted one, Duncan said. I heard this one calling out. His mother and brothers and sisters were all dead. This one's a survivor. The little kitten was gaining strength with the water he was getting, and I could hear his little motor going as he licked Duncan's fingers. Well, pack him up and let's get moving, I said. I wasn't going to argue with Duncan. Any one or anything we could save from the upheaval was worth keeping in my book. What are you going to name him? Tommy asked as we started moving again. I like Tucker, since he's a little tuxedo cat, Duncan said as he made a place for the kitten in the front pouch of his vest. Can we get moving, please? Charlie said, looking back down the road. We moved further down the street, climbing over cars and basically moving past what was a major battle. Another block up, and I could see why. Two blocks north was a hospital. As we'd experienced in the past, hospitals were usually ground zero for outbreaks. Hopefully, where we were headed, it would not be the same. The road curved slightly to the south and then curved back to the east. As we turned, four zombies were hanging out on a side road. Charlie swung into action, hitting the lead zombie in the head with one of his tomahawks. He left the axe in its skull as it fell, cracking another in the top of its head, dropping it in its tracks. I swung on the third, taking it down while Tommy handled the fourth. The skirmish was over in seconds, and the three of us turned to see Duncan leaning against a car, just taking in the scenery. "'Bunch of hogs,' Duncan said critically. "'You can have the next four, I replied, wiping off my pick. "'Cool.' Two blocks up, and we found what we were looking for. It was a low building with a high, arched roof and a long driveway leading up to the front entrance. There didn't seem to be any damage, but anyone displaying virus symptoms wouldn't be brought to a cancer center. "'Let's get in,' I said. Tommy worked the lock and managed to get it open. He picked up that skill after we had a vicious fight at a small store. We'd have been safe, but we couldn't get in through the back entrance, which happened to be a steel-reinforced door. Inside, Tommy swung back and locked the door. If we were lucky, the Zs didn't see us come in here. If we were really lucky, they would keep going and we might have a straight shot back to the river. If not, well, we'd been here before, metaphorically speaking. The lobby was decorated in a southwest motif. Not what I expected in the middle of farm country, but I guess it was meant to be relaxing, given the stress the patients who came here were experiencing. We blew past the receptionist's desk and made our way towards the stairs. We were looking for storerooms, not equipment. One level down, we found a door that gave us hope we were looking in the right place. It was open, which helped matters greatly. What are we looking for? Charlie asked, opening lockers filled with pills and vials. I started to answer, then stopped mid-sentence. You know, I don't remember exactly, I said stupidly. No worries. Do you at least remember what it started with? Tommy asked, looking at another cabinet full of drugs. Duplo something, I said. I'm sorry, guys. It just left my head. Well, let's grab a little of each, and we can increase our odds of getting it just by chance, Tommy said. He picked up a garbage can and took out the plastic liner. Facing a cabinet, he began pulling out vials and bottles by the twos and threes. Not wanting to waste a good idea, the rest of us found bags and filled them as well, taking what amounted to a near-perfect sampling of what the clinic had to offer. I hoped what we were looking for was in here somewhere. Let's get out of here before the sun starts to set, I said, shouldering my bag of goodies. 
It landed against my back and sounded like a baby rattle. I looked over at my friends and saw they had the same reaction to the sound their own bags made when they hit their backs. Where we were once silent, we were now back up to a mariachi band. Perfect. Could be worse, Duncan said, giving Tucker a small pet on his head. How? By strapping cymbals to our knees and taping harmonicas to our mouths, Tommy asked. We could be stuck in that alley with the zombies knowing we were there. That was true. If you could move, you could survive. I took up as much slack as I could with my bag. If we have another choice, spill it. Otherwise, we do the best we can, I said, heading for the stairs. The rest of my crew followed as we went back to the lobby. Cautiously looking outside, I could see several Zs wandering down the street. The general lack of purpose in their step told me they had lost sight of me and were only just moving because it was the last direction they were headed in. Back way, if we can find it, I whispered, slipping back out of sight. On it, Tommy said. He disappeared into the building, moving towards what should be the back end. I followed at a slower pace, looking around at the center. There was a section dedicated to kids, decorated in a kind of jungle theme. It was sad that it was necessary, but as far as I remembered, cancer didn't care how old you were. At the end of the hall, Tommy waved us towards the back. We moved quickly, rattling as the pills on our backs made their presence known. At the far end of the hall, Tommy led us towards a service entrance which brought us to a loading dock. It was big enough for a small truck or an ambulance, as the case most likely used to be. Through here, there's a small driveway which leads to the next block up. It's covered by grass and brush on both sides, so we should be okay, Tommy said. He looked back. You need to feed that thing now, he said. Duncan shrugged. He's hungry. Besides, if I don't feed him, he'll stay awake and start making noise. You want that? If I feed him, he'll probably go to sleep. That made sense. Feed him. You need anything? I asked. He likes the jerky. I have to chew it a little for him, Duncan said. Charlie snorted. You're both fucking nuts. Five minutes later, we were back outside, making our way carefully back through the brush. At one point, we heard something moving through the grass, but it turned out to be a snake. Tucker had eaten his fill and was contentedly riding in Duncan's pocket. His little eyes were half-closed as he yawned. Suddenly, his ears went forward and his eyes opened wide, a small growl coming out of his throat. Duncan shrugged and we slipped into the brush, keeping ourselves as quiet as possible. Ahead of us, moving across the mouth of the driveway, was a small band of about ten zombies. They moved along, groaning ever so softly, searching for whatever it was that zombies searched for when they weren't in attack mode. After a few minutes, we emerged from the grass. Tommy went over to Duncan. That cat is staying with us. Anyone have an argument with that will answer to me. Tommy rubbed Tucker's head gently and was rewarded with a loud purr. That was the pattern on our way back. Tucker rode high in Duncan's pocket, and he would growl when he heard or smelled zombies. Duncan would warn us, and we would duck for cover, staying out of sight until the zombies passed. We made our way up two blocks and then made our way over to the river. It was eerily quiet without the singing, and I was surprised it was over so quickly. But with the newest member of the team, we were moving better than I could have hoped. We did have a bad moment when Tucker growled and we ducked into a nearby store. The zombies were just about past when Tucker decided he wanted to show his gratitude to Duncan by starting to meow loudly. Duncan was scrambling to quiet the kitten down while the rest of us sweated it out, waiting to see if the thirty zombies wandering past were going to come back and investigate. We made the river in good time, and just as we were starting over the bridge, the zombies saw us. A huge moan went up, and the chase was on. Well, nothing lasts forever. Move, I yelled, bringing up my rifle to cover our retreat. Tommy and Duncan raced for the barrier, while Charlie and I covered the retreat. We had enough time to get to the barricade and step over, but I wanted to make sure we had plenty of time. Drop five on your side. I'll drop five on mine, I told Charlie. Charlie's rifle answered for him as he fired. Seven shots took out five zombies, creating a foot hazard for the ones behind. 
I dropped my five with six shots, something I had to remind Charlie of later. Get over, I said, standing by the walkway. Charlie fairly flew across the narrow walkway, climbing the wall with relative ease. I fired twice more, knocking down a small zombie that was running well ahead of the pack. I slipped my rifle back over my shoulder and made it to the wall, throwing my bag of medicine over the top. A quick climb of the bars and I was on the other side, nodding to my friends that we had survived another run through the zombies. I looked at Tommy. We forgot to leave a message for the army, I said. Tommy laughed. I think we can manage something on this side. Just make sure you draw a cat, Duncan said. Tucker just snuggled in and purred. Madison, Indiana it was the not knowing that was the worst. Was that a breeze or a zombie lying in wait? Were my friends still alive, or were they coming for me as newly made zombies? I had wedged myself in between the walls of an old building, hiding from a small gang of little monsters. They were kidsies, twelve of them, and they were hunting for me. I had found this hiding place in the back of a cleaning closet, and I was able to secure the opening with the same piece of plywood that had let me through. I squeezed through the narrow passage, trying to climb over pipes and ductwork as silently as I could. I was grateful this old building had been built this way, but I also knew I was going to eventually run out of space. A scraping sound behind me turned into a scrabbling as nails clawed at wood. Damn, they must have sniffed me out and were now coming for me. I moved faster and reached the end of the wall. There was a dark space above my head, and, taking a chance, I jumped up and grabbed an old gas pipe, hoping it would stay secure. My luck held as the pipe did, and I pulled myself up to where I could swing my legs up to the dark space. Flicking my light on briefly, it showed a flat space and then another dark opening on the other side. I figured it must be a doorway, so I stepped over and dropped to the other side. Instantly, something slammed into the door frame, and I could hear the clacking of little teeth as they hunted for me. On the edge of the door frame where the wood came together, I could hear the long, drawn-in breaths of something trying to smell me out. I waited for a minute, and I realized they weren't able to pinpoint where I was. All they were trying to do was to spook me into making a mistake and revealing where I was. If I made that mistake, they could hem me in, and I'd have no place to go. I moved along, keeping quiet, listening to the little zombies race around the hallway on the other side of the wall. They were in a frenzy because they had seen me, chased me, and then lost me. For a brief moment, I wondered about where everyone else was, but they had problems of their own. The last I had seen of them, they were racing ahead of a crowd of small zombies that had burst out of a house we thought was clear. I got cut off by a smaller group and wound up taking refuge here. Some refuge. When I went to the third floor to see if I could start picking off zombies from my friends, the little group currently after my ass came flying down the hallway. I pivoted so fast I nearly twisted my knee in half. I did manage to kill one that got too close, but that just seemed to enrage the rest. There was a kid who was probably thirteen that was determined to tear my throat out. At the end of the tunnel, I ran into a solid wall. If it was as thick as the one I was in, there was no getting around it. By the sound of the clicking behind me, that way was closed. Down was out, so that left up. A flash of my light showed space above me, so I found a pipe and started moving up. It was slow going, and the insulation around the pipe made climbing difficult. But I had no place else to go unless I wanted to crack a hole in the wall— of course, every Z chasing me, we would be waiting on the other side with forks and napkins, but at least I'd be out of the wall. When I had climbed high enough, I could see just a ghost of light coming from a small field of squares in front of me. It took me a minute, but I figured out what I was looking at. It was the dropped ceiling in one of the classrooms. I swung my leg over to the top of the wall and lay there quietly, trying to control my breathing. Anyone in the classroom would think the corner of the room had the heaves. I slowly stuck my knife in a corner of the closest ceiling tile and lifted it carefully. It moved up an inch and then fell with a clatter. I winced and waited for a reaction. It wasn't long in coming. 
I heard the patter of little feet, the scraping as desks were run into, and then the sounds moved away. I waited a few minutes, and then I heard the sounds again. This time the feet were slowly moving, searching the corner. I could almost see the little upturned face as it smelled the air, trying to find the scent with which to hunt me down. Right now I smelled like dust and mildew, so good luck with that. I waited some more, and the sounds faded away. I stuck my knife slowly through the ceiling tile and pulled it up again, this time angling the blade so the tile couldn't slide off easily. I put a small piece of broken wall in the crack and pulled my knife out. From where I was, I could see the whole room, and the place was clear. I'd have been happier with a closed door, but an empty room was okay. I'd gotten away from my pursuers, and this room of desks gave me an idea. I pulled the ceiling tile up and out of the way, making sure I was quiet. I checked the room again, then grabbed the corner of the wall. I lowered myself through the opening, hanging there while I decided on my landing. Figuring the floor was the quietest, I dropped with barely a sound, but I still had my pick out at the ready. Nothing came in the door, so I walked over there as quietly as I could. I stopped just short of the doorway and stepped out of the line of sight. I could hear the little feet shuffle by, their bare skin slapping the terrazzo floor. A minute later, I reached the doorway and slowly closed it. I was glad to see the door didn't have a window. I must have built this school back before windows were mandatory on an interior school door. I took some desks and placed them on their sides, stacking them about three high. That made a barrier of about four feet, which was about what I needed. I made a corridor out of the desks, which ended in a two tables stacked on top of each other. I tied the legs of the top table to the legs of the bottom, making the platform that much more stable. I put some earplugs in, figuring this was going to be loud. My hearing was already shot from the countless times I fired my guns without protection, but if I had the time, I was going to do it right. I slid the tables in between the desks and then opened the classroom door. I climbed up quickly and, checking my loads, sat in the center of the table. I started whistling, waiting for the little zombies to hear me. It took a minute, but I presently heard the feet again. The little raggedy heads appeared in the doorway, and they looked around, scanning for the source of the noise. I whistled again, and three heads snapped up, their teeth baring in snarls as they finally saw me. I waved with my left hand as I brought up my gun with my right. I didn't give them a chance to jump. I fired twice, killing two of them. The third ran right at me, not having any place to go, and I shot her dead as well. The shots were like a clarion call to the rest of the zombies. I could hear scrambling and feet thumping upstairs as they came for me. I held my aim at the door, and the next head that looked through never looked at anything else again. There was a general scrum at the door, as several zombies tried to get through at the same time, and the resulting blockage gave me the chance to shoot two more. Another fell through as those went down, and he died as well. I missed a shot as four of them slipped through the door at the same time, scrambling to get closer to the man up high. One of them jumped onto the table below me, but fell as he stood up trying to grab me. I shot him in the head for his trouble, then focused on the other two who jumped up. One jumped high, cracked his head on the side of the table, and fell to the floor, killed by his own actions. Another climbed up, and when she screeched at me from the edge of my perch, I put a bullet through her mouth. A second one got a leg over the top, but fell off when I shot him. After that, it was quiet. I knew there were at least two more out there, but if they were lying in wait, they were even more evolved than I gave them credit for. I switched magazines on my Glock, swapping the depleted one for a fully loaded one. I'd replace the spent rounds later when I had the chance. I climbed down, taking care not to slip in anything funky. Zombie gunk was just as infectious as a bite, and keeping it off your clothes was just as important as keeping it off your skin. If you had some on your shirt and then pulled your shirt over your head, you could get that shit in your eyes, and then you're done. We always tried to make sure we wore button-up shirts just so nothing went over our heads. I crossed the room, keeping my gun trained on the door. I knew the hallway extended to my right, and the corner of the hall was on my left. 
There was a stairwell around here somewhere, so there were several places for ambush. I hadn't killed that one teen, so I knew she was still out there somewhere. I looked to the right, then stepped out, pointing my gun to the left. I didn't see anything, but that meant nothing. I moved slowly forward, scanning the dark hallways for threats. I killed several of the zombies, but I didn't think I had killed them all. I glanced behind me and caught a glimpse of a small ghoul launching itself through the air. I dropped flat to the ground, and the little biter sailed over where I was just standing. She hit the ground and rolled, twisting around to come back. I fired from the floor, hitting her with at least three of the five shots I threw her way. I didn't kill her. I just bought myself a second to sit up and aim, sending my sixth shot through the bridge of her nose. I let the breath out that I was holding, and looking back down the dark hallway, I saw several little glowing orbs dancing back and forth. They hovered about head high and would be mesmerizing if they weren't attached to such deadly monsters. Damn, I said to no one in particular. I briefly thought about going back to my little perch, but these guys could reach up and cause some serious trouble. My best bet was to keep moving and get the hell out of here. I holstered my Glock and pulled my carbine off my back. I'd avoided using the rifle so far, but since I'd already killed with the pistol, the noise of the rifle wasn't going to attract any more zombies than were already on the way. I pulled the flap off the spare magazines I had in my vest and headed towards the stairs. I'd eliminated the worst of the threat. It was time to find out what happened to my friends. As I reached the stairwell, a fat zombie waddled out towards me. She was a disgusting sight, with big chunks of fat ripped off her arms and sides. Her pig-like eyes stared at me through a sagging, fat face, and her lank, blonde curls were caked with filth. She raised a fat arm in my direction and opened her small mouth, groaning with hunger. "'Not on your best day, Debbie,' I said, kicking her in the chest and sending her down the stairs. I don't know why I called her Debbie. I just guessed that might have been her name. Debbie rolled down the stairs, leaving a trail of black goo whenever her face smacked a stair. She tried to stop herself and just managed to wedge her head in between the bars of the banister that followed the stairs. She pulled and twisted, getting herself even more stuck. I fired a shot as I passed by, adding another hole to her nasty head. She slumped and lay there, a mass of putrid flesh. Debbie does dead, I chuckled to myself as I reached the next level down. Debbie's dead head stared back at me, her mouth open and her tongue out. Not her best look, I was sure of that. At the first floor, there was another small group of zombies, but they fell quickly to the red dot sight on the top of my rifle. I walked down the hallway, careful around the open doors of the classrooms. At the center of the hall was a huge open space with a large stairwell leading down to the street. An enormous chandelier hung over the stairwell and arched plaster columns joined at the ceiling. In another time, this building would be a fantastic place for events and activities. Not anymore. I moved down the stairs and towards the front door. There was a kind of patio in front of the building with stairs leading off in either direction. A low wall was directly in front of the building, and I crept out to it to check out the street. I didn't see anything, so I used the opportunity to get a drink and replenish my magazines. I was going to have to get more 9mm ammo in my backpack when I got back to the truck. A banging sound behind me reminded me that re-entering the building wasn't going to be a possibility. Three zombies spread themselves over the glass around the door, but the reinforced glass wasn't going to let them through. As I reloaded, a new sound came to my ears. At first I wasn't sure what it was, but as it got louder, I was able to identify it. It was the sound of running feet, followed by the sound of a lot of running feet. There was another sound in there, which was much harder to identify. It was a high-pitched sort of wail, starting and stopping at regular intervals. I placed my rifle on the wall and put the extra magazines where I could reach them. I waited until I could see what was happening, as I didn't want to disrupt the chaos headed my way. Around the corner came Tommy and Duncan. They were running flat out, followed closely by Charlie. 
Behind them, a crowd of about fifty young zombies raced to catch up, grabbing at the air and snapping their teeth. In Duncan's pocket, Tucker stuck his head out and he was screeching in a constant stream. I had to suppress a laugh. It wasn't funny, but it was. I waited until my friends passed by, and then I cut loose on the crowd. From my vantage point, I was shooting about head level from the wall. I didn't really aim, I just sent rounds into the masses. Several dropped, but not enough. I was hoping I would be able to take a little time to aim, but the rifle fire prompted the Zs to change course, and suddenly they were coming right at me. I fired again and again, killing the zombies in front and behind. I tried to thin the herd before they reached me, because I wasn't going to have a chance after that. The crowd was halfway to me and splitting up, getting ready to hit me from both sides. Down! Charlie yelled, and I didn't need to be told twice. I ducked behind the wall, and dozens of rounds ripped through the air. The smack of bullets hitting flesh was loud, as was the sound of flesh hitting concrete. Move! came another yell, and I took the most direct route. I leapt over the wall and raced away from the converging zombies. There was about twenty of them left, and if they were in a frenzy before, they were in a positive lather right now. I ran, sliding to a stop in front of my friends. Nice to see you guys are alive, I said, exchanging magazines and taking aim at a young man on the left. Back at you, Tommy said. Nice to see your sense of timing is still pretty good. Talk later. Kill now, Charlie said, firing. The crowd thinned as they advanced, and Duncan killed the last one nearly at our feet. I clapped him on the shoulder and gave Tucker a scratch between the ears, getting a heavy purr in return. Thought we lost you, Tommy said, stepping away from the carnage. We got back into the street and headed west, working our way towards the downtown area and the river. We couldn't find an easy path into this town, so we used the river that bisected it and floated in. Our boat was in the middle of the town, and we had no other way to get out. Tough place, I said, jogging alongside Charlie. Tell me about it, he replied. Thought you bought it back there when we got separated. Didn't know what the hell I was going to tell Jake and Sarah. Almost did, I said. I tried to find some high ground to help you guys out, except a crowd of zombie kids chased me all over that building. That sounds about as much fun as we had, Tommy said. We got away from the main horde, only to wake up the faster one when Jackass up there kicked a door in that had been nailed shut. Hey, Duncan complained. How was I supposed to know? Maybe when a piece of plywood is hammered into place in a new building, you might think it wasn't part of the original design, Tommy said. Enough. Let's get out of here. Did you at least get a message out? I asked. Tommy nodded. This place should be okay to salvage as long as they come by the river. We made it down a hill, going under a railroad viaduct. We left our boat on the other side of the river, next to what used to be a community college. I was surprised when we landed that both sides of the town were overrun, but there was nothing to be done when the disease hit both sides at the same time. Right side, Duncan yelled, whipping out his melee weapon. I swung my pick around, and Charlie flipped his tomahawks over. Tommy unlimbered his mace, and we went to work. Ten zombies stumbled out of an alley where it looked like they had managed to find something to kill. Their fingers and hands were covered in bright blood, and their mouths were dripping with gore. I caught a glimpse of what they had killed, and I was suddenly furious. I slammed my pick into the head of one, and rotating my feet, I ripped the metal out of one head and buried it in another. A third tried to reach for me, but I got my pick's handle in between us. Using my forward momentum, I forced the Z back, ramming it into the steel eye beam Pushing my handle up, I rammed the zombie's head into the corner of the steel, cracking the skull and killing it. The rest of the team finished the remaining Zs, and I went over to the alley. Curled up in obvious agony was a small boy. He had been torn apart by the crowd we just killed. Bite marks and torn flesh covered his arms and legs, and great holes had been torn in his sides. He wasn't very old, maybe ten or twelve, but he didn't deserve to die like this. No one did. I sighed and brought my pick down, spiking the top of his head. If nothing else, he wouldn't come back to the world that had killed him so cruelly.
I turned and saw the rest of the team watching me, and Charlie shook his head. Tough luck. Pretty recent kill, though, judging by the blood, he said. What's in the sack? Duncan asked. I lifted the small satchel, and several cans fell out. Looks like he was foraging. I swept the cans back up into the sack and handed it to Duncan. We need to get going, Tommy said. There's a lot more of them out there, and we don't have the firepower to take it apart. I nodded. There was something wrong about this, but I didn't have time to worry about it. Let's get out of here. We've done enough, and the army will know what they're walking into, I said. We found our boat and headed back upriver, paddling carefully through the shallows. Charlie and I propelled the boat while Duncan and Tommy kept an eye on the shore. A mile upriver, we hit the banks, and Tommy pulled the boat up. Duncan scouted ahead, and right when Charlie and I got onto solid ground, we heard Duncan call out, Hey! Back off! The three of us scrambled up the bank to find Duncan in the middle of a standoff. Three men were pointing their guns at Duncan, and Duncan, for his part, was pointing two guns back. Charlie, Tommy, and I threw down on the men, increasing the amount of firepower. Tommy held two guns like Duncan, but I kept myself to the one. Let's all take it easy right now, I said. They were trying to get into our trucks. They'd already taken the stuff out of the back, Duncan said. The man in the middle spoke up. Didn't know it belonged to anyone, he said, raising his hand and pointing his rifle at the ground. He hissed at his companions, and they lowered their guns as well. Who are you? Duncan asked. He hadn't lowered his guns yet, since the men still had their hands around the stocks with fingers close to triggers. Just scouts for the community a few miles back. We make runs to the town all the time. Try to kill a few zombies every time. Eventually we'll get them all. Was that your fire we heard? The middleman asked. It was, I said. We're scouts ourselves, checking the territory for the new United States Army that will be sweeping through this area in a couple of days. If you want to join, just stay where you are. If not, well, I haven't reinstated the draft yet. You reinstated? Who are you? The man on the right spoke up. He had a mean look about him, and I really didn't care for him. No one you need to worry about if all you're doing is trying to survive. Mind your own and don't do anything that might be against the law, I said. The man on the left snorted. Ain't no laws, not no more, he said derisively. Charlie stepped forward. Yes, there are. Cross a line you shouldn't and you'll pay for it. Keep it simple. If you know it's wrong, don't do it. Charlie holstered his weapon and crossed his arms. Well, we'll be going now. Sorry to bother your stuff the middleman said. Not yet, I said. The polite thing to do would be to help put back the stuff you took out. The men didn't like that, but I wasn't going to be polite anymore. They were going to steal, obviously, and lied about it. Obviously. When we were done, I asked a question. Any of you know a boy, about ten years old, brown hair, wearing a blue hoodie? Sounds like one of ours. Denise's boy, I think. Why? the middleman asked. He must have been foraging. He was killed by zombies. For this, Duncan said, handing over the small sack of cans. Oh, hell. Left man dropped his head and reached out for the sack. It clinked a little when he took it. A sad tune for the lost boy. Why was he out alone? Tommy asked. He clearly had no business being in that town. Whoever sent him in there killed him as surely as did those zombies. No one sent him, except maybe his ma. Our community been on some hard times. We've exhausted the food stores hereabouts and had to start making trips to town, Middleman said. We were on our way there when we came on your trucks. Thought we hit the mother load. Well, the army's coming. I'm sure they'll help you. Tell them John Talon said to help you out. And they ask you for a code? Tell them 60462. Sounds like a zip code, right man said. We'll see you later, I said, getting into the truck. Charlie followed, and we drove south. Thoughts? Charlie asked as we looked for a place to spend the night. Those idiots probably sent that boy in there to find food for them. Probably told him it was a test to become a man or some other stupid shit like that, I said irritably. 
That why you gave them the wrong code? Charlie asked. Damn right. Northeast Louisville, Kentucky. We drove up a very scenic road which would take us around the town of Louisville. There was no point in trying to work our way through any more than we had. It was futile to try and fight the zombies more than we already did. I did notice that there was a lot of zombie activity to the south, which made me curious about the current state of the population. I had been through Kentucky on a number of occasions. It was a state covered in history, kudzu vines, and riflemen. It was a source of pride for the locals to be able to shoot well, and I had a feeling in Kentucky and Tennessee we were going to see a lot more survivors than zombies. That would work well with my overall strategy that I was formulating in my head. Instead of one army, why not build three? Covered Bridge Road was a very nice drive, and in the fall I'm sure it would have been lovely. Right now, it was a road we happened to be on looking for a place to hole up. Push came to shove, we could sleep in the truck, but my back wasn't going to forgive me for another night of that. Charlie had to do some interesting driving when we came close to 71. Cars choked the highway, and there were long lines of vehicles that had made it off the main road, only to find death waiting for them at the other end of the off-ramp. Past the highway, there was a gas station. Charlie pulled over and stopped to look around. A big gas tanker truck was parked on the side, and Tommy went over there to try his luck. Charlie and I got out to stretch, and I took this opportunity to burn off any virus residue from my pick and my knife. That is a good idea, Charlie said, flaming his tomahawks as well. Duncan did the same, and I got a better look at what he was using as a melee weapon these days. It was an interesting combination of several weapons— Attached to a three-foot pole was a small axe head with a long beard to it. On the other side of the axe was a square hammer head that Duncan had beveled the edges on, making it more into a kind of pyramid with a flat top. The other side of the staff held a small metal cap that ended in a conical point. With a good swing, Duncan could put the head of that axe through the roof of a car. Tommy came over to us with a big grin on his face. Gentlemen... Luck has smiled. That tanker is nearly half full. We can top off the trucks, fill the spare cans, and fill more if we can find them, he said. Fantastic. Let's get the trucks closer, I said. We fired up the trucks and parked them near the tanker. Pulling out our siphon hoses, we went to work, filling up the first truck, then the second. We were just finishing up the last spare can when there was a rustling in the woods behind us. We all stopped and went over to the edge of the lot to take a look. Down in the embankment, the trees began in earnest, and in those trees there was a lot of movement and thrashing about. I followed the treetops back to the north, and the math added up. Guys, where do you think all of the motorists who were trapped on the highway in our immediate vicinity ended up? I asked. Duncan looked around. Offhand, I'd say they were in the trees, but that doesn't account for them, he said, pointing backwards. Jesus, Charlie yelled. Get up on the truck. We didn't have to be told twice. On the road leading into the gas station was about a hundred zombies all headed our way. They were your old school zombie type, graying with interesting bits of green mixed in for that extra special putrid factor. Z's were spilling out of the convenience store as well, way too many for comfort. I followed Tommy and Duncan to the rear of the truck, climbing up the ladder to the roof. Charlie came up last, and after jumping over Duncan, settled down in the middle of the truck with the rest of us. Duncan whipped out his toolkit and managed to disconnect the ladder from the truck, sending it clattering to the pavement. In about three minutes, we were completely surrounded. A sea of arms and mouths lay beneath us, and in all honesty, I had no idea what we were going to do. My pick handle was of a decent length, shorter than Duncan's weapon, and neither of us could reach the zombies without putting ourselves in danger. With the four of us on top of the truck, it was a little crowded. We stood there, looking down at the zombies. Duncan reached out with his long mace and almost had it grabbed out of his hands. What do you want to do? Tommy asked. Not sure yet. We can't get off and can't reach the zombies. Getting to the trucks is not an option, and that's where we left our rifles and ammo, I said. 
Well, we can't stay here, Charlie said. If you have a method for sprouting wings and flying, I'd love to hear it, Tommy said. I might have something, Duncan started to say, reaching for his pack. No, we all yelled in unison. Duncan pulled his hand out of his pack. Jeez, what's the problem? Tommy patted Duncan on the shoulder. Please wait until we're not all standing on top of a tank of flammable liquid before creating an explosion nearby. Oh, right. Duncan put away whatever he was holding. Well, we can try something, I said. I walked over to the truck and stepped over the open space to the top of the cab. The roof buckled a bit, but it held. I carefully eased myself down to the hood and watched as dozens of hands reached up for me. There was a surge in my direction, as the zombies saw I was much closer than the three on the trailer. Kneeling on the hood, I used the flat end of my pick to cave in the skull of a nearby zombie. He slipped down, and immediately another took his place. I cracked his skull, too, adding to the pile. I cracked skulls for a good twenty minutes before my arms got tired, and the pile of dead zombies allowed the ones on that side to stand a little taller as they pulped their dead comrades beneath their feet. It helped to put them closer in reach, but then it didn't help because it put them closer in reach. I stood up and stretched my shoulders, climbing back up to the top of the trailer. Charlie and Duncan were lying down, taking in the sun, while Tommy was on his stomach, trying to look over the back of the truck without being seen. Next, I shouted, startling the two sunbathers. Charlie got up and I handed him my pick, it being longer than the handles of his hawks. He jumped over to the cab and down onto the hood. He kneeled and worked the other side of the truck, killing and stacking them up. At the end of another twenty minutes, Charlie had had enough. He killed as many as I did, but still there was a good number of them milling about, groaning and reaching. "'Where's out your shoulders?' Charlie said, handing my pick back to me. "'Can't use anything but your arms.' "'Yeah.' I looked back at Tommy, who was still laying on the edge of the trailer. He waved me forward with a little flick of his fingers, and I decided to crawl down there. I noticed when I got low, the zombies were out of sight and couldn't see me. I reached his feet and tapped his foot. What's up? I asked. Got your pick? Tommy asked. Sure. Follow me. Tommy suddenly slipped off the back of the trailer. Jesus! I scrambled forward and followed, trusting that Tommy wouldn't just leap to his death or ask me to do the same. That being said, timing was everything, and if I delayed, Z's would fill the gap. I heard Charlie shout behind me, but I was already gone, grabbing the top rung of the ladder that was left behind when we removed the rest of it. I swung down and raced away, chasing Tommy's back and dodging three sets of zombie hands that reached for me. We ran towards the road, trailing a horde of ghouls. I figured out Tommy's strategy when I hit the ground, figuring he was going to draw off as many of the Z's as possible without dying. The first part made sense and seemed possible. The second part was still up for debate. We ran to the other side of the road and stopped to catch our breath. It wasn't that we weren't in shape, but we were going to need to oxygenate for the next round of battle. Ready? Tommy asked, taking a practice swing with his weapon to loosen up his shoulders and arms. His weapon was pretty basic. It was a long-handled axe, but he had added a spike to the other end to give it killing ability when the Zs were on the ground. Ready as I'll ever be, I said. Remind me why we left the army? Because you suck as a general, Tommy said. Gee, thanks. But you're a positive genius for scouting and small units, Tommy added. Thanks. I still don't like you. Quit being a girl and kill something, would you? I swung hard at a quick-moving kid, batting him to the ground with a cracked head. Tommy thumped several with his mace, beating the zombies down. I kicked another to make him fall at the feet of a couple others, and killed all three with quick strikes with the pointed end of my pick. You two have any better plan than that? Charlie called from the gas truck. Shut up, or I'll use my rifle, I called back, killing another. Charlie must have suddenly realized he was standing on a bomb, and any accidental bullets might send him and Duncan to the moon. 
He quieted down and sat back to watch the show. I settled into something of a cadence, swinging my pick and slamming it into zombie skulls. Every time I killed one, another took its place. Every time I killed one, I took a small step back. The zombies spread out a little, and that was going to become a problem. If they got behind me or on the side, it was over. Tommy was swinging like I was, methodical and precise. Every downswing killed another zombie, and the swing swept up to another downswing and another dead zombie. Like me, Tommy kept stepping back. We struck and struck again, piling up the dead like chopped wood. Enough of these bastards, Tommy said, crunching a skull. Would be nice if a couple of lazy bastards would join in, I said, backhanding a swing into the head of an older short woman with white hair. Her eyes were bulging out of her head, and she was actually more frightening because of it. After she fell, I realized I had nothing to fear from her since she didn't have any teeth. I heard a sound over the groans of the zombies, and I glanced over at Tommy. He heard it too. It was a metallic sound, almost like very soft wind chimes. I had heard it many times before, and every time it was a welcome sound. Tommy and I redoubled our efforts, swinging hard and killing zombies. We were running out of gas, though, and would have to run again if it came to it. However, the Z suddenly ran out. I killed a middle-aged man in a shredded suit. Then I was looking across a sea of bodies at Charlie and Duncan. The chiming I had heard was Charlie's tomahawks cracking into skulls. He and Duncan had climbed down when the herd thinned sufficiently and started the killing on their side. Tommy and I made our way over to our friends. I held up my pick in salute, and Charlie smacked the metal with one of his hawks, making a loud metallic ringing. Over the hills we heard a chorus of groans in reply. We decided we had seen enough of the underside of Louisville. Taylorville Lake State Park, Kentucky the drive south was quiet, and while Charlie drove, I looked over the maps. Part of me was okay with what we were doing, but the other part wasn't sure it was the correct strategy. We should have been more methodical in cleaning out the zombies, which was driving my plan to split the army and start working to seriously clear the areas. While we were doing a good thing, I felt like we were missing a good part of the country, leaving it wide open to outbreaks and attacks. If I were honest with myself, I had to realize we couldn't do it all on our own, that people had to decide for themselves what kind of life they wanted. Huddling in a building waiting for the zombies to move on was life, but not living. Not by a long shot. How far behind do you think the army is? I asked Charlie. Not really sure. Figured they would be two, maybe three days, depending on what they encountered. Why? Charlie asked. I tossed my idea over at Charlie, and he mulled it over for a bit. After a minute, he grudgingly nodded. I have to say, it's not a bad idea. Likely more efficient than what we're doing so far. Can I modify it a bit? Charlie asked. Go for it. What if, instead of having three equal parts, have them split into half, then halves on of the halves, so you have a main group focused on the big areas, then the other two, while still large, have greater mobility and are able to clear larger areas without being outnumbered, Charlie said. That was another good idea. I told Charlie that, and he smiled like a kid who gave the teacher the right answer. The sun was swinging low in the sky when we decided to call it an evening. I told Charlie we should find a place to hang out for a few days and meet up with the army when they crossed our path. He heartily agreed, and we settled on finding a place where we could hunt and fish. I checked the map and saw we were on a straight course to a forest preserve. Charlie heard that and pressed the gas down a little further. Just as the sun was setting, we arrived at the forest preserve. The last three years had seen the forest reclaim much of what it had given up in terms of campsites and picnic areas, but the roads were surprisingly clear of debris and grass. We drove in, following the signs to the lodge. High trees reaching out from hills darkened our path, and I kept an eye out for small, glowing lights. Two left turns and a right found us in the overly large parking lot of a genuine log-built lodge. It was remarkable how much it resembled starved rock. 
and must not have been the only one who thought so, since Charlie commented on the resemblance as well. Wow, deja vu, he said, backing the truck up to the stairs that led from the parking lot to the back of the lodge. Seriously. I could see several small cabins branching out from the main area, and in the center of the parking lot was a huge water tower. A winding stair led up to a platform about fifty feet in the air, presumably to allow visitors a view of the hills and valleys surrounding the lodge. Tommy and Duncan backed their truck up as well, and we stretched a bit before drawing duties. Tommy and Charlie would check out the cabins in the tower, while Duncan and I scouted the main lodge and surrounding area. We circled the building, keeping an eye on the surrounding trees. I could hear some small animals moving about, checking out the intruders, so I didn't think there were any Zs in the area. At the front door, Duncan tried the easy way, which didn't work, so he tapped a small hole in the glass. Using a small stick that had a fork in it, he fashioned a hook and pulled the safety bar towards the door, opening it. I was about to step in, but Duncan held up a hand. Kittens first. Tucker poked his head out of Duncan's pocket, and with a little petting allowed himself to be brought out and held. He purred his head off, but his ears and eyes were all about the new area he was about to go into. I could see his tiny nose working the air, and when he closed his eyes and rubbed Duncan's hand, I knew the immediate area was clear. That little guy was better than a dog. Inside the lodge was dark, and we had to pull out our flashlights— the main room was just a sitting area with dusty couches and benches. A small souvenir shop was next to the door, but I couldn't see any use for Native American replica junk this trip. There were some nice-looking lodestones, but they served no purpose either. A balcony ran around the room, and I could see small tables and chairs placed up there. The view was pretty good, so people could enjoy themselves in days gone by. We passed the main reservation desk and walked through a double door into a bar. The serving area was a circle, allowing visitors to find a drink no matter where they sat in the room. Duncan let Tucker work his magic again, and this time his ears focused on the bar. I took a small bowl off a table and threw it over the polished surface. It clattered loudly, and we waited for a moment. We knew nothing was behind us, so anything else was in front. Nothing happened, and I wondered if Tucker was losing his touch. I went over to the bar and looked down. Lying on the floor was a mostly dead zombie. I say mostly because while his head still twitched and his teeth still snapped, the rest of him was immobile due to the broken bottle sticking out of the front of his neck. Apparently the dead bartender slipped on the slick floor and fell on a bottle which neatly severed his spine as it made its way through his neck. He still wore the uniform of the lodge with a white shirt, green bow tie, and green apron. Cat's got skills, I said, stepping around the bar and making my way to the zombie. The dead eyes followed me and the mouth opened and closed. I imagine the dead don't feel frustrated, but that's all I could sense from this one. One downward swing with my pick ended this barkeep's shift in a hurry. The bar was mostly empty, but I found a single unopened bottle of bourbon which I put in my pack. Duncan raised an eyebrow but nodded when I told him what it was. Liquor was almost better than hard currency in some places. There was a small eating area just to the right of the bar, but it was closed off and Tucker wasn't interested. To the left was a set of French doors, and we decided to go that way. I opened the door and flashed my light in. Something dark whisked out of sight at the back of the room, and I spent a good amount of time playing my light over the area. A large fireplace was back there and a couple of windows on either side. What I saw was something dark that was in front of the left window, and I saw it move across the right one. Did you see that? I asked Duncan quietly. The dark human-shaped form that went across the room from left to right, Duncan asked. Yeah, I whispered. Nope, didn't see a thing, Duncan said. I turned to him, and I saw Tucker looking out of his pocket. The cat's ears were flat back, and his eyes were huge. He was making a small sound in the back of his throat, and all of a sudden the hair on the back of my neck was standing up. Something was in this room, and I had a feeling our weapons weren't going to be of any use at all. There, Duncan whispered. He moved his light up and shined it across the room. 
We didn't see anything until he put the light down. At a dark opening, there was a darker shape standing in the corner. There was a loud clatter, startling both of us. Ow, ow, shoot, that hurts. Duncan was gingerly pulling out his vest, sticking a hand underneath and rubbing his chest. What the hell? I asked, bringing my gun up. Something hit you? No, Tucker is scared. He just went full pointy with all of his feet. No place to go but back into my chest. Duncan made a face, and I nearly hit him myself. Come on, let's see where this goes. I walked forward and kept my eyes open. I shined my light around, hoping not to see any more of what I thought was in here. Duncan was right behind me, and I'd be lying if I said the hair on my neck and arms wasn't standing straight up. At the end of the small hallway, we could see more clearly what the room was. At some point, this must have been some kind of restaurant, and this was the main eating area. Off to our left was a truly pitch-black hallway with a set of double doors leading into what I assumed was the kitchen area. I walked carefully around the tables, trying not to disturb anything more than I already had. No more what? Duncan asked. What? No more what? Duncan asked again. What are you talking about? I asked, moving over to the very dark hallway. Didn't you just say no more? Not me, I said. When did you hear this? Just now, Duncan stopped. Quit messing around. I distinctly heard you say no more. I looked back at him. Wasn't me. Great. Just great, Duncan said, mostly to himself. Now I'm hearing things. Probably not, I said. Likely whoever died in here or around here is lurking, and they just made a comment about your jokes. Have I ever told you you're funny? Duncan asked. No. Ever wonder why? Not particularly. Is that a door? I asked, swinging my light down the dark hallway. Suddenly the air became ice cold, and something brushed past me. I felt a distinct hand on my arm, and then it was gone. I thought for sure I had heard the sound of a baby crying, but distant like it was on the other side of a wall. Did you hear something? I asked Duncan. All right, that's not cool, Duncan replied petulantly. I'm serious, I said. Did you hear something? Apart from the no more again and the sound of a baby crying far away? Nope, not a damn thing. Are we leaving any time soon? Duncan asked. He was trying to calm down a very poofy and frightened Tucker. Nothing to worry about, I said. Whoever was here has gone someplace else. Well, that's a relief. So what about the people who seem to be left behind? I think the shadow and the cold air are what's left of them. Like I said, such a relief. We walked down the hallway, passing by the kitchen doors. Tucker seemed to have calmed down, and we were moving quietly past some banquet rooms. The air was stale, and the old table seemed forgotten by time. Family reunions from a long time ago that would never happen again made the place seem very lonely. At the end of the dark hallway, there was a small closet. Duncan looked inside, and he tapped me on the arm. Well, I think I know where the ghosts came from, he said. I looked inside, and tucked beside the extra chairs and tables was a small corpse. She was hiding in the chairs and was holding a small bundle. A closer look showed me that the small bundle was another corpse, a small baby. Both of the bodies did not look to be harmed in any way. They must have hidden here away from zombies in the area and died of dehydration. Not a pleasant way to go, but when you feared to move, you didn't have much choice. If I had to guess, I'd say the girl was the baby's sister, and she ran here, not knowing what else to do. How could a ten- or twelve-year-old know what to do when the world ended? If she had run to the woods, she might have had a chance. But then what would a kid do? Run toward where they felt safe, whether or not it was the smart thing to do at the time. Come on, Duncan. Let's go outside and see if we can find Tommy and Charlie. And then let's see if we can find a place to bury these two together, I said. Well, let's hope those are the last we find around here, Duncan said. If you really believe that, then we need to have a talk, I said. I opened the back door and was pleasantly surprised to be looking at the back of the trucks. 
Our little side trip took a lot longer than I thought, and the sun was dipping below the tree line on the far side of the horizon. Charlie and Tommy were just coming back to the trucks, and I walked down the stairs behind Duncan, who was holding a very wide-eyed kitten. I could see Tucker's little nose bouncing as he took in all the smells of the new area. How's the lodge? Charlie asked. He sprayed one of his tomahawks with some kerosene and burned the anillo right off of it. Haunted as hell, Duncan said, stopping at a truck to put Tucker away. Tommy looked at me. Seriously? Serious as a heart attack, I said. Shadows, cold air, disembodied voices, and some poltergeist activity. All the fun stuff. Damn. Wonder why, Tommy asked. Small girl hid with her baby brother or sister. Probably got too scared to move and dehydrated right there, I said, pulling out a small shovel from the back of the truck. I'll go dig a grave if you two want to go get them. There's some tablecloths right where they are so you can wrap them up pretty easily. Charlie shrugged. Whatever. Probably nothing up there. Tommy went with him. Never saw a ghost before, he said. You are going to now, trust me, Charlie said. I went over to the side of the parking lot and found a good space for a grave. I was digging for about a half hour, with the sky getting darker all the time. When I finished, I looked over at Duncan, who shrugged and looked back up at the lodge. Five minutes later, Charlie came out carrying a small body wrapped in a tablecloth. Tommy carried a much smaller bundle wrapped the same way. They walked over to me, and their faces were stony. Charlie placed the girl in the grave without a sound and walked over to the truck. Tommy placed the little baby in the girl's arms, and together we covered them with earth. I dislodged a couple of flagstones that were at the edge of the walking path that ran parallel to the parking lot and placed them over the grave as a kind of marker. What took you guys so long? I asked. Tommy took a deep breath. Charlie wanted to explore, so we went through the lodge. On our way back, the air got freezing, and we kept hearing a baby crying. While we were looking for it, Charlie suddenly points at the balcony and says, Don't move! What was it? I was curious to see if they saw the shadows, too. It was a little girl holding a baby, and she was trying to shush it from crying, Tommy said. What? I said, not really believing it. Yeah, she vanished an instant later, Tommy said. I was taken aback. Well, I'll be damned. Yep, Tommy agreed. Charlie just saw his first genuine ghost. Want to spend the night in there? I asked. Fuck no, Tommy said. Me either. Let's get up on the platform and camp up there. I figure we'll be here for a couple of days, I said, walking back to the truck. I always like Kentucky. We spent three days at the lodge in Kentucky before we could see the first signs of the army heading our way. Charlie was in his element and hunted every day. We ate well on venison, wild turkey, and bass. We cleared out as much as we wanted from the lodge, bringing out cooking gear, usable supplies, and an amazing cache of various wines. Normally I just leave that sort of thing, but I figured the army could use it to take a break. We camped up on the platform and were well protected from the rain. The platform was at least fifty feet across, and the huge water tank above us spread out like a great canopy. Duncan wondered if there was a way to get the water out, as he wanted a shower, but the rest of us tackled him before he could shoot a hole in the bottom of the tank. In the middle of the fourth day, scouts began arriving in the woods. We could hear them moving around, and we could see them through the trees. They were in small cars, modified to have a higher wheelbase so they could go over land if they had to. The interiors were customized, with the rear seats taken out and a hatch built into the floor. The windows were reinforced, and they had extra supplies packed inside. If they had to, they could stay inside those vehicles for up to a week. The only problem with the vehicles was we only had six of them. The man who made the customizations died of a heart attack after the sixth one. Two of the scout vehicles pulled into the parking lot. They saw our trucks and drove over to them. The scouts climbed out of the cars and stretched, something they always did. They looked over the supply piles and started up the stairs to the lodge when Charlie hailed them from the platform. 
Here, he yelled. The two scouts ducked and reached for weapons before they looked up and saw us waving from the platform. They walked over to the base of the tower. Charlie and I descended the circular stairway that made a complete circle of the six supports that held up the huge tank. Sir, good to see you, sir, the first scout said and saluted. She was a teenager with long dark hair that she wore in a single braid. Her companion, an older woman of about thirty-five, saluted as well. You too, Mel. I returned the salutes and looked over at the older woman. Good trip so far, Beth, I asked. Except for the choir we had to listen to while we cleaned up Lafayette. Can't complain, sir. Beth looked up. Nice place you have here. Something wrong with the lodge. Haunted. Charlie said. Beth's eyes got wide. That's so. Who? Little girl and her infant brother. She'll spook you any time you go in there. This lunatic found her in the dark. Charlie jerked a thumb in my direction. I held up a hand to defend myself. I had no idea she was in there. Duncan and I found her and her brother in a closet. Dead from dehydration. She just doesn't realize she's dead. Beth shivered. I hate when that happens. Remember the one in Cicero who seemed to follow us? I shook my head. That was creepy. That book that flew across the room? Beth nodded vigorously. Oh my god, yes. She turned to Mel. John, Sarah, and a couple of us were clearing this old house in Cicero. Nothing major, just an old house. But the second we went upstairs, the place went nuts. The clock started chiming, chairs fell over. It was crazy. We were standing in the library upstairs when a book rose from a table and floated across the room, slowly landing in a chair. Mel's eyes were big. What did you do? Beth nodded in my direction. John got mad and said, Knock it off before I burn this place to the fucking ground. I smiled. Not exactly diplomatic, but it seemed to work. Our conversation was cut short when the other scouts started to show up. We waited for them, joined by Tommy and Duncan. They seemed to be having an argument all the way down the stairs. All I'm saying is how hard is it to share? Are you still on that? We've gone through so much together, and yet that was when he decides to be greedy. So you are still stuck on that. The man carries two axes and six knives. How hard would it have been to cut off a piece? Why don't you ask John for the other one? There was another one? Yeah, he didn't want it. You didn't, did you? Sorry. Duncan came down the stairs and stood staring hard at Charlie and me. When he didn't say anything, I ventured a guess. Is this about the package of ho-hos? I asked quietly. Yes. Yes, it's about the ho-hos, Duncan yelled. Tommy came up grinning. What'd you do with the second package, Charlie? Charlie shrugged. Shared with you, I thought. Didn't you give some to Duncan? Duncan bared his teeth, then controlled himself. I hate you all, he managed to say. We shared a laugh, and Charlie pulled off his pack. He rummaged inside and pulled out a small package of ho-hos. He gave it to Duncan, who smiled like he just fell in a pile of Christmas toys. There is a third package, Duncan, Charlie said. Duncan looked up at the sky and his eyes moistened. Friendship, is there anything greater? He asked. We all had a laugh as the scouts converged. I met with each pair and we compared notes on the terrain and path ahead. It gave me a general idea of where the army proper was and I sent them back to find the commanders and let them know where I was. It was time to change the direction of this campaign. The sun was just about at its zenith when the three commanders arrived. They were riding in small RVs no bigger than a regular cargo van. I was glad to see they were not in some ridiculous transportation. I would have had to fire them on the spot, for my worst fears would be coming to pass. Commanders, I said, when the three men came over. They saluted, and I returned the salute. I grinned and held out my hand to each man who took it in turn. "'John, it's good to see you,' Tom said. "'Same here,' I replied. "'Let's go upstairs and have a chat. "'There's something I want to run by the three of you.' "'What about the army?' Ted asked. "'There's a bunch of cabins here. "'They can figure out where they want to stay.' 
The lodge is for anyone, but it's haunted, so it's up to them, I said. Haunted? Ed asked, looking over at the building. Long story. Let's go, shall we? I'd like to hear your thoughts, I said. We went up to the platform where Charlie and I had brought up a couple of plastic tables from the lodge. There were five chairs, and we all took a seat. Tommy and Duncan stood on the side watching, but definitely part of the group. There was a large road map of the United States spread out over the tables. Charlie had been marking in arrows and circles, places we have been, places we have seen, and the relative strength of the enemy we were facing. Some of the cities had numbers written across them. Charlie had cross-referenced other road maps and had placed relative population numbers on the larger communities. Anything under 5,000 he didn't bother to list. The three men looked over the map, nodding as they looked at some of the towns. On the bottom of the page, Charlie had written 75 mil. That was a rough estimate of how many zombies were between us and the coast of the Gulf. That was if every single person south of where we were had been turned. Hopefully, the number would be a lot less. So, John, what was so important? I know you've been doing what you do, and the Army has been better for it. By the way, there's a really pissed-off guy in Lafayette wanting you arrested for killing his friends, Ted said. His friends were going to be zombies, and he was going to follow right quick if we hadn't put them down, I replied, irritated. Well, he was annoying enough that we promised to look into it when we caught up with you, Tom said. Oh, really? I said. Yep, I just looked into it, and I'm convinced my first assessment is the correct one. He's an imbecile, Tom said. We all laughed, and I got down to business. I swept a hand over the map. Anything on the other side of the Appalachians is a waste of time. We don't have the resources for the number of zombies that are there. Maybe in twenty years when they've decayed away, but not today. I continued. The only thing we need to do is get the locals to seal off the passes. Shouldn't be too hard, all things considered. I brought a hand down to the southern portion of the map. What we've been doing has been good, but it's too slow. I was thinking about what my crew has been doing, and I think we can actually make it work on a larger scale. How's that? Ted said, looking at the area of the map to be covered. What we can do is split the army into three parts. A center, right, and left units. Each unit will have two scout vehicles to move ahead when the main force reaches a population center. When moving through the countryside, the force spreads out and covers a greater territory. We can make sure that nearly every house and small community is purged of zombies, I said. Plus, we can recruit a lot easier that way. Not to mention deal with the little kingdoms that have sprouted up here and there, Tom said to the nods of the others. What I propose is we put one group here. I pointed to the area just east of the Mississippi, south of Evansville. They control and contain the area all the way south. Their operations do not go anywhere but in between the river and Interstate 65. I know it spreads out a little toward the full southern end, but that's the way of it, I said. The second group will go from the east side of 65 to the base of the mountains. They'll follow that route south until they reach the gulf. Between the two groups, that's a front nearly 300 miles wide, and the land will be covered as well as can be expected from the Mississippi River to the Appalachians. What about the major cities? Tom asked, looking at the map. We don't have the resources to deal with them. That's the plain and simple fact. There's too many, and we're too few. Even if we were 50,000 strong, we'd not survive a straight-on confrontation, I said. But we have the resources to protect a crew that will just contain them. Far enough out of the city, a crew will create a barrier of either earth or debris that will contain the zombies. By the time they figure out what's going on, the damage is done, and they're stuck. I know cities are prime scavenging targets, but they aren't worth dying for. What about the third crew? Tom asked. They're going to follow the trail to the north, right down the path of the mountains, then circle back to cover the other half of the trail. The three crews will merge back at the northern end of Indiana, head through Michigan, cross the Upper Peninsula, and swing back south through Wisconsin and then home, I said. It was a bold plan that relied on a lot of things going the right way. The biggest crew that was taking the most risks was the crew heading to the north. 
There were a lot more populous areas in that direction, and the chances of getting through unscathed were slim. The three men digested the plan in its entirety. I could see them coming up with questions, then answering themselves as they worked out how they would solve their own problems. I was thinking we were moving kind of slow, Haggerty said. Agreed. We could pick up recruits along the way, strengthening the army without straining the overall resources, Hanley said. So, who takes which path? Charlie spoke up for that one. John and I decided that we'd let you three decide which route you wanted to take, based on simple personal preferences. Baker, I know you're from Atlanta, so I figure you might be taking that area on. Baker nodded, and I could see him already thinking ahead as to how he was going to approach the city and the surrounding areas. Ted spoke up. I have experience with the northern section of the country. My wife's family lives up there, and we would spend summers traveling through the area. Ted looked down. Well, at least we used to. Tom snorted. Well, I guess I'm heading to the river. Do you have any experience with that area at all? I asked, concerned that he might be slower than normal, just trying to get used to the terrain. Not much, but I do know a few soldiers that come from that area. I swear I heard about a Cajun regiment somewhere, Tom said. That'd be in my battalion, Ted said. You're welcome to them. They can make a meal out of anything, and by God, if it doesn't usually taste like something, set fire to your mouth. I cocked my head. I'm going to reserve judgment until I see how it all turns out. Since that's settled, I'm going to leave you three to work out the splitting of the regiments and platoons into three equal chunks. Question for you, sir, Tom asked. What's that? Where do you and your crew fit in? We have scouts for the three divisions, but where will you be? Tom wanted to know. I looked at the three faces turned towards me. I've got a wife who's going to give birth in approximately five months, I said. If I miss that, then I will have to deal with Sarah. Now, I can miss it if any of you would want to deal with her for me, I suggested. Three sets of hands went up to a chorus of, no thanks. I laughed with Charlie. Apparently, my wife had a bit of a reputation. We are going to tackle the only part left open. We're hitting the road to the southern end of Illinois, and we're going to clean it out from the top to the bottom, I said. The four of us should be able to manage it until we meet again on the other side of winter. It was getting cooler, and that meant we would be able to hunt zombies much more quickly. The downside was the army was heading to a part of the country that didn't freeze all that often. The best we could hope for was the zombies would be somewhat sluggish, but definitely not frozen. When do you want to tell the army? Ted said. Let's give them a couple of days to settle, relax, and get themselves some good food. We found a good amount of wine, so the bar can be open for a day, I said. After that, the meeting was adjourned. Charlie and I waited for the men to leave, and then we all sat at the remaining chairs. Any problem with the plan? I asked quietly. If any of these men had an objection, the whole deal was off. This was my real council of war. We're banking on a good amount of recruitment. My only concern is not finding anyone willing to support the cause, Tommy said. Agreed. We had people standing around that joined for the chance to strike back. Some people out here have farms to tend to, communities they belong to, what have you. If I was out here with my family alone and someone came along and said, Join us to fight the zombies. The cause is just. You might not live through it, but what the hell, Charlie said. I'd be slightly reluctant to take up the cause, you know? Agreed. But the plan was made without counting on a lot of recruitment. I'd personally be happy if they just took some supplies, agreed to clear out their local area, and left it at that. If we could get every group we meet to just clear out an area of ten square miles, we'd be way ahead, I said. That's our focus on our trip back. We move through, we find the living, and get them to take their lives and their homes back. It's that simple, Duncan said. The best plans usually are, Tommy said. Of course, the best way to hear God laugh is to announce your plans, I said. Somewhere down below, someone laughed out loud, and I knew in my heart of hearts it was not a coincidence. Morgan Field, Kentucky 
The army planned to stay at the forest area for another three days. We were rested enough that we left on the morning of the second day. With the supply trucks nearby, we were able to replenish our stores and our ammo. Fully loaded for bear, we took off to parts west, looking to reach the southern edge of Illinois in a few days. That was the plan, anyway. But as we learned all too often, the best plans usually went south within a few seconds of starting. We were halfway through the first day of travel when we came into what looked like a living community. The houses were not burned, smashed into or out of, and there looked to be laundry drawing on several lines. Given the relative cleanliness of the sheets, I'd say they hadn't been hanging there for three years. We drove slowly into the town, not really sure of where we were. There were no signs welcoming us, and as we drove slowly into the community, we noticed that there were no street signs, no cars, and no trucks. Getting a weird vibe here, Charlie, I said, scanning the street. Same here, said Charlie. Where is everyone? Is today Sunday? I asked. Not really sure. Could be. Do we want to pull over? Anything we need right now? Nope. Move on, then, I said. I waved out the window at Duncan, who was driving the truck behind us. What the hell? Charlie said quietly. I looked forward and copied Charlie's exclamation. In front of us, blocking the road, was a crowd of about two hundred people. They were all standing in neat rows of ten, extending back about ten people. Every single one of them was dressed in simple white clothing. The men wore white shirts tucked into white slacks, while the women wore white dresses with white aprons. Every single man had his hair cut the exact same way, and every woman had her hair in a long braid down her back. Aw, oh, great! Cultists, Charlie said, shaking his head. He brought the truck to a stop. Take it easy. We can always turn around, I said. I haven't looked through the side mirror yet, have you? Charlie said. I glanced down and looked behind the rear truck. Another hundred came out from the sides and blocked the way back. They didn't say anything, they just stood there. It was almost as if they were waiting for us to make a move. I picked up the CB. Watch the sides, Tommy. Duncan, the rear is yours. Do not let anyone approach you. Roger that. I stepped out of the vehicle. I left my rifle behind, hoping we could just move on from this creepy place. I stepped a few feet in front of the truck, but still off to the side. If Charlie had to move, I wanted to be out of the way. I called out to the assembled group. May I speak to the person in charge? The people made no answer. They just stared at me with blank eyes. It was almost as if they were drugged or something. Last chance, and then we're leaving, one way or the other. May I speak with a person in charge, I said, louder than the first time. From a small house off to the right, a young man dressed in black walked out the front door. He wore a simple Oxford-style black shirt and unadorned black pants. His black boots made little sound as he walked down the driveway. He was carrying a small black book. There was a simple wooden cross hanging from a cord around his neck. He walked without looking up, and from what I could see, he was probably around twenty years old. Something was very wrong with this setup. Charlie called from the truck. John, watch the left. And took a closer look at the approaching man, and saw there was a slit in his shirt on both sides of his buttons. His pants had odd knobs right along his seams, and they looked a little stiff, too. Charlie had spotted it correctly. This one had weapons on him. Question was, what kind? And why were all of these people falling in line? Hell, they outnumbered him two hundred to one. The man in black walked forward, keeping a slight smile on his face. His countenance was angelic, but I could see his eyes measuring what he saw and calculating what he needed to do. When he was about ten feet from me, I held up a hand. That's far enough. The man kept walking, and when he hit six feet, I said louder, That's far enough. He kept a smile on his face, and his hand dropped down toward his pants. When he was within arm's reach, I acted. Stepping forward suddenly, I planted a foot in his chest and kicked back, launching the smaller man backwards and sending him tumbling back up the driveway. 
He scrambled to his feet with a shocked look on his face. He quickly regained control and started walking forward again. This time, both his hands were down by his sides. I wasn't too concerned about Blackie. If he wanted to commit suicide, I'd oblige him. It wasn't the worst thing I'd done, and probably wasn't going to be the last. I'd avoid it if possible, since we were surrounded by a whole lot of white weirdos. Charlie had had enough. He popped out of the truck and leveled his pistol across the roof at Blackie's chest. Keep walking, and I'll send you to paradise, jackass, Charlie said. Unless you're deaf, stop where you are. The man was obviously unimpaired with his hearing when he stopped halfway back to where he was kicked. What brings you to our small piece of heaven, strangers? I do apologize for my manners. I was simply unsure if you were real or figments of my overactive imagination, Blackie said. Please, may I approach? He held his hands out as if he wasn't sure if he wanted to surrender or give a hug. Actually, no, I said. From where I'm standing, you're wearing at least four knives. Given the level of control you seem to have over your flock, I'd say you've done something nasty with those knives. Little zombie virus, maybe? I asked. That must have hit the mark, because he started a little. I continued. Yeah, you're not the first one to try it. Come into a town, tell everyone you're immune, you've got the touch. Don't mess with you because God's wrath will descend upon thee. Yeah, I've heard that one before. You must have hit this town when they were on their last leg, hoping for a miracle, I said. Bad luck they got you instead. I turned to the crowd. Well, I'll leave it all up to the rest of you. Do you want to get on with your lives like before? Maybe get a chance at a real life, not just survival? I saw some eyes turn my way, and I knew some were listening. My name is John Talon. I'm the chief executive of the new United States. We're at war right now with the zombies. I have three armies working on clearing out the dead from here to the Appalachian Mountains. I'm going to try and clear out Illinois. There's a capital and dozens of communities to the north. Hell, in Lafayette they have hundreds of people doing just fine. I pointed back at Blackie. Or you could keep following him and worry about getting your tidy whities all dirty every day. That did it. The people lined up suddenly broke ranks and started walking towards their homes. Several of the men nodded at me, and I returned the favor. Blackie watched his world disintegrate like a cracker in a hailstorm. You! He rushed at me, running to the right to put me between Charlie's gun and himself. Two of his hands were raised, and long, thin knives were extended in each. Both were black and shiny, almost as if they were wet. Instinctively, I knew I didn't want those things even touching me. I sidestepped his headlong rush and dodged his swing with the blade. Pivoting on my right foot brought my left fist crashing into his kidney, sending him headlong into the ditch. He lay there for a long while, and I saw his back shudder a few times. I looked over at Charlie. Crying? I mouthed at him. Charlie shrugged. Then he pointed. Take him down, he said. I looked and saw Blackie slowly starting to get up. He was moving stiffly as if he wasn't sure what to do with his arms and legs. His head bobbed a little, and then it slowly swiveled around. I took my knife out of its sheath and stepped around, moving to a little flatter ground. Blackie was acting strange and sadly familiar. I looked over at Duncan, and he was staring at Blackie. Then he suddenly swung his rifle up. It was then I knew what had happened. Blackie turned to me and stared at me with blank eyes. His mouth tried to work out a sound, but all that came out was a hiss. His speaking ability was hampered by the fact that one of his knives was sticking out of his throat— I knew for certain that he had somehow contaminated those blades and used the threat of zombification to keep the rest of the town in line. He moved slowly towards me, adapting to his new locomotion, his hand reaching out to grasp, pull, and claw. I wasn't going to wait for him. I stepped forward in a lunge, spearing his eye with my blade. It was a very nice knife Duncan had found for me. It was a single-edged buoy with a straight edge curving upward in a slow turn. The blade was twelve inches long and about a quarter inch thick. 
I wasn't sure if I was going to replace my other one, but I did like this one. Blackie's other eye looked over at the blade in its face. Then it rolled up, and the man was dead. He fell forward, and I danced back to get out of the way. My blade made a squishy sound when it pulled out of his face, loud enough to make the rest of my crew flinch. Jeez, that guy was noisy, Duncan said. Did you hear the pop when the blade came out? Tommy said. No, did it really? Hey, John, stick your knife back in him and pull it out. I want to hear the pop, Duncan said. Save that gun and grow up, I said, annoyed. I wasn't irritated about the request, but Duncan was still pointing his gun my way. Duncan winced. Shit, sorry. He swung the rifle up and over, securing it in the truck. Charlie gave him a frown, and Duncan made a face back at him. Three women and a man approached the trucks, and I could see they were grateful for the assistance. Thank you, sir, for your help, the nearest woman said. She was about my age, with light brown hair. Her face was thin, and her backstory looked to have a decent amount of pain in it. My pleasure, I said. Although he actually killed himself, I just took care of the zombie that sprouted up in his place. Our thanks. We have a good community here and would like to keep it. May we send a representative to your capital? she asked. Surely, I said. Head north along 41 and turn left around Route 30. When you hit the river, follow it north. You'll run right into it, I said. How far? the man asked. It used to be Leeport, so just a short run south of Chicago. Can't miss it. So a couple weeks? Walking, sure. About five days with careful driving. Obliged. The group left, and I looked over at Charlie. Great. New neighbors, he said. You're becoming that guy, I said. What guy? The one who yells at the kids to get off his lawn. Shut up. Marion, Illinois We pulled out of Morgan Field and took Route 56 towards Illinois. The route was pretty tranquil, and we passed a couple of homes on some hills that looked like they might have some life in them. We made a slow turn to the north, and suddenly the sides of the road disappeared. Where there was once grass and a few trees, now there was nothing but trees. The road dropped away sharply on both sides, and we couldn't see anything except for leaves, sky, and road. Off in the distance, I could see the beams of the bridge that would take us into Illinois. The river appeared as suddenly as the trees did. One minute we were watching the bridge approach, and the next we were high above the water. The river was wide, nearly half a mile where we were crossing. Not that it was all that surprising, since the sign told me we were crossing the Ohio River. We crossed without incident, and damned if the trees didn't come right back on this side of the water. Several of them smacked our truck as we drove by, clearly intent on taking back the road that had once invaded their territory. The road to Shawneetown was uneventful except for a lot of trees. South of us were some large hills which seemed out of place for the flatness of the surrounding area. I commented on it to Charlie. See that ridge? I pointed to the south. Kinda hard to miss it, but yes, Charlie said. I ignored his sarcasm. On the other side of that ridge is a bunch of hills, canyons, valleys, and such. Hundreds of square miles of woods and rock formations. Charlie looked with interest. You don't say. Yep. When the glaciers came down from the north, they pushed a bunch of dirt, rock, and such in front of them. When they stopped, that stuff stopped too, making those hills, I said. It's kind of like a time machine. On this side of the ridge is what the area looked like after the glaciers stopped, and on the other side is what the area looked like before the glaciers came. Interesting, Charlie said. Looks like it would make a great defensive work against the Zs from the north. Interesting, I said back. Finish your thought. I bet there's a few live ones on the other side of that ridge, Charlie said. And if I know rural America, more than a few of them are hunters and are familiar with guns. I thought about that one. Turn south when you can, I said. You got it. As it turned out, Charlie was right. When we made our way south, we crossed through a couple barriers. They weren't much, but they would keep the zombies out. 
Deep in the forest, we came across a huge community of survivors. They were doing very well by all accounts, living off what the forest had to offer and generally surviving. When we asked for some help with the war, over 500 volunteers showed up. Charlie explained that the worst thing that could happen to these people was they were currently bored. I used that to organize them into another brigade and charged them with clearing out the land south of Route 13. They took to it with enthusiasm, and in the morning they pulled out of the community, marching north to Harrisburg. They planned on visiting every house south of 13 and would take care of any zombie problems they might encounter. We pulled out ourselves after refreshing our water and food supplies. I rode with Tommy, changing places with Duncan just to be able to talk with someone different for a while. Ironically, we rode in silence for a bit, following the ridge to Marion. On the outside of the town we stopped and decided to take a longer look. I took the binoculars and headed up to the ridge, with Tommy following behind. At the top, we found ourselves about fifty feet in the air, looking down on the flatlands that made up most of Illinois. Nice area. Never came down here myself, but I've heard this part of the state wasn't like any other, except for the northwestern corner, Tommy said. I looked through the binoculars at the town. Galena. It's a nice place, too. Lots of hills and hidden areas. Maybe when this is all over, I'll go up and take a look. Angelo and I are hoping to find a place like Starved Rock, Tommy commented. Eagle Ridge is similar. Likely occupied, but worth a ride, I said. Looks like the town got hit, but the zombies seem to have moved on. There's no activity at all that I can see. Let me have a look, Tommy said. I gave him the binoculars, and he looked carefully for a few minutes. While he was looking, he asked me a question. When you were a principal, were you a good one? he asked. I thought for a minute. Not really. I never got into it like my colleagues did. They read the articles, did the conferences, and learned the new procedures. I never really cared about that. I just wanted to run the building and make sure my teachers were doing their job effectively. Why? Just wondering, Tommy said. I don't see anything either. Should be okay to take a closer look. We tumbled down the hill, sliding and tripping through the long grass. I thought about what this area must have been like during the upheaval, and figured if they had enough warning or figured out what was happening soon enough, it would be in pretty good shape. The only problem would be the highway, which right now didn't seem to play a factor. I stopped by the other truck, where Charlie and Duncan were arguing over who was a better Western hero, John Wayne or Clint Eastwood. When they asked me, I just said Jimmy Stewart. We're going in. From up top, it looks like things are quiet, but we've been down this road before. Full gear, and we'll take 13 in as far as we can. If we're lucky, we can make it through the other side without trouble. Charlie snorted. Heard that one before. Duncan smirked. Yeah, and the punchline always seems to be the same. Let's move out, I said. We put our gear on and checked out packs and mags, making sure we had everything we needed. Route 13 had a few cars we needed to get around, but for the most part we were able to go through fairly easily. The ramps to and from the highway had a lot of cars on them, and the highway itself seemed to be full of cars. By all accounts we should be fighting by now, but there wasn't any zombie to be seen. It was quiet, there was not a single source of movement anywhere. I got on the CB and called up to Charlie, who was in the lead. Any thoughts on this? Over, I asked. No real feel for anything, but we should have seen something by now. Over, Duncan said. We drove a little further, passing a few gas stations and abandoned businesses. Behind the hotels and restaurants, the houses seemed empty. Think they might have been drawn off by another group? Over, I asked. Can't see it as anything else. Over, Duncan said. That might be it, Tommy said, pointing to the south. Across a huge parking lot, there was a mall. It was a smaller mall with only a couple of anchor buildings, but there was a long connecting area between the two. Around the doors of the anchor buildings and the one door to the shopping area, there were about a hundred zombies each. From where we were, it looked like they hadn't yet found a way to get in. As we watched, a lone figure on the roof started waving their arms and trying to get our attention. I stuck a hand out the window and waved back, 
thoughts? Tommy asked. Well, it's been a dull trip into Illinois so far, I said. That's a lot of zombies, Tommy said. No one lives forever, I said. You do if you're a zombie, apparently. Go for it. Tommy honked the horn three times. The zombies on the outer edge of the crowds looked our way. When they didn't see anything that looked tasty, they turned back to their crowd. Duncan got out of the truck, and Charlie honked again. Duncan waved his arms around and sashayed around the front of the vehicles. It had been funnier than hell if it wasn't so serious. On the brighter side, it seemed to do the trick. The zombies that saw Duncan set up a groan and started our way. When the first started, others began to follow suit. In a matter of minutes, two of the hordes were headed our way, and since the third didn't want to be excluded from the fun, they started our way as well. Okay, now what? Tommy asked, pulling the truck out of the parking lot. That was pretty much my plan up to now, I said. Are you kidding me? Yep. Jerk. Let's get back slowly to the highway. We can get up on the bridge and make our stand there, I said. We drove back the way we came, keeping the zombies following us. I hoped that when the Zs left the area of the mall, the survivors would get out of that area. If they didn't, we were getting in trouble for nothing. What's the plan, John? Charlie asked over the CB. Get on the bridge. Make a stand there, I said. Not enough room with the cars, Charlie said. Need another plan. I'm open to suggestions, I said. Turn on to 13 West and follow the road. Plan? Survival. Got an idea. Duncan and I shared a look, and I shrugged. Charlie was pretty good with his ideas, except they usually involved one of us sticking his neck out a little further than we're comfortable with. We drove slowly, trying to keep the zombies coming, but at the same time I was nervous because it meant that we would have very little time to prepare for whatever Charlie had in mind. We drove on 13, and we reached Crab Orchard Lake in about a half an hour. We had to drive around a few abandoned cars, but nothing crazy. When we reached the middle of the bridge, Charlie ordered a halt. Park your truck there, Charlie said. Duncan did, and Charlie pulled his truck in behind us, blocking the road, but not completely blocking it from zombies. They would squeeze their way through a lot of obstacles. It was a disgusting sight to see. Typically, they left a lot of themselves behind. Help me with the cars, Charlie said, looking at the horde that was advancing on us. He grabbed a floor jack from the back of the truck, and Tommy grabbed the other one from our truck. The jacks worked like they normally did, but when we used two, it allowed us to move the cars where we needed them. In this case, it was in front of our trucks. Tip them over, Charlie said. He put his jack under the lead car and raised it as high as he could. When it was about two feet up in the air, the four of us scrambled under and pushed it the rest of the way onto its side. Hurry up, I yelled. The horde was closing fast. Over, Charlie said, pushing the second car. Make it three now, Charlie yelled. We fairly tossed the third car on its side. When they were on their sides, Duncan looped rope around the wheels and lashed the cars together. It wasn't the greatest of barricades, but in a pinch it would do. We looked at each other, winded but otherwise okay. At about the same time, we realized we were on the wrong side of the barricade. Four men scrambled like maniacs to get over the barricade they had just erected. In the bed of the trucks, we grabbed our weapons. Just in case the horde broke through, we would need to start the killing. Got any more of those neat explosives of yours, Duncan? Tommy asked. I do, but I can't use them here, Duncan said. Because why? Charlie asked, slipping a full magazine into his AR. Because I'd prefer not to have my own precious noggin perforated by a metal cube, Duncan said. There is that, I said. I turned to Charlie. Was this the extent of your plan? Almost, Charlie said. He poked his head over the barrier. The zombies saw him and set up a groan. They hit the cars and actually managed to move them a little. We could just drive off now that we blocked the road, Tommy suggested. They'd eventually go back to the mall, and if those people there aren't out, they're right back where they started, Duncan said. 
Hang on, Charlie said. Let me try something. Charlie went over to the far edge of the cars and swung a leg over the side of the bridge. He shifted a little, moving towards the zombie side of the barricade. The zombies made for him right away. The ones on the far edge moved in for the kill, only to hit the rail on the bridge. The rail was only three feet high, so the lead zombie reached out and promptly fell over the side of the bridge. The next one, being obviously smarter than his brethren, tried the same thing with the same results. The loosening of the lead let several more Zs surge forward, and they pushed the front zombies over the edge. Pretty soon, it was a deluge of zombies falling into the water. A couple were short enough to not fall over, but they were pushed over nonetheless. Charlie kept himself hanging out, changing arms when one got tired. Finally, the last one tripped over the barricade. Well, that was easy, I said, looking over the road. Lifting cars was easy, Tommy asked. My back is gonna hurt for a week. My shoulders start to hurt after the twentieth zombie or so, Duncan said. Charlie swung around the barricade and dropped beside the trucks. If you old ladies are done talking about your boo-boos, we can get moving, he said. Ouch, Duncan said. Yeah, that kind of hurt, Tommy said. New boo-boos, I asked. Yeah, these hurt deeper, but leave no scars, Tommy said. Duncan tried to look hurt, but it didn't work when he started to giggle. Let's move. The day is getting on and we've got a university town ahead of us, I said. How big? Charlie asked. Last I knew, there were 20,000 students here, I said. Jesus, Charlie said. And we're really headed there. The upheaval hit full force around spring. Maybe the kids were on spring break, I suggested. Duncan nodded. Not a bad bet, but we could be walking into 50,000 zombies. Tommy agreed. We could be. Is there a side way to get around? Maybe scope it out before we jump in and possibly die? Damned if I know. Road maps don't include county side roads, I said. Time for good old boy country reckoning, Charlie said. And that is, Tommy asked. I know I'm going west. I'll just keep taking roads that get me there, Charlie said, firing up the truck. And here I thought it meant you farted into the wind and followed the scent, Duncan said. When we stop, I'm going to pound you, Charlie said, laughing. Guess we won't stop then, Duncan said. I laughed, but in the back of my mind, I hoped like hell those kids went home before the world ended. At least they would have been with their families, even if those same families tried to eat them. Carbondale, Illinois The darkness was nearly absolute in the forest. Tree branches reached out and either smacked me or caressed me, depending on how far up the branch I hit. My movements were a beacon to the Zs that chased me, and I could hear them crashing through the brush behind me. I knew they were gaining on me. One look over the shoulder, and I could see the little bobs of light dancing in the air behind me. Only these weren't will-o'-the-wisps. These were the glowing eyes of the zombies that wanted to tear me limb from limb. I was in the woods behind a huge concrete building. I could see its outline as a darker shape in a world of shadows. It was actually the only reference I had for where I was. Under my feet, I could feel a path, but the treacherous trees had dropped dozens of branches, slowing me down considerably. The good news was it slowed down my pursuers. They tripped and fell, tumbled through the brush and crunched through the leaves. If I could hear them, I could avoid them. Problem was, they knew I was here even if they couldn't see me. I was trying to reach a road or some sort of open area. I had originally gone to inspect the big building since I had thought I had seen a light flash from one of the windows. Problem was, I couldn't find the source. Night had fallen faster than I had expected, and when I tried to reach my friends, I had been spotted by a few wayward zombies. I tried to give them the slip by ducking into the woods, but I hadn't counted on there being more zombies in there as well. Duncan and Charlie were somewhere east of where I was, but I couldn't draw them into this fight. They would have no idea what they were walking into. The big complaint I had was I couldn't use my guns. The muzzle flashes would blind me, and I couldn't afford to lose my night vision right now. 
and the report of the shot would draw every zombie on campus. I was pretty sure I was moving south, but I couldn't be positive. All I knew was the woods seemed to go on forever, and there seemed to be more and more Zs coming up behind me. Well, most of them anyway. As I moved, a pair of glowing eyes rose up from the ground in front of me. They kept going up and up and up until they floated a good foot above my head. At first, I thought the zombie must be standing on a bench or something, but I realized it was a very tall zombie. The same time, a very long arm reached out and grabbed my sleeve. It pulled me in and tried to get another hand on my other shoulder, but I wasn't having any of that. I ducked under the arm, pushing the elbow back towards the face, keeping the arm between the teeth and myself. I pushed back on the zombie, and as luck would have it, the ghoul fell over a large branch that was blocking the trail. As further luck would also have it, the zombie took me down with it. I could see the eyes closing in, and I had no choice but to shove my knife into the Z's face. That didn't stop it either. I could hear the teeth clink on the steel as they bit and gnashed on the blade. The edge cut into the foul thing's mouth, but it still forced its face forward, hissing its foul breath into my face. I pushed down, trying to pull myself from its grasp, but it got another hand on my shirt and doubled its efforts to try and bite. I was running out of options, and I could hear reinforcements looking for the battle. I twisted the blade, holding off the zombie with my other hand. I kept the knife in the Z's mouth, since the blade was the only thing keeping the zombie from chewing on me. The steel grated on bone and made an awful noise. The zombie tried to groan, but it came out more like a deep exhale, which I really didn't appreciate. I managed to get the point of the blade into its mouth, and from there I shoved it upwards. It took a hit from the heel of my hand to get the knife to penetrate the skull, but I finally did it. I stood up, and kneeling on the incredibly tall zombie's chest, I ripped my blade out. Just in time, too. Two zombies came at me from behind, one just in front of the other. I gave up trying to be quiet, and I bolted down the trail, flinging zombie goop off my blade. I was in a losing situation back there, and I felt no shame at my retreat. I'd met people who were pretty far gone in the zombie killer mode. They lived for the fight, something they couldn't escape even if they wanted to. And most of them didn't want to. The call of battle is strong, and if you're wired for it, you can't do anything about it. Sometimes they were just fools using the apocalypse to prove something to themselves. Those types didn't last long. Sometimes they were psychopaths, using the zombies as a reason to satisfy their need to kill. Those men were usually outcasts when the threat was gone, retreating back into the corners of their own dark minds. Sometimes they were true heroes, men and women who had something in their genes that took advantage of the situation and allowed them to rise above. They possessed just enough skill, speed, and clarity of thought not only to let them survive, but to succeed. They were the ones that rebuilt, creating on the foundation they fought for. Me? I figured I was just a victim of circumstance. I survived because the right thing happened at the right time, and the right people showed up to help me along. Where those people were right now, I would give a whole roll of luxury toilet paper to find out. The woods suddenly ended, and I found myself standing on what was left of a road. To my left was a dark mass of a building, likely not a safe place. To the right was an open road, but I wasn't sure where it led. I remember seeing something like a stadium in the map we had when we got here, but I wasn't certain. A breeze blew into my face, and it carried the smell of water. If nothing else, that might be shelter, at least for the night. The thrashing behind me was all the motivation I needed. I knew I was running into the wind, but it was a risk I was going to have to take. I headed for the water. A small clutch of trees gave me some shelter from my pursuers as I ducked back into darkness. The trees ended quickly, and I was standing in a clearing with a small gazebo. I was also interrupting the zombie picnic taking place in front of me. Two ghouls were eating a deer they had somehow taken down, and when they saw me... They raised their bloody mouths like rotting baby birds. 
I think not, I said, pulling my pick from my back. I wasn't running from these two. The first one stood up, and I put him back down, caving in his skull from the side. The other reached out and tried to grab my leg, but a swing from my knife took that hand away. As he stood up, I brought the pick down, killing him where he crouched. The picnic shelter was geodesic in shape and very poorly placed for defense. I walked back out and went to the water's edge, hoping I could find something that I could use as a float. Maybe a piece of dock or even a boat of some kind. A quick look showed me nothing. Damn it, I said, following the trail around the lake. I figured maybe the trail would at least guide me in the right direction, although the way my luck ran I would find what I was looking for only after I had circled the entire lake. Slipping through another group of trees, I found another clearing, and then the trail reached the lake edge again. Across the way, I could see a building of some sort, and it looked like there was another building sitting out on the water. My luck may be holding. Moving silently on the trail, I reached the boathouse. It was locked, so I walked quietly around the side. I could see the pier leading out to the second building, so I carefully edged my way along the side of the building until I reached the pier. The waves from the lake gently lapped the sides of the steel drums supporting the pier, and I could see a couple of canoes resting on their sides. I couldn't believe my luck. I was about to congratulate myself when I saw a figure crouched at the corner of the boathouse. He was just sitting there, watching a building across the small inlet of the lake. I didn't think he was a zombie, and in the darkness, I couldn't be sure who he was. Maybe he was a local who thought he could find something useful at the school and got caught when the sun went down. If so, I applauded his sense of survival. I crept up behind him, and as I got closer, he started to look familiar. He still hadn't heard me, so I stayed somewhat hidden and actually put a support post between him and me. Hey, I said, barely raising my voice above a whisper. I ducked behind the post as the man sprang up, swung wildly in three directions, whipped out a pistol, and pointed it in all directions. Hang on, I'm not here to hurt you, I said, holding out my hands. Just looking for shelter like you. John? the man said. I knew that voice. Duncan? Jesus Christ, you scared the shit out of me. Duncan hurriedly holstered his weapon. He ran a hand across his head. Mother of God, has Charlie been teaching you how to be a sneaky bastard? Duncan exhaled slowly and managed to calm his breathing. I looked around. What happened to Charlie and Tommy? No idea. We got separated when we went looking for the labs, and suddenly I was being chased by three small zombies. I gave them the slip behind that building over there, but they're still out there somewhere, Duncan said, pointing to the building across the water. I felt a chill go down my back. I realized I had played around in the woods and there were three of those fast little monsters in the vicinity. I exhaled myself. Where were you? Duncan asked. You went to go check a building and suddenly you were gone. I know. I went to check that long building, the one that was nearly perfect for zombie defense, I said. I thought I saw a light in there, but I couldn't find it place was a convoluted mess of hallways and stairs. If you knew where you were going, you could evade an army in there. By the time they figured out how to go from one hallway to the next, you could be long gone. Any sign of any occupancy at all? Duncan asked, looking back out over the water. Not that I could see. My voice trailed off as I looked where Duncan was looking. We both ducked down, using the rail fence that ran around the boathouse as concealment. Across the water, next to the building, we could see three small shapes slip out of the darkness and move swiftly across the grass. They spread out and covered more ground as they hunted, quietly searching for their prey. They must have heard our voices, or they would never have broken cover, preferring to ambush when they could. Those the ones? I asked quietly. Unless they got reinforcements, Duncan replied. There is that, I agreed. Why are we here again? Duncan asked. Because this looks like it would be a good place for establishing another community. Well-defended buildings, easy access to farmland and grazing land, able to house thousands without tripping over each other, I said. Right. I was talking about this boathouse, 
Duncan said. I chose it to escape the horde chasing me through the woods. You chose it to escape the three little monsters making their way over here right now, I replied. That's it. Hang on, I want to try something, Duncan said. Immediately, I checked myself for any loose items or things I would rather not lose. I made sure I was low to the ground and able to leap out of the way of whatever Duncan was trying to do. Duncan rummaged in his pack, trying to keep quiet. The three zombies were standing at the water's edge, pacing back and forth. If it wasn't for the fact that the water was deep, they'd be on their way over here right now. They knew we were somewhere close. They just couldn't pinpoint us, and the water kept them at bay for the time being. Duncan brought out a spotlight and aimed it at the trio. We were in darkness under the roof of the boathouse, so we could move without being seen. The trouble was, we couldn't do anything about our smell, and it was very hard to keep quiet enough. Duncan tapped me on the arm, and I closed my eyes. Even though I would be on the other side of the beam, my night vision would suffer from the blast of light. I heard the click as he turned it on, and then the click as he turned it off about two seconds later. I looked out at the little zombies. They didn't look like they had suffered any ill effects. They still stood there, still moved a little from side to side, and still turned their heads towards the breeze. Duncan stood up and waved his hands, and there was no reaction from the kids. Huh. I think it worked. We can move if we want to, and they won't see us. Not until their retinas recover, Duncan said. Will their retinas recover? I asked. I know what live eyeballs will do. I don't know what dead ones will do. Good point, Duncan conceded. Maybe we should make some noise or try to get them to move. Shh, I said. I turned my head and saw several shapes moving in the darkness along the path by the building in front of us. It would seem that Duncan's light had been seen by more than the three zombies, and the rest were coming to investigate. Well, that wasn't what I was planning to accomplish, Duncan said with a sigh. Can't shine it that way, since the trees block most of it, I said. Well, let's take care of securing ourselves, I said. I went over to the dock and started working on the fasteners that attached the pieces to each other. At worst, we were going to have to be on a raft for a while. Duncan grabbed paddles and started to give me a hand. I looked back at the three zombie kids who were still standing there, and suddenly... One of them literally flew off the shore, sailed about fifteen feet, and landed with a splash in the water. The little Z sank like a stone, while the other two dropped suddenly from a huge shape that rose up behind them. Looks like Charlie found us, I said. And attracted every zombie nearby with that splash, Duncan said. Charlie ran over to the canoes that were stacked by the boathouse and threw one in the water towards us. He cut down a zombie that got too close, and in the interim, I managed to grab the canoe, get Duncan in, and paddle quickly to shore. Charlie pulled us up and gave us a nod. Thanks for the light. Didn't know where you were holed up. Glad to see you're together, Charlie said. Same here, I replied. Where's Tommy? Over in the foyer of this building. He was looking in the wrong direction when you turned the light on. Caught it full for a second. Charlie said. Whoops, Duncan said. He'll be fine. Just can't see very well for a minute. Should be okay by now. We ran over to the building, and sure enough, Tommy was there. He was blinking a lot, but otherwise seemed fine. Lot more on the way. Do we stand or retreat? Duncan asked. Not sure of the numbers, and not sure of the terrain. Thoughts? I asked. Fight them now, or fight them later. I'd say wait for morning, Tommy said. If we could find a wide open space, we could face them now, Charlie said. Too bad we can't funnel them, Tommy said. Don't know this place that well. If we could ask a former student, that would be helpful, but I don't see much of the student body left, do you? I asked. They're coming, Tommy said. All right, let's keep moving. Can't get a break around here, I said. We moved around the communications building. At least that's what I thought it was. There was a small enclosed area with a bunch of satellite dishes to support that notion. It was either that or this place once had awesome sports bar parties back in the day.
On the other side of the building, through a small grassy area, was a large parking lot. There were exactly three cars left in the lot, and all of them were not going anywhere. Two of them had at least two flat tires apiece, and the third was just rusting away. I think that the last one had been abandoned before the upheaval hit. Well, here's your open space. Now what? Tommy asked. Do we know how many there are coming after us? I asked. Nope, said Charlie. Do we know if there are any more little zombies? I asked. Nope, said Duncan. Do we know if there are any survivors here? I asked. Nope, said Tommy. Right. Standard rule of engagement applies when number of enemy is unknown, makeup of enemy is unknown, and condition of survivors is unknown. As one, we all said the same thing. Run for it. We ran east, since that was the general direction where we left our vehicles. We had parked somewhere near the student center, and we were somewhere south of that. If we had any brains at all, we would have found a place to spend the night and get our bearings in the morning. I have a thought, I said. Did it hurt? Duncan asked. Ow! Damn it! I shook my hand out a little. My knuckles hurt a bit after thumping Duncan's head. Let's find a place to hole up. We'll just get ourselves killed stumbling around in the dark. And for all we know, we're being trailed by a dozen kid zombies right now, I said. Makes sense. Where would the best place be to spend the night? Charlie asked. The boathouse, actually, I said. There was silence as that sunk in. Next best, Charlie said, somewhat irritated. Let's try this place right here, I said. The building was small compared to the other ones, and didn't have any windows except for rows of small ones up near the roof. There were two garage doors leading out to what might have been a football field and a service entry door on the other side. Not much in the way of options, Tommy said. What happened? We were surrounded by buildings north of here, and then suddenly we can't find one to save our lives. Literally. Take what we can get, Charlie said. Duncan went to the door, and after a little work managed to get it open. We ducked inside, and Duncan made sure to lock the door behind us. Lately, the zombies had been figuring out how to do things like open doors. It was a little disconcerting when you thought about it. Inside, we spread out, checking corners and looking behind dark spaces. We limited the use of our flashlights, mostly because we didn't want to give away our position to the zombies that were certainly following us. How do you think the army is doing? Tommy asked, checking behind a mower. Probably pretty well. I figure a lot more of the South survived than the North, Charlie said. I moved around to a storage closet and peeked inside. There was nothing alive or dead in there, and it smelled strongly of fertilizer. I thought about telling Duncan about it, but then I didn't need him blowing us to the moon, so I just left it alone. All clear, Duncan whispered. All clear, Tommy said. Clear, said Charlie. Clear, I said. All right. Let's see if we can get some sleep. Find a spot to get comfortable. I took my backpack off and stretched out next to the big Ford tractor. Even in the dark, I could see the blue of its paint. Charlie took off his tomahawk harness and used his own pack as a pillow, lying in the middle of the empty bay in the garage. Tommy stretched out on the other side of the Ford, and Duncan curled up in the bucket of a front loader in the far bay. We were too used to Duncan to question his habits anymore. Morning broke through the windows much earlier than I would have liked. I tried to get everyone to go back to sleep by executive order. Didn't work at all. Charlie came over and gave me a nudge. Actually, it was more like a kick in the ribs. Ah, Mop, jeez, knock it off. Not everyone gets up and wants to run five miles like you do, I said, rubbing my side. We have a situation, Charlie said. I grabbed my canteen and splashed some water in my face. Talk to me, I said as I shook the sleep from my eyes. Tommy took a ladder, had a peek out the windows. He says there's about fifty zombies in the area just kind of milling about, Charlie said. I looked over at Tommy and he nodded. They aren't really moving, they're just standing there, Tommy said. Waiting for us to break cover, I finished. So they don't know we're here. That's good, but they won't leave without a reason to. Right, Charlie said. 
We could make a break for it out the back door, but we'd be walking into a fight. Tommy couldn't see if there were any outside the doors. I thought about it for a minute. Can we get the tractor to work? The backhoe one? I asked. What's the plan? Charlie asked. If we can get that tractor running, we basically batter our way free of the area, then outrun the ghouls until we get to our trucks. Swap vehicles and bolt north, I said. Truth was, it wasn't a great plan. But my other plans had Duncan getting loose with the fertilizer, and that somehow seemed worse than facing hordes of zombies. Charlie, Duncan, and Tommy cogitated on that one for a while, and finally they shrugged and moved over to the vehicle in question. No doubt the plan was flawed, but in my defense I was the only one that put anything out there. We swapped out the old gas for some newer stuff we found, and Tommy spent a good amount of time making sure things might actually work. We'd only get one shot through the door, and then we'd be relying on that vehicle to make a run through a lot of zombies. After an hour and a half, the sunlight went from coming through the windows to angling downward. We spent the time making sure we had room to ride on the thing and were able to hold on. I'd hate to have to run after the tractor after I had done something stupid like fall off. Trial start, Tommy asked. Only get one, Charlie said. Zs are gonna be swarming the minute they hear something in here. They won't see anything, so they can swarm to their heart's content, Duncan said. This tractor is made for driving on turf, not over zombies. We might be in for a rough ride if we run over a few, Tommy said. Keep the bucket low, just enough to clear the zombies if they go down. Sorry, Duncan, but we need your bedroom for the zombies, I said. Aw, oh, Dad, I was just away at college for a semester. Did you have to rent my room already? Duncan said. Best swap I ever made. <laughs> Let's get it going, I laughed. Tommy waited until we were on board, and Duncan was ready by the door to fling it open. Charlie and I were on the sides, holding on to the arm of the front bucket. Tommy scolded us for trying to hold on to the hydraulic lines. I held my Glock with my right hand, Charlie with his left. We were going to keep the zombies from getting too close to the tractor. With luck, we wouldn't need to shoot too many. Tommy nodded at Duncan, and Duncan unlocked the door. Tommy turned the key, and the tractor coughed to life, spewing black smoke as the old gas still in the carburetor burned in protest at being disturbed. Tommy slipped the rig into gear, and Duncan pushed the garage door up. Duncan dashed back toward the rear of the tractor as two zombies chased him. Charlie shot them both, and we were off. Tommy kept the bucket low, and we charged out of the garage. The bucket in front worked like a perfect battering ram, knocking zombies out of the way and plowing through the hordes. I shot one that came stumbling towards my side, and I could hear Charlie's gun going off as well. The tractor lurched to one side, and I nearly lost my footing. Duncan, who was holding on at the back, bounced up high enough that I saw his boots. He landed safely, and we kept moving. I looked back and saw we had driven over a rather large zombie, which explained the sideways shift. The big man's arms and legs worked hard to pull the rest of him out of the ground. If I had the time, I'd watch to see how he did it before I sent him over the divide permanently. Tommy drove around the building and headed towards the nearest road. I felt the tractor shudder a few more times as bodies were battered out of the way. A small zombie came racing around the building and nearly got a hand on the tractor before the rear wheel took her down. Over the roar of the engine, I could still hear the crunch of her skull as the wheel finished her off. We rode the tractor around Saluki Drive and Tommy headed it east. When we reached the main road, we turned north, following a main artery into town. The college passed us on the left, the empty stadium never filling again with living souls to spend a Saturday cheering the football team. The physical plant that once powered the campus shut down forever. The walkway that once connected dorm life with classroom life now only a sidewalk of torn dreams. We drove past them all, outrunning our pursuers, at least for the time being. At the second walkway, Tommy slowed down, and I returned the wave of several men and women stationed along the bridge. 
They leveled their guns and waited for our ghoulish friends to catch up. Apparently things have been going well for our friends from Garden of the Gods, I shouted at Charlie, who also waved at the group. Whatever it takes, I'm all for it, Charlie shouted back. We passed along. A quarter mile away, we heard the crash of rifles as the hunters became the hunted. Tommy pulled into a large intersection and parked the tractor. It was stained all over the front from running over zombies, and black goo dripped from the corners of the bucket. We left the keys with the tractor, figuring the group that relieved us was going to probably put it to good use. Working tractors were always in demand, and this one was a front loader to boot. We piled into the trucks, and this time I rode with Charlie. I was actually exhausted, since I figured we got about three hours of sleep before we made our jailbreak. You want to drive? Charlie asked. He looked about as beat as I did. I shrugged. May as well. We'll stop as soon as we can for some rest. Thank God, Charlie said. I pulled us out of the parking lot and pointed us north. The southern section of the state was in good hands. I wanted to see about the rest of it before heading home. Effingham, Illinois What kind of swing do you favor? Charlie asked me. Depends on what I'm using, I said. What about you? I like a backhanded swing with a slight downward angle. How slight? Probably no more than 15 to 20 degrees. Why the backhand, I asked. Sweeps a Z away to the side. Becomes less of an obstacle if I have to step forward, Charlie said. Nice. What about you? How do you like to swing your pick? Charlie wanted to know. I thought for a second. I favor the baseball swing, using the shoulders and hips to deliver the power, keeping my arms from getting too tired. Charlie looked thoughtful. I could see that. Do you think you do more side hits or top-of-the-head hits? I'd have to say top-of-the-head when they're down and side hits when they're up, I said. Nice. We'd spent the last three weeks driving around a major portion of the state from Carbondale to Duquoin, Sparta to Redbud, Waterloo to Belleville. We'd encountered quite a few people along the way and managed to get a few of them started in clearing their immediate areas. Belleville was completely dead, but there was a large enough community from Carlisle to handle it. The pattern I was beginning to see was the people in the rural areas survived the outbreaks much better than the people in the more populated areas. Most of the smaller towns, the ones that don't really show up on too many maps, they weathered the storm just fine, aside from the loss of power and regular restocking of their local grocery store. They dealt with any zombie wandering their way and were damned efficient about it. At Fort Duchart, we found that the locals had lured the massive hordes of zombies to attack the limestone walls while they stayed safe within. The men took turns killing the ghouls from the ramparts until there were none left. The last battle took a month to finish them all. We stood at a bridge overlooking the Mississippi into St. Louis, and it was then that I realized we were going to need the whole army to take on the lands west of the river. Another fight for another day. Right now, Charlie and I were resting in the lounge area of the Flying J Travel Plaza at Effingham. We'd stopped here for the night, thinking it was safe. In the morning, we discovered it wasn't. Outside the window, about three hundred zombies milled about, waiting to see what we would do. They tried to break the windows, and even now they pounded on the glass, but it wasn't going to break. That glass was meant to quiet the engine braking of semi-trucks as they pulled in off the highway. It was thick enough to handle dead hands as they beat a staccato on the barrier. This was an interesting mix of zombies. Apparently when the upheaval hit this place, it must have been at night. In a truck stop like this one, in a decently populated town, truckers don't always sleep alone. Mixed in with the locals, the truckers, and the workers were some obvious working girls. Some were pretty sad sights, as it was plain some of their jaws tore them to shreds before they turned themselves. Are you better with your right or left hand? I asked Charlie. I knew he used both with his tomahawks, but he had to favor one. Interesting question, Charlie said. 
I'm right-handed, but I think I'm more accurate with my left hand. Why do you think that is? I asked. Probably because I'm right-handed. When I swing with my left, I'm focusing more on the swing and where it lands, and that concentration helps accuracy, Charlie said. That sounds about right, I said. When I swing... Whatever I was going to say was drowned out in a large crack and crash of breaking glass. I jumped off the counter I was sitting on and whipped my pick out, Charlie joining me with his hawks. We were in the back of the store, hanging out among the stickers to decorate one's ride. Charlie stuck his head around the corner. Damn! Window? I asked. Door. Damn. That was the one weak spot in holding off the zombies. We thought they wouldn't rush the place when they couldn't see us, but we didn't really figure on the door glass to be so weak. Plan? Charlie asked, shrugging into his backpack. Back door, I said. We moved as quickly as we could for the rear door, passing by the junk that even looters wouldn't care for. If we had time, I'd have grabbed the fuzzy dice for the truck, but as it was, we were borrowing it right now. The back of the truck stop was an even bigger mess than the front, but thankfully there didn't seem to be any signs of struggle in here. There were no blood stains, no battle marks or bullet holes. Charlie found the exit first since I turned in the wrong direction. Here, he yelled, getting my attention. He popped open the door, and I was right behind him. Right into a crowd of about ten zombies. I didn't stop to count because one lunged at me and grabbed my collar, pulling me in for a bite. I got my hand up and grabbed it by the throat, fighting its two-handed hold with my single one. I spun around and slammed the zombie into the back wall of the building, holding it there while I dropped my pick. I twisted my back, reached around my waist, and pulled my gun left-handed. I swung it up and fired point-blank into the face of the zombie that was charging my back. I fired again at another that was getting close, and that bought me a second to kill the zombie I was holding against the wall. Dark brain matter spattered the brick as the fully dead corpse slid down the wall. I didn't stop to admire my handiwork, as I had others to kill. Charlie was better off than I had been. He had stepped into a small space clear of zombies, which gave him room to swing his hawks. And swing them he did. Zombies advanced, and zombies died. Charlie backhanded one and then another, kicking a third down while he wrenched his axes out of the skulls of those he killed. Charlie had been at this long enough that he knew how much force he needed to crush a zombie skull with one swing. Most of the zombies we met these days were older and had more fragile skulls, but some were not. Charlie hedged his bet by swinging the same for all. I fired twice more, and as soon as the shots stopped echoing, the attack was over. I looked over at Charlie, and he shook his head. We nearly made a really big amateur mistake, Charlie said, wiping off his axes. Nearly, I said. It was amateur hour. You ran right out the door, and I followed you like I had never seen a zombie in these parts before. Are we telling Duncan and Tommy? Not on your fucking life. The door behind us banged with increased activity inside, and it was only a matter of time before they opened the door. The older zombies, being more fragile, were also a little smarter. Not enough to be a big problem, but enough to encourage extra precautions. Let's get out of here, I said. My shots will bring more of the goopy ghouls, and I'm two days away from bath day. That long? Shoot, I'll toss you in the next river, Charlie said as we ran up a side street. Try it and see what happens, I replied, taking my depleted magazine out of my gun and replacing it with a full one. I'd fill the other one later when I wasn't in mortal danger. Sure could use Duncan's cat right about now, Charlie said as we moved deeper into the subdivision surrounding the car and truck plazas that lined I-57. No kidding. He was pissed as hell at us for spending the night away at SIU, I said. Thank God he wasn't in our truck. Duncan said Tucker shredded his backpack trying to get at the food Duncan had there, Charlie said. He held up his hand as we moved past a house. Dark shapes inside moved with us, their glowing eyes revealing what side of the line they were on. Let's move a little faster. Duncan said he was going to try something different to deal with the zombies, and I am personally scared to death, I said. 
Any idea what he planned? Charlie asked. When was the last time he told us about his plans? I countered. Good point, Charlie said. Oops, hang on. Ahead of us, under a large maple tree, two thin forms detached themselves and started a slow walk towards us. One was moving with a limp, stumbling awkwardly. That was understandable, since she was missing her left foot. The other was almost hypnotizing to watch as he swayed from side to side as he moved, and his head bobbed back and forth from one shoulder to the other. They looked to be about the same age, but that was it for similarities. She was dressed in jeans and a tank top, and he was in khakis and a polo shirt. If they were dating, I'd say she was definitely trying to marry up. Charlie wasted no time. He walked up to the nearest one, the girl, and cracked her skull with a blade to the head. The boy moved in, and Charlie swung with his other hand, connecting the beard of the axe with the boy's skull. Another crack later, and the two were down. How far should we go? I asked. Probably to a point where we won't be a distraction for whatever happens, Charlie said. What's that sound? I said. It was a persistent banging, like someone was beating a wooden spoon on a metal pot. It was fast, and seemed like it was too consistent for someone to be doing that by hand. I have a feeling we might be seeing the start of whatever Duncan had planned, I said. Agreed. If he's making noise like that, then he wants the zombies to come to him, or whatever he has going on over there, Charlie said. Let's give him an audience, I said. We went back up the street and then split up, Charlie taking one side of the street and I the other. We worked at a quick jog pace, moving from house to house and opening the front doors. The ones we couldn't open, we just left. I kicked in a few and was away before any inhabitants came to see what I was selling. Charlie and I cleared one street and then another, and then we took refuge in a parked RV that was sitting under a carport. The vehicle wasn't going anywhere, having four flat tires, but the interior was clean. I took the time to reload my depleted magazines, clean off my knife, and pick off any zombie residue. Charlie took it a step further and sprayed some kerosene in his scabbards and sheaths, frying any virus in there as well. I followed suit and was unpleasantly surprised when the flames turned red from my knife sheath. How long should we stay here? Charlie asked from the front of the RV. He was standing in between the front seats, watching the procession of zombies stroll past on their way to whatever was making the noise. I'd say we're better off here than in the vicinity of whatever Duncan has planned. Besides, I'd say we'll know soon enough, I said, stretching out on the bench seat in the kitchen. There was a small flat-screen television built into the wall across the table. I wished we could watch something to pass the time. I must have dozed off, because Charlie was tapping me on the shoulder. I think something is going to happen soon. The zombies have stopped traveling by, so most of them must be wherever Duncan wants them, Charlie said. Well, since I don't have anything else to do, I said, extracting myself from the bench's comfortable embrace. Whatever Charlie might have said at that moment was eclipsed by an amazingly loud explosion. If we had been outside, I'm sure we would have been deafened. The RV rocked a little from the concussion, and we both put our hands out to steady ourselves. That was a good one, Charlie said. Best so far, I replied. Wonder what he managed to blow up. Guess we'll find out. We stepped out of the RV, and at the same moment there was a sound like hail on the carport above us. I looked at the driveway and saw the hail was bits of metal. Nails and screws were all over the place, with nuts and washers joining in. There were other bits as well, not easily identified, but clearly pieces of flesh and bone. Glad we were under the carport, I said unnecessarily. Amen, brother, Charlie said. We walked carefully back the way we had come, walking around the metal and flesh on the ground. It was a grim minefield we navigated, and it got worse as we got closer to the epicenter. Larger pieces were showing up, like full hands and the occasional arm. Charlie pointed out a few headpieces, but there was nothing to finish off. Whatever Duncan had done, he had done it well. At the edge of the gas station parking lot, we looked out over the interstate. 
In this part of the town, the highway was built below the level of the rest of the buildings, making use of a valley that bisected Effingham. In the center of that valley was virtually stacks of zombie bodies. They were all lying like they had been blown down by a massive wind that had erupted in the very center. That center was a smoking crater about fifteen feet across. There were the remains of what might have been two large trucks and car off to the side. I didn't have the words to describe what Duncan had achieved here. He must have killed at least two to three thousand zombies in one shot. I was impressed and awed at his skill, and that awe raised my fear factor of Duncan's handling of explosive to another notch. If this was his success, I couldn't imagine the range of a failure. Wonder where he is, Charlie asked. Wonder where Tommy is, I asked. I pulled out my radio. Tommy, Duncan, anyone out there? Over. I repeated myself twice before there was a reply. Tommy here. We're on the north side of town, about a mile from where we left the trucks. Over. Stay there. We'll meet you. Out. North it is, I said. We backtracked a little to get out of the worst of the debris, and then turned north. We didn't see any more zombies out in the open. This area was going to be clean after the next major rainstorm. Not bad for a day's work. A mile and a half later, we reunited with Tommy and Duncan. Duncan was playing with a very active Tucker, and Tommy was looking at a map. At our approach, Tucker jumped off the truck and scampered over to rub his head on our legs. I picked up the purring ball of fur and scratched Tucker behind his ears. He closed his eyes in pure kitty pleasure as his front paws flared. I have to ask, Charlie said. What did you do? Duncan grinned. Three full propane trucks, two barrels of scrap metal, a small fuse, a candle, and a lot of luck. How did you make the noise? I asked, handing off a very happy Tucker to his keeper. Jacked up a car, jammed a metal rod in the rear tire, and let it bang away on a tire rim. Seemed to work, Duncan said. Yeah, seemed to do the trick, I said. Nicely done. Tommy held up the map. I think I might know where we can find a lot of volunteers. Oh? Right here. What the heck is Shelbyville? Charlie asked. You'll see. Strasburg, Illinois We headed north on some road that didn't have a name, just a number. 2800E was its official name, and like a lot of things, made no sense since we were traveling north. But we were used to things like that by now, so it wasn't even worth the effort it took to complain about it. Stewardson was a really small town in the middle of some serious nowhere. The town looked to be mostly populated, and several people waved as we drove past. We stopped for a minute to speak with a few of the inhabitants, and learned that they were already making sure the surrounding areas were clear. But if we were looking for more people, they suggested heading north to the lake. That's where a lot of people relocated from Mattoon, Effingham, and a few other towns I had never heard of. We told them about Leeport and what we were doing, and there were several volunteers that were ready to go. But we told them to wait until we did a push to the west. The day was winding down, and we were looking forward to a place to rest. Tommy was driving the truck ahead of us, so Charlie radioed and told him to look for a place to spend the night. We'd look for the Blake in the morning. Tommy acknowledged, and we drove for a little while longer until we came upon another town. This one seemed kind of nice, except for the fact that it was very empty. Every single building was abandoned, and as we slowly drove the streets in the dimming light, I could see signs of hurried escape. Garage doors were open, house doors were left open, and there were toys and clothes in yards. It was just strange. Getting a weird vibe here, Hoss, I said, mostly to myself. Same here, Charlie said. Tommy, pull over. Let's see what this place is about. Tommy pulled his truck over in a church parking lot. It was a nice-looking building with an attractive facade and what looked like formerly nice landscaping. A canopy covered the entrance and the driveway past the entrance so patrons could get inside if the weather was bad. A small bell tower was located near the back, and there looked to be a small school on the other side. 
We stepped out of the trucks, and I looked over at Duncan. He pulled Tucker out of the truck and held him for a minute. Tucker turned his head to the wind, and I could see his little nose moving as he tested the available sense. He didn't react to anything, so at least from that direction there was nothing to worry about. While the rest of the crew waited, I did a quick walk around of the church. Nothing seemed out of place, and the windows were all intact. All in all, it seemed like it would do as a stopping point for the night. Duncan led the way with Tucker and opened the front door. Suddenly, Duncan was spinning in place, trying to keep a clawing, biting, and scratching demon from shredding him to pieces. Tucker had gone from complacent to insane in a matter of seconds. Jesus, Tucker! God Almighty! Duncan managed to get the little cat immobile by pressing him against his shoulder. I was standing behind the two of them and could see the wild look in the little cat's eyes. Duncan, put him back. Guys, heavy weapons, I said, turning back to the truck. Without another word, we all took our battle rifles out of the trucks. I checked the chamber on my three oh eight while Charlie inspected his AR. Duncan put the cat back in the truck, completely calmed down, and Tommy armed himself with an AR as well. We went back towards the church, and this time I opened the door. I had a flashlight attached to the handguard of my weapon, and I swept it around, looking for anything that might have sent Tucker over the edge. The interior of the building was dimly lit through cloudy skylights, and I could see a little, though the light was fading. We stepped into a large foyer, which extended back and around what must have been the sanctuary area. Across the way, I could see some sort of counter with what looked like drink and snack menus. The room was neat and had a fine layer of dust over everything. I couldn't see anything that would have made our resident zombie detector go nuts. Left! Tommy yelled, flashing his weapon light down a hallway. All of us crouched and brought our weapons up, lighting up the entrance with four beams. I looked over the sights of my rifle and saw exactly... nothing. Tommy? Charlie asked, staring down his barrel as well. I must be seeing things, Tommy said. I swear I saw a group of kids standing there. Not another lodge, Duncan said. I was thinking the same thing. We'd seen our share of ghosts this trip, and I wasn't in the mood for more. I brought my light around back to the main foyer. There was a hallway off to the right, and I headed over that way. I'll check this one out. Tommy, why don't you and Duncan head down that hallway? Charlie, there's a bunch of offices that looks like over on the other side of that counter. Give them a look, and we'll circle back here in ten, I said. Tommy looked determined to clear the area he said had kids in it, so he went forward without a word. Duncan followed, keeping his light and rifle covering the left side, while Tommy covered the right. Charlie broke from the group and went across the foyer, while I went down the hallway I had seen. Without the light from the skylights, the hallway was considerably darker. I moved slowly along, checking the doors and windows of the small classrooms I found back there. It looked at one point like the church had a kind of daycare for attendees' children, because there was a small counter outside two rooms filled with toys. I walked down the hallway past the windows, and out of the corner of my eye I thought I saw movement. Looking over my shoulder, I watched as a small ball slowly rolled down the hallway and bounced off my foot. I gave the ball a nudge, sending it back down the hall. Turning back to the task at hand, I tried not to feel the chill that ran across my neck. A few more steps, and I felt something hit my foot again. Looking down, it was the ball bouncing off my foot again. I gave it another nudge, harder this time, sending it down the hall and out into the foyer. I don't remember ever playing soccer with a ghost before, so this was a first. The hallway ended at a cross hallway, and as I looked right, I could see the lights from Tommy and Duncan swinging about. I flashed my light three times in their direction, receiving the same in response. I turned and followed the hallway in the other direction, nearly tripping over the ball at my feet. I picked the ball up and tossed it back down the hallway, bouncing it into the foyer. If it came back again, I was going to roll it towards Duncan and let him play with the ghost. The end of the hallway opened up into a large gymnasium. The polished floor had a small layer of dust across it, and as I shined my light on it, 
I saw what looked like small footprints crisscrossing the floor. The cold chill crept across my back as I thought about what could have caused the prints after the dust had time to settle. At the other end of the gym, the hallway opened up back into the foyer. I was a hallway closer to the cafe counter than I was when I turned down the other hallway. Charlie, Tommy, and Duncan all rejoined the foyer at the same time. Anything? I asked. Charlie shook his head. Nothing here. Same down the other hall, Tommy said. Wonder why Tucker lost his head, Duncan asked to no one in particular. No idea, I said. Anyone check the sanctuary? Three shaking heads was all the answer I got. Okay, then. Well, let's see what's behind door number two. I went over to the middle door to the sanctuary and pulled it open. I had to take a step back as a chill wind of death blew into my face. I held up my arm to my nose as I walked into the sanctuary. The setting sun shone through the stained glass window on the west side, casting multicolored lights all over the pews. The stage was built up high, at least six feet in the air. On the altar was a large bowl with several cups of brownish liquid pooling at the bottom. Jesus! Charlie's voice came behind me, and I knew he saw the same thing I did. I'd say Jesus had turned his face from here, wouldn't you? I said. The pews were filled to about half capacity of men, women, and children. They were sitting in neat rows, and they looked like they had just been sleeping. Some had their heads back, while others were slumped over. A couple of women were still holding infants. Every adult was holding a cup similar to the one on the altar. "'Wonder what made them all decide to cross over?' Duncan asked. "'Suicide cult?' Charlie asked. "'Doesn't seem likely in the middle of downstate Illinois.' They take their religion seriously down here, but not that seriously. Maybe they felt like they had no other choice, Tommy said. Maybe, I said. But this isn't a church anymore. It's a tomb. You shouldn't be here, a new voice said. Four weapons covered a small man standing in the doorway. He was short, maybe a buck twenty soaking wet, and dressed in a simple plaid shirt and jeans. He carried a small twenty-two rifle, and his eyes were dark, contrasting sharply with his pale skin. I dispensed with formalities. Why? Did they see you? The man was intense, staring at each of us. Did who see us? Duncan asked. The kids? Did they see you? The man was whispering hoarsely now. What kids? Only thing I thought I saw was a group of kids standing down a hallway— they weren't there when the light shined on them, Tommy said. Thank God, then there's still time. Did any of them contact you? The man said, looking at each of us in turn. I played a little ball with someone, that's all I did, I said, getting some stares from my crew. We have to go now, while well, there's time. I'll explain outside. Please, you have to leave before they see you, before they know you see them. The man looked almost frantic as he gestured us towards the door. I shrugged at my friends, and we followed the small man towards the door. I looked over at Charlie and held up two fingers with my right hand. He nodded and made the same gesture to Duncan. I got Tommy's attention and made the same gesture with my left hand. He nodded and brought his rifle up to the low ready. I did the same with mine. When we hit the outside, Charlie and Duncan swept right, while Tommy and I swept left. If the little man brought us out into an ambush, they were going to get the surprise of their lives. It was with no small relief that we saw there was no one out there, just the trucks and a small pickup parked nearby. I swept my rifle up to my shoulder and faced the little man. All right, we're outside. What the hell happened here? Why are you so damn spooky inside? I asked. The man put his rifle in his truck before answering. My name is Emmett Jordan. This was my hometown before the upheaval. When the zombies came, they didn't come from inside the town. They came from the north, killing everything. Emmett looked off into the setting sun. People panicked. Instead of banding together and fighting, they ran for the most secure building they knew. The zombies surrounded them. Night and day they groaned and scratched. People thought they could wait them out, but 
How do you outweigh the dead? Emmett asked of no one. So they decided they would go meet their maker, instead of turning over into one of those demons. Everyone took the poison that killed them all, Emmett said. How do you know this? Duncan asked. My wife and son are in there, Emmett said. I was a truck driver. I was in the far side of Nebraska when everything went south. By the time I got here, everything was over. I looked at our small friend with new eyes. Anyone who could cross the country in the middle of the zombie apocalypse was a good survivor and a man worth knowing. What was that stuff about them seeing us? I asked. Emmett sighed. You may not believe this, but what I tell you is the truth. If a ghost sees you and sees you looking at them, they'll follow you. They'll take up residence where you live, make your life hell. Farmer up the road took a look inside not too long ago. Three weeks later, he hung himself. I'm not taking any chances. Why not just burn it down? Charlie asked. Nope. Then they're free to go anywhere, Emmett said. Better they just stay there and everyone leaves them alone. I sighed. Sounds like a good plan. But if we're playing with one superstition, let's fight it with another. Duncan, Tommy, follow Emmett into town. Find me some iron bars. Bring them back here. The three drove off, leaving me with Charlie and Tucker. Tucker was back to his purring self. I refilled his water bowl with my canteen and put a little more food in his bowl. Why iron bars? Charlie asked. Old superstition I read about a very long time ago. Spirits hate the touch of iron, won't cross an iron barrier, I said. You believe that? Charlie asked. Four years ago, I didn't believe real zombies could walk the earth, yet here we are. I've reevaluated what I believe in the meantime, I said. Charlie looked at the church. Amen, brother. Amen. Macon, Illinois. Christ, how many more? I've got two mags left, then we're in trouble. Perfect, I've got one. Just one? You're a lousy shot, then. Shut up. We can't all be Mr. Hero who never misses. That's right, there's only one of me, so why do you suck at shooting? Ha! Two with one shot. Beat that. Don't need to. I have more ammo. You suck. Well, we have two options. We can stay here, shoot up our ammo, and pray to God Charlie and Duncan show up and rescue our asses. Or we can figure out how to get out of here, I said. Christ, that's the best you got, Tommy said. I'm open to suggestions. Tommy sighed, long and deep. All right, what do we do? Get some carts. Fill them with anything heavy. I'll hold the fort here, I said. Why you? Tommy asked. I have more ammo, I said, smiling sweetly. Back in a minute, Tommy said grumpily. I watched him duck through the aisles and disappear into the gloom of the store. We had been scouting this area after meeting with the community around Lake Shelbyville. Turns out that lake had managed to bring together over 4,000 people. They made the lake the center of their existence and used it for sustenance, defense, and water. It was ideally suited to that purpose, and the group had fared well. We were the first outside group representatives they had seen in a long time that hadn't wanted to try and take over. They had an effective cure for that. They simply overwhelmed the opposition with their superior numbers, and the rest were swinging in the trees outside of town. Tommy and I had decided to head west to check on some reports of activity and wound up getting ourselves into a mess— it turned out that Decatur was completely killed off, and most, if not all, of the zombies from that small city headed south. We found each other in the small town of Macon, and right now Tommy and I were trapped in a small grocery store. The sides and back of the building were secure, but the front was not. We knew the zombies were waiting out back, so we had little choice in how to engage. The bodies were piled up in front of the windows, and that helped create a barrier they couldn't easily cross, but it was just a matter of time. We were shooting them now, but we were low on ammo, and there were still probably four or five hundred zombies in the immediate area, with another couple thousand on the way. We had to get out, or we weren't going to, 
At least, not alive. I noticed this was beginning to become a pattern for us. Stuck in a building, have to fight our way out. Stuck in a building, have to fight our way out. Next town we visit, I'm going into no building whatsoever. Period. Tommy returned with two shopping carts filled with bags of dog food. I guess that made a certain amount of sense, since a lot of dogs died at the hands of zombies. Loyal pets didn't want to think their owners would hurt them until it was too late. Cats were another matter. They were survivalists, pure and simple. When one situation didn't work out, they were gone. What's the plan? Tommy asked. We take these out the back by the loading dock. There's a ramp there, right? I said. I think so, Tommy said. Run these two down the ramp, let them make an opening, and we run right through, I said. That's the plan? Tommy asked, his eyes opening wide. That's what I got outside of using up all our ammo, fighting hand to hand until we're exhausted, and dying in a grocery store in the middle of a town in Illinois no one will remember, I said. Tommy shrugged. I like the first one better. We took the carts back through the storeroom, past the three Zs we killed back there. The shelves were mostly bare, with an occasional box here and there. Those had cleaning supplies we didn't need. Towards the back was a curtain of plastic strips and a loading dock where trucks would unload. A ramp led to a small garage door, and I told Tommy to wait while I rigged the door. I unlocked it carefully and looked out the small window to see where the zombies were. There were several zombies milling about, clearly agitated about the shots being fired, but they hadn't quite figured out to go to the front of the store. When the garage door went up, they were going to be moving quick. I looped an extension cord around the handle and tossed it over the door railing. Pulling back, I hoped it would not catch until too late, leaving the door open. I trailed back to Tommy, and we both made sure our weapons were ready and we had full magazines in our guns. Our rifles were empty, so they just rode on our backs. I put my pick on the handle of the cart, and Tommy did the same with his weapon. Here we go, I said, yanking on the cord. The garage door lifted quickly, and as it hit the top, I held on and wrapped the cord around the railing. Tommy was already running down the ramp, shoving his dog food battering ram ahead of him. I was about fifteen feet behind him and moving fast. We burst out of the door, and I moved to get alongside of him. Tommy had packed the carts well. There was dog food under the basket and piled about three feet high in the basket. The carts probably weighed three hundred pounds apiece. The first ghoul I hit bounced off like I was driving a truck. The second I caught only part of him, but I spun him away to knock out another Z. Tommy was doing well, knocking away two or three on his side. Split! Tommy yelled, and I broke away from him. Release! he shouted, and I let go, swinging my axe in front of me as my cart plowed down three more zombies. Tommy's cart cleared away two more, and suddenly there was a path to the field behind the grocery store. Go, go, go! I yelled, swinging hard to take out a ghoul. The ones we hit were getting back up, although a few were crooked since we broke some of their bones. Tommy didn't waste time. He bolted for the field, killing the lone zombie left to oppose us. I jumped over spilled bags of dog food and ran after Tommy, working to create as much distance as we could from the horde. Come on! Tommy yelled. He was going flat out, running for all he was worth. I stayed with him, crossing a four-lane highway into the next field. There was a tree line ahead, and we made for it, trying to get something between us and the zombies' line of sight. If there were any kid zombies there, we were screwed. The trees hit a creek, and we were grateful for it. The Zs would have a hard time getting through the trees and then getting over the creek. Tommy and I crossed the water and emerged from the trees on the other side. I put a hand up and looked at the sky. The sun was going to set in about five hours. We'd better be someplace else when darkness came. How many do you think we killed? Tommy asked in between gasps of air. I used all my rifle ammo, so one hundred rounds there. Probably killed ninety or so. Three handgun mags, close range, no misses, so another fifty, I estimated. About the same here. Only another mag, so total about three fifty, maybe three seventy-five, Tommy guessed. I frowned. Seems like it should be more. Maybe, 
We didn't have the ammo for it, Tommy said. Yeah, we should have done better, I said. Where did we leave the truck? I asked. Other side of town, Tommy said. Why? So we have to fight a hell of a lot of Z's to go get it, right? I said, not liking this scenario at all. What did you have in mind? Tommy wasn't as winded now, and neither was I. Come on, I'll show you. We went back through the trees and onto a parking lot. I had noticed the building when we ran through the field, but wasn't paying much attention to it then. Now, it was very interesting to me. I outlined my plan to Tommy, who laughed. Who says Duncan gets all the fun? Let's hope no one's home, he said. If they are, they're no threat, I said. Why not? No teeth. We're both going to hell. Presently, I'm sure. The building was a senior living center, as stated on the plaque by the door. It was a huge center, with wings going west, north, and south of the front door. Inside, the place was nicely decorated, and I had a pang of regret for what I was going to do to the place. But then these days, we had quite an abundance of living spaces. What we didn't have was live people to put in them. The place seemed empty, which worked in our favor since we needed to get things set up. Tommy found some combustible material in a workshop, and I worked my way up to the top floor. Sticking my head out a window, I started yelling for all I was worth. My voice carried across the flat land towards the town, and I was pleased to hear a nice choir of zombies answering my call. I went back downstairs and saw that Tommy had been busy opening all the doors. How do you want to work this? Tommy asked. I'll get up on the roof. Keep them coming in. You start the fun as soon as the first floor fills up. I'll stay as long as I can, then I'll come down over by the pool, I said. Watch yourself, then, Tommy said. He ducked away out of sight, and I went back up to the third floor, opening as many doors as I could along the way. Looking out across the way showed hundreds of zombies walking steadily towards the building. I was a little puzzled no old zombies were in the building, but I wasn't going to tell that gift horse to open wide. Climbing out onto a balcony, I caught the roof line and pulled myself up. The roof was a collection of vents and air conditioning units, punctuated by a large roof access point. I made sure that door was going to stay closed, then went over to the edge. I decided to vent my feelings about zombies in general, and these in particular, so I exhausted my current vocabulary, calling these ghouls everything I could think of. I cursed them, their families, back three generations, and most of their friends. Once I had finished with their genealogy, I started work on their general appearance. After about a half an hour, I must have had at least three quarters of the local zombies milling about the building, looking for the loud smartass who had been calling them names. The wind brought me the smell of smoke, so it was time to go. I ran along the roof, keeping clear of the edge and down the vents that reached to the pool. On the far edge of the building there was a tree, and I swung down to the ground without too much trouble. I ran off back towards the tree line and the waiting creek, looking for Tommy. Behind me, the building was going up in flames. The first floor was burning well, and the second floor was doing nicely. Zombies engulfed in flames walked around the ground floor, oblivious to the destruction happening to their bodies. One walked outside, but the flames finally killed him before he did any other damage. The best part was the flames attracted more zombies, so that many that were outside walked into the inferno. More the merrier, and me without marshmallows. The second benefit to the flames was it lit our way through the night towards our truck, and Tommy and I were able to get ourselves out of the mess we had managed to get ourselves into. Traveling south... We stopped a few times to pick off a stray zombie that was ambling towards the big glow in the night sky. With our little bonfire, we could report back to Shelbyville Lake that we had dealt a serious blow to the zombies of Decatur. They could start clearing out the square between the highways. It was an area of around 3,000 square miles, but they had enough people to deal with it. With that done, we headed west. Bath, Illinois. In the morning, we decided to head towards the river. Time was getting short, 
The days were getting cooler, and I had a child that was going to be waiting for me if I didn't get a move on towards the capital. I could see that Duncan was getting a little antsy as well, seeing as he was expecting with Jana. I assured him we would be home in time to be fathers. We didn't bother with Springfield. That was a problem that would require a bigger army than we had at the present. The good folks at Shelbyville told me they would contain the problem. Apparently, they had access to a very large earth mover from a nearby quarry and would use it to create a barrier around the city. Route 4 would be ripped up and turned on its side, keeping the zombies tucked safely in the old capital of the state. South of the city was a large lake, so no worries there. The highway would be cleared of cars, so I-55 could be used if needed. At the town of Jacksonville, we decided to stop for a break. We'd been traveling since the early morning, and I wanted to stretch my legs and look around. We stopped in a parking lot of Walmart on the outskirts of the town and had a quick look around. The broken doors of the big chain told me anything of value or use was long gone from there. Even though I hadn't seen any zombies, there was a feeling in the air around Jacksonville. Charlie felt it, too. I could see him looking further into the brush and staring longer at hiding places. It was a little unnerving, but since there wasn't any clear and present danger, there wasn't much we could do about it. I ate a small bit of jerky and sipped some water. Looking over the town, I could see that this was a decent place to be. The center of the town was a huge park that looked like it once had been a really nice place, well thought out and designed to be useful as well as relaxing. When I finished my meal, I pulled out a map of Illinois and spread it across the hood. I had made a number of notes and annotations across the map, indicating where help could be found, the areas they said they would help with, and where problems might be. Company, Charlie said. He stepped away from the truck and positioned himself near the back of the vehicle. That put him in a good spot to either be out of the way or able to grab serious firepower. I looked up from the map to see three small trucks headed our way. They were small, but seemed well-maintained, not the garbage some of the worse-off survivors drove. They seemed to be men who knew the importance of taking care of their equipment. I waited by the car as they drove up. They didn't make any attempt to surround us with their vehicles, which was another good sign. One man walked up to me, and the other stood outside their vehicles. "'Howdy! Haven't seen you all around here before!' The man held out his hand, and I took it. He was a big guy, a little shorter than I was, but thicker in the arms and chest. If I had to guess, his age was around twenty to twenty-five. He had a hunting knife on his belt, but that was the extent of the weapons I could see. Duncan and Tommy walked around to where I was, shaking hands with the man and introducing themselves. For his part, the man did his share. "'Name's Croft. Daniel Croft. Who might you be?' His eyes seemed keen and intelligent, so I made it clear who I was. John Talon, chief executive of the new United States, capital located up north on the Illinois River, I said. Daniel nodded. I'd heard there was a settlement up north that was making that claim. What have you got to back it up? Ordinarily, that would be a question that was met with a statement followed up by a threat of force. I had a feeling I was dealing with a sight more than just four men, so I decided to be fully honest about it. We have the original copies of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, for one thing. We have elected representatives coming in from all parts of the country. My deputy chief executive is Charlie James, standing right over there, I said. How in the hell did you get the founding documents, if you don't mind my asking? Daniel asked incredulously. His companion seemed suitably impressed. I thought the entire East Coast was a dead zone. I nodded. It is. We made a run through the mountains and managed to get into D.C. itself. Lost a good man there, too, I said. Can I ask why, outside of the obvious? Daniel said. Long story I'll tell you some day. Short version is a fake military commander thought he could take over by destroying the documents, make a fresh start for himself, I said simply. What happened to him? He failed. Daniel smiled. I imagine he did. So, Daniel, how big of a community do you represent? 
I would figure you're not here just to size us up, and you're definitely not in a position to kill us and take our stuff, I said, hooking my thumbs on my belt, placing my hands near my gun and knife. No, we figured we'd not be trying that when you all positioned yourselves as we drove up. Steve there was all for just waving and driving on, Croft said, waving a hand at a man who gave a small wave back. No, we are the welcoming committee for a group that's west of here. Probably half around three thousand, all told, in the county. We have regular patrols and training, code of laws and such. Although I expect with knowing you're out there, we'll be changing a few of them, Daniel said. I nodded. Probably not as much as you think. But we definitely want to have you up in the Capitol for a few meetings and get to know the representatives of Illinois. Also, I'd like you to send up a few merchants and traders so we can get some kind of trade route set up for goods. What's the exchange rate? We've been using straight-up trade. Back to the basics, I said. Gold, silver, copper. We have a smelter that will make coins for you out of raw material for a small fee. But it's ten silver for every gold, ten copper for every silver. Keep things simple. Daniel's eyes gleamed. I like it. Well, sir, is there anything you need? I thought for a moment. We could use a boat. Daniel smiled. That's funny. Why is that? I asked. Down here with the lakes and the river and such, we have more boats than cars. May I say again that it is nice to meet you, Mr. Croft? I said, meaning every word. We secured a boat and took the road north towards the town of Bath. Daniel told us it was a small town on the river with several lakes to the northwest. We followed 78 up to the town, and at first glance everything seemed normal. Small white houses with overgrown yards surrounded a small business center that had been completely abandoned. What might have been was lost to the virus, and the town was slipping away into decay and ruin. Already several homes were caving in, and we could see the usual signs of violence and death. Duncan was driving the truck with a boat attached, and we turned down a side street towards the river. At the end of the street there was a boat launch and an interesting bar. It was a barge that had been brought up out of the water, and a building had been built on top of it. It was called the Boat Tavern, and it fit. Backing the truck in down the ramp, Duncan placed the boat in the water. Charlie guided the boat off the trailer, and I parked the other truck. I gathered my pack and my rifle and pulled out the other pack of supplies. Tommy did the same with his, and we made a pile at the edge of the water. Charlie had tied the boat off to a power line pole and was retrieving his pack and supplies as well. We were all moving towards the boat with our packs when the attack came. One minute it was quiet and peaceful, the next the air was filled with groans and snapping teeth. What the hell? Charlie yelled, dropping his pack and whipping out his tomahawks. We all dropped our packs, except me since my pack was on my back. I yanked my pick out and swung hard at a teenage girl who was moving faster than the rest. She went down with a crushed skull, and then the fight was on. I ran forward, kicking a ghoul down that was still wearing a camo baseball hat and sinking my pick into the top of another's skull. Duncan was beside me swinging his weapon, and Tommy brought up the right flank with his long-handled axe. Charlie wasn't about to be left out, so he joined us in the middle, swinging with both hands. Zombies attacked and zombies fell, and pretty soon we were backing out towards the water as ghouls tried to walk over the dead breastworks we had created. With a little breathing room, I told Tommy and Duncan to get the boat ready, throw our supplies in, and get the boat ready to go. I was hoping to siphon the gas out of the trucks to use in the boat, but unless we managed to finish these guys off, we were going to have to abandon the gas. The trucks were replaceable, since there were thousands out there to choose from— gas was not as easily found. John, Charlie, now! Duncan yelled. We didn't waste any time. We ran towards the boat. Duncan held it while Charlie climbed in and then climbed in himself. I reached the water's edge and jumped in the boat, my momentum pushing the craft away from the bank of the river. Behind me, dead people shuffled and groaned, reaching out for food that drifted away on the water. Where did they come from? I asked, catching my breath. I didn't see a single person when we rode in. Not sure, Charlie said, stowing his gear. 
And if I was a depressing sort, I'd say they were waiting in ambush and emerged when we were distracted. You are a depressing sort. If they're capable of that kind of reasoning, we better do some serious rethinking of our strategy to deal with them, Tommy said. Duncan started the boat, and we moved northward. I spent the time calculating the days I had been away from Sarah, and I figured I had maybe about a month left. It had been a long time on the road, and if I was being honest with myself, I was tired and could use a rest. But as long as the zombies were out there, and as long as they seemed to be evolving even further, we had a new problem to face. I didn't think our current strategy of a lone force would work any longer. In order to move forward, we were going to have to advance our thinking and stop seeing these zombies as individuals to be dealt with singularly, and see them as an enemy as a whole, to be dealt with in devastating fashion. I had a lot of thinking to do. Fortunately, we had a long journey to get back home. The first town we reached was Pekin, and it was a journey that took us most of the rest of the day. As it was getting dark, we decided to drop anchor at a very small island in the middle of the lake. It was a decent place, about a quarter mile long, but barely a hundred feet at its widest point. There were several large trees, and after a quick inspection, we found a few old campfires, probably from survivors who sought shelter here just a few years ago. I wondered aloud where they might be. Dead, or if they were smart, they followed the river south to the ocean, Charlie said. Maybe they found refuge inland at one of the communities we found, Duncan suggested. Charlie shook his head. Those ashes are very old. They were here when the virus hit. Unless they were stupidly lucky, they're dead. Like us? I asked quietly. Exactly. During the night, I moved down the island, listening to the water lap quietly against the island shore. The trees rustled softly in the breeze that rolled down the river. I stood on the far tip of the island, facing the river, imagining myself far away, seeing my wife, meeting my new child. I wondered at the wisdom of bringing a new life into this world, but then dismissed that thought as foolish. How else do we fight the zombies if we don't move on and live? As I watched the water flow past, I became aware of movement in the trees that lined the river banks. Glowing eyes flowed amid the trees and bushes, some looking this way, others just searching. I didn't move. I just watched them go by. They were likely attracted to Charlie's snoring. Illinois River, Illinois In the morning, we moved further north, following the river. We'd been here before, coming up from the trip to D.C. just a few months before. It was a quiet journey, and we moved pretty well. We only had to make one stop so far for gas for the boat, and that was actually easier than I could have hoped for. Duncan killed the attendant who wanted blood for payment, and Tommy took the gas. Outside the town of Marquette, we got a surprise. A boat coming our way had a single passenger, and he was waving his arms wildly as we approached. Pulling up alongside, the man spoke rapidly. "'President Talon, you have to get to the capital. One of the generals has arrived and declared himself to be commander-in-chief. The army has occupied the city. I've been told to find you and get your resignation. If you do that, they'll let your wife go.' My blood froze. It was exactly as I had feared. My wife and my son were in the capital as prisoners. She was about to have a baby. I turned on Tommy. Anything to say? I said quietly. Tommy hung his head. I was wrong. I guess power is too much for some men to resist. Duncan was livid. My wife is there. Your wife is safe at Starved Rock. John's wife is at the capital. So is Charlie's. Their children are there. Prisoners now, so we don't attack. I turned to the man on the boat. Go back to the capital. Tell whoever is in charge that the message has been received. Is that it? the man asked. No. I locked eyes with the man. You tell them that John Talon is coming. You tell them that Charlie James is coming. You tell them that Duncan Freeze is coming. You tell them that Tommy Carter is coming, I said. If our families are harmed in any way, we will bring hell with us. The man swung his boat around and roared away. I watched his wake spread to the shore. 
Three pairs of eyes looked at me. I looked back with a fury I could barely contain. Charlie spoke first. What's the plan? he asked, his voice strained. Get home, get more ammo, get to the capital, and kill someone, I said. Good plan. Leeport, Illinois Looks quiet, Charlie said. I know, I said. Where do we start? Tommy asked. Where would you be if you were trying a hostile takeover? Duncan asked. Probably would want a building with a good view of the town. Enough room for a good part of the army and a clear field of fire, Charlie said. Let's get the lay of the land before we jump in. I don't want to be wrong once. We have to get in and get this done right, I said. Right. Tommy and Duncan, you find the families. John and I will find the leader of this army, Charlie said. Let's go, I said. We'd been on the move for the last two days. We'd received word that one of the commanders of the army had returned with his forces and decided he liked being in charge, taking our families as prisoners to keep us at bay. We made a quick stop at home to replenish our supplies, and we were off again, racing up the river as quickly as we could. The hardest part was waiting outside of town until it was good and dark, and then slipping into the capital unseen. We were all well known here, and that meant we had to stay out of sight, yet move through the city. It was well into the night when Charlie and I moved. We were shadows within shadows, slipping from one point of darkness to the next. The homes we passed were well into their slumber, and no one was out in the streets. I thought it was a little odd, considering we had been told there was an occupying army in the city, but I wasn't going to be ungrateful. Charlie took the lead, and he was as silent as usual. He walked with a tomahawk in one hand, the other held his knife. I kept my bowie knife in hand, the blade blackened for this night's work. If we encountered anyone hostile, we were going to try and take them out quietly. I didn't want a full-blown battle before I had a chance to get our families out of here. I guess that Charlie would head for the President's residence, since it seemed the most logical place for a usurper to establish themselves with authority. The trees and shadows were welcome to me this time of night, as no one would be able to see clearly what we were doing and who we were. A few blocks and we were in sight of the residence. It sat on a hill overlooking the river, and from here I could see there was a light on in one of the drawing rooms off the center door. Charlie signaled he was going to go around the side, and I was going to go around the back. Walking in the front was not a good plan. If they were expecting trouble, we would be killed before we got three feet in there. The grass was wet from condensation, and I made no sound as I approached the rear of the house. The darkness in the back of the residence was deep, accented by the rising of the hill behind it. Heavy trees leaned over the back porch, adding to the inky blackness. I felt more than saw my way to the rear door, and I nearly tripped the wire my hand felt at knee level across the threshold. I traced the wire back to a hole in the wall and left it. I'd be going in another way. Moving to the window, I gave it a small push and was happy that it opened. Using my hand again, I searched for any trip wires but found none. Carefully, I opened the window, moving very slowly to keep from making any sound. When it was wide enough, I slipped inside. The hardwood floor was another challenge, but I'd been here before. I knew the boards near the hallway would creak, and also the ones near the right side of the doorway. Down the hall, the kitchen would creak like no one's business, but across the way, where the light burned it, was clear. I moved through the dark, and an odd thought kept coming into my head. Why wasn't there anyone guarding this place? Where was everyone? I couldn't believe the commander would just set himself up like this when he knew we were out here and obviously coming to settle the score. Part of me wondered if this house was set to explode and I was just going to get myself killed. When I looked around the corner and saw Tom Haggerty sitting at a long table, maps stretched out in front of him. He was concentrating on drawing a line around a set of lakes when I placed the point of my buoy on the side of his neck. I had to give him credit. He didn't yell or curse. He just sucked in his breath and waited. Hands on the table, I said quietly. John, we need to talk, Tom said. 
Charlie chose that moment to slip into the room, his tomahawk preceding him by a foot. Charlie put the edge of the hawk about a foot from Tom's eyes, with his arm cocked and ready to deliver a killing blow. On the table, Charlie said, his voice barely above a whisper. Tom did what he was told. Then he shook his head. Sweet Jesus, if this had been real. You guys are fucking ghosts, you know that? I increased the pressure on the point, and Tom stopped talking. You have ten seconds to explain, and then I'm going to kill you, I said. Murder's not really your style, is it, John? Tom asked, his voice shaking a little. Not the first time, I'm sorry to say, I said. Five seconds. All right. We finished our task early and have been here nearly two weeks. Sarah was worried you weren't going to be here for the birth of your child, and she told us to send out people in all directions to look for you and tell you the story that we were taking over. Your family was in danger so you'd get back here faster. Tom's words came out in a rush, and at the end he sucked in a large breath. I took my knife off his neck, and Charlie withdrew his axe. Come again, I said. Tom rubbed his hand over his neck. Holy crap, we didn't think you'd show up for a week. My fighters are all staying inside and out of sight on the off chance you might kill them before you knew the truth. Sarah set you up for this, I asked, not really sure how I felt about that. Well, the story was our idea. She just wanted us to look for you and get you back here as fast as possible, Haggerty said. You could have been killed, Charlie said. I was ready to kill you. Tom chuckled. Well, we'll admit to thinking it wasn't such a great idea after the messengers went out, but I couldn't do anything about that. The only thing I could do was keep the army out of sight and set myself up as a target. What about the tripwire on the back door? I asked. Attached to a bell, Tom said. I thought I might be able to say something before you got to me, but Jesus. He put a hand on the back of his neck again. I sheathed my knife, and Charlie put away his tomahawk. We left Tom to his maps after letting him know we had a new plan in mind. He was fine with whatever we wanted. We'd talk after we took care of personal business. In the morning, I went to see Sarah, who was hugely pregnant, sharing a house with a hugely pregnant Jana. Tommy and Duncan were there, and after a brief telling of tales, I had a few stern words with Sarah— she took them in stride, although she was sorry she nearly got Tom killed, even though that was really his fault. Tucker made himself right at home, and Julia wondered why her daddy didn't get her a kitten, too. Two weeks after we arrived in the capital, Jana gave birth to a baby girl. She named her Kayla. We all were grateful she looked like her mother. Even Duncan agreed with that one. A week later, my second son was born. Sarah came through the delivery like a champ, even though there was a battle going on in the streets outside the hospital. Somehow, a band of zombies had been hanging out on a boat, and the darn thing finally grounded itself outside the port. My son was born with the sound of gunfire in his ears. I hoped it wasn't an omen. As I held my boy, I looked into his beautiful eyes and made him the same promise I made my son Jake when he was born that I would lay down my fortune, my honor, and my life for him should he ever need it. What should his name be, John? Sarah asked. We actually expected a girl, but I wasn't unhappy with what I got. I thought for a minute. How about Joseph? I asked. Sarah frowned. Doesn't have a good ring to it, no offense. What about James? Same problem, I said. We need to get out of J names. Not much goes with Talon, my love. Sad, but true. How about Aaron, I asked. Sarah thought about it. Aaron Talon. Sounds nice. Why Aaron, she asked. Just going through the alphabet and it was the first A name I thought of, I said. Let's not tell him that, okay, Sarah said. I brought Aaron back to his mother. I'm proud of you, babe, I said. Sarah smiled. Thanks for making it back in time. My pleasure. Two weeks later, we were able to see the return of the rest of the army. 
We had started out with a few hundred soldiers, and we had swelled the ranks to over ten thousand. We had enough supplies to see this army through the coming winter, but I wasn't going to wait for spring to throw this into action. I had used my time as a new dad to read a few things about strategy, and combined with what I knew about our enemy, we were heading to battle. We had claimed a huge portion of the old United States, but it was time to get the rest. In a week, I was going to throw this lot across the river and begin the Battle of the Great Plains. No more scouting ahead, no more small group tactics. I had learned a few things, and it was time to put them to good use. Sarah and Jana were well enough to travel, and I wanted them at the lodge before winter came in. Rebecca and Angela were going to stay there and help out with the kids. My brother Mike was coming to war. I couldn't leave him behind any more. I assembled my commanders the day before I left for Starved Rock, and after congratulating them for their work, I outlined what I wanted them to do. They were to start a march for the Mississippi River, and I would meet them on the way there. I had seen enough to know what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it. I was the commander-in-chief, and I had an army to throw at the zombies. I wasn't going to shirk that duty any longer. The second part of the zombie wars was about to begin. This concludes The Zombie Wars, Call to Arms, by Joseph Toludo. Narrated by Graham Halstead. Copyright 2015 by Joseph Toludo. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Severed Press and was produced in the year 2016 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books which holds the copyright there too. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.